Stardew Valley. It's a game that I've put over 500 hours into and I still can't get enough. That's just on Steam. I've also played it on PS4 and mobile. I have absolutely loved this game since it first released back in early 2016. Recently, the developer Concerned Ape released another major update. 1.6 added a huge amount of additional content to the game and I could not resist the draw I felt pulling me back towards the valley once again. Allow me to present my recent journey that took 115 hours of playtime, pursuing perfection by the game standards, plus a little extra. Like so many other RPGs, you start off with no skills and the most basic of items. It actually feels a little strange calling this game an RPG because it's so much more than that. Regardless, we start from humble beginnings. We start off like so many other games, spending about three hours in the character creation. I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna force you through all of that, but I'm pretty much making the character to look like me, I guess? My name is gonna be Egghead, our farm is gonna be the Exceptional Farm, of course, I guess my favorite thing is redundancy? No, that's a little weird, I'll show you what this field changes later, but I'll just go with eggs. I'm already experiencing new things in this as I select my white kitty cat, oh yeah. Back in my day, there was only the orange cat, see? There are a couple of additional options, like changing how the economy works, how the community center is laid out, but for this playthrough, I'm gonna be leaving it all entirely default. And of course, it just so happens that in this update came the Meadowlands Farm. As you can see on the right, there are eight separate styles of farm, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. On the Meadowlands farm, you have less space to farm overall, but you start with a coop and two chickens. Is it a shock to anybody that this guy's gonna be going for an egg empire? As I mentioned throughout this playthrough, we will be focusing on story elements, and the first cutscene leads us into the game. I won't be covering it in super deep detail because I do encourage you to try this game for yourself. Grandpa is looking a little tired, and he's gonna give us a letter. He tells us not to open this letter until the time is right. Fast forward and here we are working for the evil corporate monsters of this game, Joja. Alright, let's ignore me for a second. What is going on with this cowboy? Whatever he's doing, I'm sure his girlfriend appreciates it. Life isn't going quite as we expected, working for the man, so we decide to finally open up that note that Grandpa gave us. The opening line is if you're reading this, you must be in dire need of a change. This note includes the deed to the farm down in Stardew Valley. A short bus ride later and we arrive in town being greeted immediately. Robin comes off super friendly, and she is, but she also throws in the occasional, oh by the way, I can make all of your property better by building things. Throughout this series, I will be attempting to cover all aspects of the game, but I do have to be selective about what I include in each episode. We also meet Lewis, who was just hanging out in our house for some reason, what the heck dude. But he's friendly enough, and the mayor of the town. In the spring, I won't be focusing on the relationship aspects of the game, instead focusing on getting some profits rolling. Robin and Lewis hand the reins over to us, and we finally take control of our character. At the start of every playthrough, I start by tweaking a couple of the options. There are a couple that make your life a lot easier, like always show tool hit location. It creates a little red outline around the tile that you're about to interact with so you can actually target what you're doing. Especially in the early game, conservation of energy is so important. I also do a couple of other things like adjusting my UI scale just to make it feel a little bit more comfortable for me. At the very bottom of the options menu is a screenshot option, which we will be touching on very soon. Scrolling through the rest of the tabs in the menu here, you can see just how much is in this game. By the end of this playthrough, I want every single one of these items filled out. As I mentioned on the Meadowlands farm, we start with two chickens that are automatically named Gravy and Potatoes. Oh my goodness, I love this game. Taking a look at the screenshot of our farm though, it's pretty obvious, we got some work to do. Another thing that I do, again, before even leaving our house, is I gotta rearrange a little furniture. This space is like 70 square tiles, and I only need like 15. Like I said, I do play this a little bit more intensely, and when you're rushing to get to bed before you pass out at night, it's kinda nice to have it right next to the door. The TV as well is gonna give us a bunch of nifty information throughout the run, so I put it right next to the bed. Look at that room setup, teenager me would've been proud. We finally step outside, and the first order of business is to go touch our chickens. Um, actually that sounds a little weird. I'm probably gonna call it touching them a lot, but that's just because I'm weird. We're just interacting with them in order to improve our relationship. 
Wait, is that even weirder? Ugh, never mind. We're given a little bit of hay to start to feed our chickens, which we can fill in here, but if you open the door on the front of the coop, they will actually just eat the grass in the overworld. They'll move in and out of the coop as they please, pretty much spending the day outside and then heading indoors when it's time to sleep. You want to be careful about leaving your coop door open overnight though, because your chickens can have some encounters with foxes. I mean, I know how tasty potatoes and gravies are for me. Our little chickens aren't grown up enough to produce eggs yet, but as long as we touch them and feed them, they will be soon enough. There isn't a whole heck of a lot that you can do on the first day. My primary focus is going to be exploring the map, gathering a little bit of forage, and collecting some wood. On the Meadowlands farm, we started with the 15 pieces of hay, but typically you start with parsnip seeds. Since I have nothing to plant into the ground, our first stop is going to be the general store, but first I'm going to go rummage through some garbage cans. Rummaging through garbage cans actually has a chance to yield some incredibly powerful items, but there is a drawback. A, it's super random, and B, if you rummage through a garbage can too close to one of the villagers, they won't really like it and you'll lose a little bit of relationship with them. We'll get more into the relationship mechanics in a future video. Then we can hop into the building pretty much right in the center of the town map. There are two places that you can buy seeds from, Pierre's and the Joja Mart. There are two kind of main progression paths that you can choose in this game. One supports the community center, filling it out with items, which we will touch on in a little bit. And the other is simply feeding money into the Joja Corp. I will not be supporting Joja in this playthrough. The keen-eyed among you will notice that the time has gone backwards? Because it had been so long since I last played, I was shaking the cobwebs off a little bit and decided to restart my day. The progress will only save overnight. This is an important mechanic to know because if you get super messed up during a day, you can reset it. I decided it was more optimal to start clearing out a little bit of that farm space for ourselves before going to the general store. I will not be restarting many days, but hey, it's day one. Let me get my little chicken legs back under me. This time though, I'm gonna take a longer route to get to town. I'm gonna carve a small path through the farm leading south. There are three exits to the farm, north, south, and east. If you ever get confused as to what's leading you where, just hit M and look at the map. I'm sorry, I don't know what the console buttons are. The exit south leads us into a pretty big area that is quite important during the spring season. A trick that you can use is taking a screenshot of this region so that you can see where all of the forage is. During the spring in the southeast portion of the map, it has a very high chance of spawning spring onions. They don't sell for much, but like I said, energy is incredibly important in the early game and you can eat them for energy. As long as you're in a menu in this game, time will pause, but I will note that that is not the case in multiplayer games. I will try my best to cover all of the instances in which time operates differently between single and multiplayer. Really though, the only difference is that in single player, the time is paused more often. I complete the loop buying the same seeds that I bought the first time from Pierre, and now it's time to plant them. In order to plant seeds, you first have to hoe the earth. You'll note that these tiles all have different textures. Only the tiles that are this yellow, kind of dirt-looking texture are actually able to be hoed. Anything with grass is not plantable. Don't worry though, there's plenty we can do with that space later. You also, and stay with me here, have to water your crops every day. Performing tasks costs energy, which you can see represented in the bar on the bottom right. If you're feeling clever, you can actually track how much each action uses in energy. As you level up and become more proficient with these skills, the amount of energy that each action takes reduces over time. There are also ways to increase your maximum energy, but again, we'll get there. With the crops watered, there isn't a whole heck of a lot else that you can do on day one, so for the rest of the day, I'm just gonna be chopping wood and foraging around the map looking for more sources of energy. One thing that I definitely feel in the early game is that our inventory is way too small. That's a big reason why I wanted to do an early push for wood, so that we can set up a few chests around the region. You'll notice that I am not cutting down the stumps on the trees because it's actually more energy efficient to simply fell the tree and leave the stump. I'll want these cleared out later, but for now I feel it's all about being as effective as possible with our energy. I then deposit anything that I don't need into a chest and go foraging. Alright, so we're like over 10 minutes into this video and we're still covering day one. So I'll just edit to the end of it. 
There are four seasons and 28 days per season, so let's lock in day one. Overnight is when your skills will level up. We gained enough experience throughout our adventures today that our foraging levels up to two. This gives us a little bit of additional knowledge, some crafting recipes, and later it'll come with some perks that we can choose from. Again, we'll get there. One thing that I love about this game is that it really encourages establishing a few routines. We leave the house and there's a little bit of mail in our box from Willy. He's the resident fisherman inviting us down to the beach so he can teach us what that's all about. First though, we have a couple of chores around the farm. Know that even though I'm not showing it every day, this is pretty much the morning routine from now on. I water my crops, I touch my chickens, and then we start the day. Heading south again and checking my screenshot, it seems that there's a bountiful amount of spring onions available for me in the south. This is why I love the screenshot trick. You can determine if the trip is worth it without wasting any time. Once we're back in town, we can head south to the beach. This triggers a cutscene where we meet Willy. The man, the myth, the legend. He loves fishing, fishing is great. Here, newcomer, have a rod. Ah, Willy, I can't thank you enough, my man. I will be focusing almost exclusively on fishing for the first part of spring. As luck would have it, just outside of Willy's shack, I notice that there's a cluster of bubbles in the water. These bubbles will appear randomly, indicating higher fish activity. When you land your bobber in the bubbles, the fish will bite four times faster, as well as it increases the effective fishing zone by one. What the heck does that mean? Well, you'll notice that as I'm casting, there's a green bar that fills up. The higher the green bar, the further you will cast. The further out you cast increases the quality of the fish that you may catch. The fishing game itself takes a little bit of getting used to. There's a small green bar that you have to try and keep the fish in. The fish is gonna move around randomly and try to not get caught. If the fish is within your green bar, your progress goes up. If it's outside of the area, it goes down. Pretty straightforward. A trick is not to press and hold the tension button though. I find that rapidly clicking instead of pressing and holding gives me a lot more control over what the bar does. After catching a whole bunch of fish, giving us a ton of fishing experience right off the bat, the bubbles disappear. Another mechanic to talk about is the fact that there are shops throughout the town. Each shop has a specialization, and Willy's, obviously, is fish. Pretty much every business in town is open from 9am to 5pm, which again works beautifully into my brain. I love trying to make optimal routing. A note though, I am not min-maxing this playthrough, I'm just playing the way I love to play. I take all of my fish from the chest and sell them to Willy. This gives us a nice influx of cash, but I'm not going to be able to do anything with it quite yet. Heading back north through town and making sure to rummage through every garbage can, yes again just assume that I'm doing this every time I pass by. We're heading north to what is my favorite fishing spot. The first order of business is once again putting down that chest so we've got some storage capability up here and ooh, bubbles! The first location that I cast from right next to the fence here is my favorite spot to fish, but you know, bubbles are much better, especially in the early game. We just want to catch as many fish as quickly as possible to level us up. I spend the rest of the day fishing and you can see a couple of random items in here like some geodes and some iron ore. These are all items from the treasure chest that we've been fishing up throughout the day and yeah, we have a pretty impressive stack of fish for the first day of fishing. In single player, while you have a fish on the line and are playing the fishing game, time is paused. This again is not the case in multiplayer, allowing you alone to catch significantly more fish in single player. I have even more mechanics to talk about as we also fished up a Joja Cola. Some food and drink items will give you buffs, and in the 1.6 update, Joja Cola now gives you a speed buff. It only lasts like 20 some seconds, but hey, that's enough for us to run home. Real quick before I leave the area though, I just gotta put out Linus's campfire. <laughs> oh, never mind. I feel bad. I'll turn it back on. I'm really hoping that you can still see things on YouTube, but back on the farm, I'm heading over to the shipping bin. This bin acts as your primary way of shipping items. Anything that you put into the bin will be shipped overnight for profit. As we saw earlier, we can sell fish to Willy, for instance, but you can't sell everything to every shop. The shipping bin will accept anything that is sellable. Okay, so we're like 15 minutes into this video, starting day 3. But, 
I've covered enough mechanics that we can start picking up the pace a little bit. On day three, it's raining, which is always a beautiful feeling because you don't have to start the day by watering. The first order of business after the chores is heading down to see Willy once again. Because I'm just that awesome, I make it to Willy's shop pretty much at 9 o'clock on the nose. Overnight, we leveled up to 3 in fishing, and level 2 unlocked the fiberglass rod. I reinvest all of the money that we made yesterday into the fiberglass rod, as well as some bait. The original rod could not accept bait, but this one can, increasing the bite rate of fish. Loaded up on bait with a shiny new rod, it's back to the mountain lake. And here we're gonna sit, for pretty much the next 10 days. One final mechanic about fishing is how you gain experience. You gain experience by catching fish, by catching treasure chests, and if you can manage to keep the fish inside of your green bar for the entire time, you will get a perfect modifier, increasing the experience yield and the probability of it being a higher quality fish. Higher quality fish also provide more experience when you catch them. As you level up, your fishing bar within the fishing game becomes larger, and you increase how far you can cast into the water, again increasing the likelihood for higher quality fish and more experience. You do not need to watch me fish eternally, so here are the results from day three. It's a pretty good haul, and as you can see, our inventory size is terrible. This is why you want to bring chests with you. You'll notice that I'm leaving behind the majority of the highest quality fish. This speaks to my overall strategy at the start of spring, selling only the lesser valuable fish to give us a couple of quality of life items. The more valuable fish, though, I am going to be holding on to for a little bit. Overnight, we gain a few more levels in fishing, leveling up to six. At level five and at level ten, you get to choose perks. We'll get into these more later, but my level 5 perk in fishing that I want is the Fisher perk, increasing the value of fish that we sell by 25%. At level 10, we get the perk that increases the fish's value by 50%, so can you guess where this is going? I sold a couple of things overnight, and egg-citing news our chickens are now producing. I won't be selling too much in this initial stage of the game, hoarding all of the valuable fish until we hit level 10. The next morning, we have a visitor on the farm. This is Marnie, and she runs a shop that deals primarily with animal and animal products. She found this adorable little kitten running around and wants to know if I want it. Heck yeah I do, the default name is Dudley, and even though I try to randomize through a bunch of others, Dudley stole my heart from the first moment. Welcome to the farm. You can choose between a cat and a dog, and it really doesn't make much of a difference, but you can pet them once per day for a little bit of farming experience. Even more fun this morning is that our parsnips are ready to harvest. The act of harvesting them is one of the ways in which you can increase your farming experience. I won't be selling them as they aren't worth much, but this does increase our farming level. Even though we are super focused on fishing right now, it is important to continue developing our other skills. Day 5 is super exciting, with tons of unlocks that happen. On the way into town, we trigger a cutscene with Lewis explaining what the community center is. It's an old run-down building, and we have two options. We can restore it by supplying specific items to the bundles inside, or we could just go to Joja Corp and pay money. If you choose the Joja Corp path, this building turns into a warehouse, and that's just a little bit soul-crushing for me. Inside, we get our first encounter with the Junomos. Strange, little, adorable, forest, magic creature things. When you interact with the tablet that appears, you'll notice that it's in total gibberish, but don't worry, this triggered something. On the way back home, I stopped at Pierre's shop to buy a couple of seeds to fill out our farm. The community center bundles will require a variety of forage, crops, animal products, you name it. The seeds I selected are tuned towards filling out those bundles. We'll be making our money somewhere else. Not fish money, though. The fish money is going to serve to propel our farming endeavors. Another, another mechanic to cover right now is that just south of the farm, on Friday and Sunday, if you travel a little bit to the west, there's a traveling merchant. Their stock and prices are randomized, but there's some pretty nifty items you can collect if you keep an eye on them. And we're fishing. A third thing happened on day five, and that is that the boulder that was previously blocking us from the mines is now gone. The mines, you say? Yeah, I want to be rich first. On the morning of day six, it's raining again, so hooray, less chores! We received a note from the wizard to come and visit him in his tower. Hugging the west side of the map where the traveling merchant was a second ago, we can head south and there it is. Because we lacked the knowledge to understand what that tablet in the community center was trying to tell us, he's gonna give us a little help by feeding us a strange tonic that makes us absolutely trip for a second. But now we've gained secret knowledge. 
We now understand what the Junimos are asking of us, and if we go into our inventory, we can open up the tab that shows us some of these community center bundles. In the Spring Forage bundle, you can see the four items required, and that I already have three of them in my inventory. This is just forage that I've been collecting throughout the last couple of days, and because of the screenshot trick, I knew that there was a dandelion down here. It just wasn't worth coming over here for one dandelion until this point. We can then take those items to the community center and turn them into the tablet. Completing a bundle provides you with a reward and, in the early stages, unlocks even more bundles for you to fill out. The first tablet deals primarily with foraging, and then the second one unlocked deals with farming, with the third over by the fish tank being, yep, fish. Filling out every single bundle and completing the community center is one task among many that we have on our path to perfection. Oh, and I forgot to mention, on day 5, after accumulating just over 2,000 gold, that quality of life item that I was talking about is the backpack in Pierre's general store. This unlocks the second of three lines in our inventory, and gosh, is that gonna be nice. The next several days are pretty much just me doing the chores, a little bit of foraging, and fishing. On day 10, I can point out another lovely little introduction in the 1.6 update. On day 10, we're just fishing away, having a good time, when a little pop-up tells us something. Well, two pop-ups. We've used our last piece of bait, but we've also got some new ideas to sleep on. I was a little lost on what this meant initially, but what I've determined is that this is actually showing you when you level up your skill. We were level 9, which means that we are now level 10, and at 7pm on day 10, I am done fishing. Overnight, I level up to 10, choosing the Angler perk, making our fish worth 50% more. I'm not gonna sell the fish quite yet, but it will be very soon. Instead, today, it's time to go visit the mines. First, I'm making sure to grab that chest that we were using to fish with. We don't need it there anymore, so let's bring it to the mines with us. I do a quick little arc over the top of the lake, collecting all the forage, and then it's into the mines. We're greeted by Marlin, the leader of the Adventurer's Guild. The mines will serve two facets of gaining experience, mining and combat. Marlin gives us a sword and a task to defeat ten green jellies. You know you're playing an RPG when... He does give us a sword, but honestly, it is total garbage, and that little trident in my inventory was a dagger that I picked up from one of the treasure boxes while fishing. It'll be doing significantly more damage. I set up my chest and dive into the mines. The way the mines work is that every floor is randomly generated. The staircase to the next level has an increasingly high probability of popping up as you break rocks on the floor. The staircase will appear from breaking a rock, or geode, or defeating an enemy. I'm again being incredibly intentional in how I attack the mines. Every five levels that you progress downwards unlocks an elevator, which is essentially a checkpoint. I can then ride the elevator back up to the top, depositing anything from my inventory that I don't want, riding the elevator back down to floor 5, right where we left off. On floor 6, I think that this gives a great feel as to how I'm approaching the mines. You can see that as I'm cruising through, I'm targeting only the grey rocks, ore, and monsters. That's because they're the only things in here that are giving me experience, and I do want to try to stay as optimal as possible. There is a daily luck modifier that impacts a lot of different things in this game, but again, we'll be touching on that more later. Also, yes, we do have proper game audio now, some egghead didn't record it for the first few days. Back at home overnight, our farming levels up because I've been doing just a couple of odds and ends, but our mining is the one that we're focused on now. Because we've been exposed to the underground of Stardew Valley, Clint shows up giving us a few tips. Clint is the town blacksmith in charge of, you guessed it, ores, mining, smelting, all that kind of stuff. He teaches us how to make a furnace, kicking off our mining career. Taking a second to appreciate the rainy day, we're back at the mines where I'm going to be building a couple of those furnaces. This is a super nifty trick, I feel, and I did not play like this for a very long time. Keeping a chest and a couple of furnaces at the top of the elevator allows us to constantly be refilling our furnaces, cooking the ores into bars. I always used to keep everything centralized at the farm, and why? The only consideration to leaving things in the overworld is that they do not interrupt an NPC's path. They will walk around the world, and instead of going around things, if you place things in their path, they will get frustrated and just go through it. This breaks the item, and in the case of chests, everything that's inside. Just a little cautionary tip early on, but I feel like we've covered so many mechanics so early, let's just kick back and enjoy spring for a little bit. Okay, I can't help myself. One final trick. 
I'll discuss this and the mechanics surrounding it a bit more in the future, but there is a hard cutoff at night where your character will simply pass out. When you pass out, the game enters its overnight sequence, leveling you up and saving the progress. The problem with passing out is that you will lose up to 10% of your money, which is why we haven't sold the fish yet, as well as if you level up in that same night that you passed out, you will not have the energy penalty the following morning. Just a little something extra for you to think about. After getting our level 10 fishing perk a couple of days ago this morning, I made sure to toss all of those fish in the bin. On the night of day 12, we make 46,684 gold. That feels good, and we're about to spend pretty much all of it. The reason I chose to sell all of my fish on the 12th is because on the 13th, we encounter our first event. I'll be discussing event mechanics a little bit more later, but for now, all you have to know is that these are special days in which all of the shops are closed and something fun is happening somewhere on the map. In the shop of this spring egg event are some seeds that are not available otherwise. The amount that I'm buying wasn't really planned ahead of time, I'm just kind of going off of past experience, but I buy 100 strawberry seeds. If you haven't met everybody in town yet, during a festival is the time to do it because pretty much everybody shows up every time. That's all I want to cover with the festivals right now, they do repeat every single year, so if you miss one, it's okay. The next morning, it's time to start expanding our farm empire. I'm gonna be laying out all 100 of our strawberry seeds, plus a little bit of extra space for some community center goals. I chose to do this project today, but we did have a little bit of leeway with our strawberries. The plant itself is gonna take eight days to grow, giving us our first harvest, but then every four days after that, it will produce another harvest. That in comparison to something like the parsnips that we saw earlier, where we simply planted them and harvested them once they were grown. Strawberries are the gift that just keeps on giving. Once we have our field established, it's time to head off to town and really start spending some money. My first stop is the general store, where I'm gonna once again be upgrading our backpack. This might not have been super optimal this early, but my goodness, having the biggest bag is so nice. I then stop at the pub in the center of town, which we haven't seen yet. After waiting for what feels like a short eternity for Gus to get to the counter, we're able to buy a few items from him. He provides a couple of food and drink items, and I am interested primarily in salad and coffee. Salad is going to provide us with some great energy recovery, and the coffees are going to make us move faster. Just like the Joja Cola, they give us a plus one speed buff, but this one lasts quite a bit longer. Moving faster around the map helps us forage, mine, pretty much everything. I'm not going to be spending all of my money here, keeping some in reserve for the traveling merchant in case they have something nice for me, and we do have some tool upgrades we want to do soon. After making sure everything else is good, I head up to the mines to do just a little bit before the end of the day. I have managed to get all the way down to floor 40, and you'll notice a slight change in how the mines look. This first mine has 120 floors, with kind of three main zones. 0 to 40, you're going to be finding primarily copper, 40 to 80 will be iron, and then 80 to 120 will be gold. You may note though that as you get lower in the mines, the rocks become increasingly difficult to break. This is helped by upgrading your pickaxe, but I want to upgrade my watering can first. I'll revisit the TV and the mechanics around it in a little bit, but you are able to check the weather report every morning. This tells you what the weather is going to be on the next day. Tools take two days to upgrade, and since I don't want to lose out on a day of watering, I waited until I saw rain in the forecast. That morning, I very laboriously watered all hundred and some of our plants, but that's about to get easier. Your watering can, for some reason, has a finite amount of water it can hold. I'm not saying I'm annoyed by the trip to the river, but it's going to be nice to do that less. You may not have noticed it yet, but I do have this one little chest kind of tucked off in the corner on the way out of the farm. I make sure to keep everything that I want to donate to the community center or to the museum in this chest. Oh yeah, we're not even close to uncovering all of the things we can do yet. I've also got all of my geodes stashed in here because we're heading to Clint this morning. I'll speak more to this process later, but I'm able to bring all of my geodes to Clint for processing. There's some goodies inside of those that I'll donate to the museum, but again, we'll get back to that. What we're really here for is upgrading our watering can to the next tier. For the low, low cost of 5 copper bars and 2,000 gold, Clint will take two days to upgrade our watering can. On day 16, I make it down to floor 80 in the mines. This is when gold is going to start showing up, but I don't need that for a while, so it's time to actually start farming some of these ores. Because of the elevator, you can jump down to a floor and see if it's worth your time or not. 
For iron, I enjoy going to floor 40 over and over and over, and if that seems to dry up, then I go to floor 60. If there's not really anything on the floor that looks enticing, I just ride the elevator up and reset the floor. This serves two purposes again, not only getting us ore, which we're gonna need because with that many plants to water, I want sprinklers. But targeting the ores primarily is also giving us the most experience we can be getting, probably. On the night of day 17, we've leveled up our mining to five, once again facing a perk choice. In the early game, I find the minor perk to be more useful, getting plus one ore per vein as opposed to a chance for double gems. Double gems is going to be nice later in the game when we want to be focused a bit more on money and specialty items, but right now, all I want is as much ore as possible. I want sprinklers, I want better tools, I want all the things. On the morning of day 18, I have to do a little bit of chores waiting for Clint to open up. Once we talk to him, he gives us our shiny new watering can, and I came prepared. I brought materials and money for him to upgrade our pickaxe next. Back on the farm with our copper watering can, now if we press and hold the button to use our watering can, our range will extend. We're now able to water three spots for the cost of a single action, and yes, that does apply to the amount of water within the can as well. This does not mean that you get more water actions out of the watering can per fill, but you are able to water more spaces per fill. I hope that makes sense. This dramatically cuts down the amount of time we have to spend watering every day. And the next goal is to reduce that even further, aiming to get some sprinklers set up. We have to be a little bit patient though, we don't know how to create sprinklers yet. We'll figure out how those are made after we level up our farming skill. According to my research, our first strawberry harvest should be the 22nd. Thanks, Dorothy Ann. Also, you'll notice a scarecrow standing in the middle of the field. Oh my goodness, so many mechanics to discuss. We'll get back to it. Speaking of the endless depth of this game, we are now also in salmonberry season. In spring, on days 15 through 18, you'll notice that a bunch of the bushes around the map have these little red berries on them. On my way to Clint's or the mines over the last several days, I have been making sure to go out of my way to pick them up. The salads are a great way to supplement our energy, but it is not a long-term solution. We are not that rich yet. Salmonberries may only be 25 energy a pop, for now, but that is free energy. I've got like 30 of these things right now, that's a lot of mining. I was a little discombobulated here, forgetting that I intended to bring a bunch of community center items with me, so I pop back to the farm real quick and let's head there. I submit a few of the items, collecting no prizes, but clearing up our inventory a little bit back home. Because day 18 is the last day of salmonberry season, I do one final sweep of the map, being a little bit more thorough than usual, collecting over 70, and I have already been eating these. On day 19, our pickaxe is still being upgraded, but fortune shines on us again. Well, I guess it doesn't, because it's raining, but that is good news. We've covered a lot of fishing mechanics already, but there are different fish that you can get in different zones. Because it's springtime and it's raining, there is a fish that I want to catch in the Villages River before moving back to the mountain lake. These are the only circumstances in which catfish show up, which we do need for the community center. Again, you don't have to worry about this right now if you don't want to. This is just how I'm playing the game. There is effectively endless time in this game. You can always come back and get it later. I catch my catfish and head off to the mountain lake where once again I'm looking for a very specific kind of fish. Once you've reached level 10 in fishing in the mountain lake during spring, when it's raining, you have a chance of finding the legend fish. There are five fish that are kind of, I guess, boss fish that require specific conditions to be met and are very difficult to catch. If I can land this fish and somehow catch it in the iridium quality, that's like 15,000 gold with the angler perk. Alas, despite the amount of times that it ends up on my hook throughout the day, we are not going to be catching it. I am not using the best fishing rod right now, and it's simply because I have other things I want to spend my money on. Like I said, we can always come back later. Despite not getting that legend fish, we do make a respectable 4,500 gold, which is more than I need right now. Well, that's kind of a lie. I always always need more, but it's fine for now. For the first time in this run, this really feels like a couple of day period where I can just relax and catch up on a couple of things. Our copper pickaxe's upgrade has finished this morning, but I'm actually going to be turning the pickaxe immediately back into Clint, upgrading it to steel next. Of course, I'll be processing geodes and all of that, but we'll be covering that more in the summer season. The plan for the rest of the day is simply to forage and chop trees, which does give forage experience. 
Since I'm kind of forced out of the mines right now while upgrading my pickaxe, I want to try and set myself up as much as I can. I'm planning to build and upgrade some buildings soon, and we need a lot of raw materials for that. We received a quest in the mail from Robin that she lost her axe. It's sitting down in the Spring Onion area, but something else exciting happens down here. Another new mechanic introduced in 1.6 are these books. I just picked up Woody's secret while chopping a tree, and after reading it, it gives trees a chance to drop double the wood. Oh my, I wonder what other books are available. I'm sure we're gonna find out. The next day, the strategy remains pretty much the same, still waiting on our pickaxe to upgrade. This time I'm swinging up to Robins to turn in that axe to her, but I'm also gonna have her build a silo. Building a silo has been a quest on the Meadowlands farm since the beginning. It's gonna give us a place to store hay for our animals. This is important to have because I intend to do a little bit of cleanup around the farm soon. As we cut grass with the scythe, our silo, once it's built, will be collecting the hay. Without the silo, the grass doesn't really give you anything, so why waste the resource? Then, after a little bit of forage, I'm back on the farm clearing out some area, mostly targeting the trees. At the end of day 21, we level up to 4 in farming, but 5 in foraging, giving us another perk option. At the start of this run, I was tempted towards the Forester perk for the additional wood drops, but with the addition of those books to the game, I'm actually leaning towards Gatherer. Gatherer, in my opinion, is the much superior perk, but in the early section of the game when you really need resources, I felt that wood might be better. That was until I got a book that gave me a chance to double my wood drops. We are fine. Let's go, Gatherer. Exciting news on the morning of day 22, both our strawberries and parsnips are ready to harvest. Similar to how I handled the fish, I will not be selling these strawberries right away. This amount of harvesting is absolutely gonna level up our farming, and we have another perk that I'm interested in at level 5. After the harvest, we're over at Clint's picking up our fancy new steel pickaxe, and it's off to the mines from there. First though, I popped into the general store, and we get a little cutscene introducing this Morris character. Morris is the face of Joja Corp in this game. So this guy, he just waltzes right into somebody else's store, offers a 50% off coupon, and takes all the customers away. Please explain to me why you would ever want to support this man. I'm not going to spend too much time dwelling on my dislike of Morris, but there's a cutscene later in the run after completing the community center that I am very much looking forward to. Going from the base level pickaxe to steel makes a massive difference in the mine. Gold ore now takes three hits with the pickaxe instead of five. With the farming egg experience that we're earning tonight, we should level up enough to learn how to make quality sprinklers, so we're definitely going to want to start smelting up some gold. Also, when we defeat this little dude over here, he's going to drop us a Void Essence. This is going to help us off in the community center in the boiler room. Those objectives I want to get done as soon as possible. I then mined for a little while, coming back to the community center to turn some stuff in. I mentioned the rewards that you get for completing each individual bundle. There are secondary rewards though if you complete all bundles within a single room. The boiler room here is focused primarily on mining objectives, and upon completing all of those objectives, we will unlock the mine carts. Unlocking those is going to allow us to travel around the map much more effectively. Oh, it seems I forgot my earth crystal and frozen tier. One second, I'm just going to run back home. If there's one thing this game teaches you, it's to be prepared. We're losing like two hours in this day just running back for no reason. And there we have it. Bundle complete and boiler room complete. We trigger a little cutscene and I think I got a little hasty and ended up clicking past it, so I do apologize for that. Let me just take this opportunity to say that if you want to see the cutscene, I encourage you to play this game yourself. It's fantastic. Not only is the boiler room all fixed up, but the Junomos will eventually, ooh, some visual things are going weird here, add a star to the big board in the middle. Another update in 1.6 is that you can now also check your progress on the community center in a bit more detail in your character menu. Looking good, and then overnight we get a cutscene of the Junimos repairing those minecarts. Initially, there are three locations that you can fast travel between. The bus stop, right next to Clint's shop, and the mines. We also level up to five in farming, choosing another perk. I held on to our harvest because the tiller perk makes our crops worth 10% more. We level up to six, unlocking the ability to craft quality sprinklers. All of that work that we put in in the early sections of spring are really starting to show. The plan pretty much for the rest of the season is just gather as many resources as possible and set myself up for summer. 
This is already made easier as we simply head to the bus stop in the morning now, clicking on the minecart. I then fast travel to the mines and hey presto. More things that make our lives that little bit easier. From there though, the plan for the entirety of day 23 is mine. Overnight, we level up to six in mining because with our new pickaxe, I have been tearing through ores. Tearing through ores though reveals another problem that we haven't had yet. I am so completely out of coal right now. Since we also have our farming perk now, I also made sure to sell a little bit of the harvest. I only sold the silver and gold quality strawberries here. I kind of like having a bunch of assets spread around instead of it all just being gold. At the end of day 24, I have gathered enough materials to fully cover our field in sprinklers. This actually gets incredibly close though. The sprinklers only operate overnight, so if you place them in the morning, those crops surrounding them will not be watered. I get hung up on one of my own sprinklers at the last moment and just barely pop down the final sprinkler as the time rolls over to 2 a.m. and we pass out. Ironically enough, the next day it's raining, so getting that sprinkler down didn't matter. Oh well, it's done, and since it's raining today, I want to do some fishing. After fishing this heavily this early, is there any way that I'm not getting the legend fish this season? This might be our last chance to do it, so I'm going all in, buying the iridium rod, several trap bobbers, and some trout soup. I then do a touch of fishing in the village river, waiting for noon o'clock. Well, noon plus 20 minutes because it takes Gus so long to walk to his counter. I've had a headache for like four days because I ran out of coffee. Then, fully supplied up, we're back at the mountain lake fishing. After a few casts, we get the legend on the line. Let's go. It's a hard fought battle, but honestly, not that bad now that we have the trap bobber. We'll keep covering fishing mechanics later. I just wanted to be excited about this for a second. On the walk home, I'm all like, I've got my legend, I've got my legend, carrying it above my head and right into the shipping container. The legend fish is the only of the five unique boss style fishes that respawns year by year. That's the only reason why I'm fine with selling this thing. And I'd say that that was worth it. Just under 17,500 gold for the day, 11,250 of which was one fish. This has been an awesome spring. Then it's back to that resource grind, coming back to our coal problem. Around floor 40 has a chance of spawning these little dust sprites. I find that they're the best way to get coal in the early game, and they have a secondary effect. Yeah, there's even more objectives that we haven't discussed, like the monster hunting objectives. Again, we're gonna get back to those, but killing a specific number of different monsters around the world provides rewards. I want the reward from the dust sprite kills. But really, this is all I'm doing until the end of the season. Earlier in the spring, Demetrius approached us if we wanted a bat cave or a mushroom cave. I, of course, went with the mat cave. Na 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 Not only because me, but because the bat cave offers some unique forage. I'm able to collect an orange and a cherry, which would typically take quite a while to acquire. They're from seasonal fruit trees, so I'm really lucky to have gotten these so early. They're gonna help us fill out the bundles in the community center that get us our greenhouse. Day 27, it's raining once again, and I was feeling like I wanted a little bit more money for summer. Because it's raining and we've already caught the legend fish this season, I'm actually down in the forest river fishing. Now that we've got some fishing skills, the catfish are much easier to catch, and they are by far the most valuable things to come out of the water. Well, you know, normal fish to come out of the water. At the end of the day, our fishing expedition nets us just over 10k. Not bad at all. And here we are at last, day 28, the final day of spring and I'll be spending it entirely in the mines farming coal. I managed to pick up a farm warp totem, which teleports you immediately back to the farm. I was trying so hard to get the last batch of gold in, thinking that the warp totem would save me. We're cutting this super thin, but I use the warp totem, and I'm stuck behind a tree. I have no axe right now. Once our copper axe was ready to go, I just resubmitted it straight to Clint to upgrade to steel. Um, I guess let's just get comfortable until we pass out. And there we go. I'll play a little bit of footage of me mining on day 28 while we do a quick recap of what spring year one looked like. Our total earnings so far are 126,777 gold, currently holding about 40,000 of it in our hands. Our skills are level 7 in farming, 8 in mining, 5 in foraging, 10 in fishing, and 5 in combat. 
We've also completed any spring components of the community center and unlocked the minecarts. I have a field that's fully covered in sprinklers, a steel pickaxe, a copper watering can, about to have a steel axe. Things are feeling pretty darn good in the valley right now. Looking at our progress on the farm from day 1 to 28, we got some stuff done, but a lot more of the visual changes are coming. And that covers spring of year 1. While I start off the chores and tend to the chickens, let's take a look at the screenshot of our farm. Whenever a season rolls over, there's gonna be a little bit of, we'll call it, damage to the farm. There are a bunch of weeds and stones and little pieces of wood that will spawn on your farm between the seasons. Looking at the screenshot right now, we don't have to worry too much about that because this place is kind of a mess. You'll notice too that because our strawberries cannot survive in summer, they have died off, but the sprinkler did still water that spot. This is a very nice feature of multi-harvest crops when you're prepping for the next season. Speaking of, task number one is setting up this field. I head to Pierre's to buy seeds and our cash crop this season is going to be blueberries. We have not talked much about the farming mechanics yet, but one thing that you can buy for your crops is fertilizer. Fertilizers have different effects on your crop, such as increasing the quality or decreasing the grow time. If you go to the Stardew Wiki, they have all of this information available, and if you look here, if we apply the base level of speed grow, we will actually get an additional blueberry harvest this season. Um, yes please? While in town, I make sure to pick up my axe, which has now been upgraded to steel. The steel upgrade allows us to chop more difficult pieces of lumber. There are giant logs on the map that we were not able to break before, including this one just on the west side of the forest. Breaking it with our steel axe opens up access to the secret woods. There are a couple of fun things in here, but I'm mostly here for the hardwood. Hardwood is kind of like wood, but harder if you know what I mean. It has some different properties and will unlock some new recipes for us. Chopping these big logs also gives a fair amount of foraging experience, so you can add this to the daily chores. For a little while, anyway. Aside from that, the only thing that was important today was making sure that our crops were plant and watered, so check marks all across the board, let's lock that one in. At the start of day two, just look at them. All of our crops are watered by sprinklers. It's a beautiful sight. I do my chores and then it's time to really start seeing what this farm has to offer. The Meadowlands is a new farm after all, so I don't know what it looks like underneath all of this stuff. Um, resources, yes, resources. While I clear all of this out, we can talk about the tools and their upgrades. We start off with the most basic suite of farming tools. The hoe, the watering can, the axe, the pickaxe, and the scythe. The scythe does get upgrades, but for now we're going to ignore it, only focusing on the tools that the blacksmith upgrades. Each of these tools, including the garbage can, is upgradable with materials from the mines. Smelting your ores into bars, you can then upgrade your tools, including a little bit of gold and two days of Clint's time. The tool then become better or unlock abilities. For the hoe and watering can, as you upgrade them, if you press and hold the action button, the area that that action affects becomes bigger. Copper tools work in a three tile straight line, iron tools in a five tile straight line, with gold affecting an area of three by three and iridium affecting an area of six by three or 18 tiles per action. Also, I did misspeak during spring. Upgrading the watering can does increase its capacity as well. Upgrading the axe and pickaxe decrease the number of hits it takes for the tool to break items. It also allows you to break more difficult types of items, like I just mentioned with the axe now being able to break hardwood. The pickaxe, once upgraded to steel, can break the boulders on the farm, both of which we have and will lend to today's plan. If we didn't have those upgrades, we'd be leaving big stumps and boulders kind of scattered everywhere, and I would rather just clean the whole farm out at one go. Finally, upgrading the trash can simply gives you a little bit of money when you delete items. It makes triaging your inventory feel just that little bit better. The project of clearing out the farm extends into the following day, but this is what we're looking at now. I can actually see what we have to work with for farmland now, so I can start making a plan. That's it for days two and three of summer. Alright, aside from the chickens, the farm's pretty much handling itself for a little while, so on the start of day four, I head to the community center to drop off a whole bunch of the items we've been collecting. This is mostly for inventory management, to be perfectly honest, but we do manage to complete one bundle. The summer forage bundle is going to give us a reward of a few summer seeds. These are the forage-style seeds and do exist for every season. 
When planted on the farm, they act just like regular crops, except for they grow into forage. I feel that foraging is one of the more difficult skills to get experience for, so being able to grow some of these is really nice. That's gonna lend itself nicely to a goal that we have this season of filling out as much of that farmable space as we can. Now we can see the farm, let's use it. This is gonna require a lot more sprinklers, so we have some mining ahead of us. On the third day of summer, you'll get a message overnight that says that you heard an earthquake. What this indicates is that the train platform is now open. My last task of the day is heading up there to start clearing out some space. You are limited in where you can grow crops on the map, however you are not limited in where you can place other things or grow trees. This big open space looks perfect for a tree farm. On the morning of day 5, something weird has happened. Our TV isn't working and when we walk outside, there's this eerie green fog over everything. This is a green rain event, another new addition to 1.6. It occurs once randomly every summer. The map is now absolutely filled with these weeds and these giant moss plants. The trees are covered in moss. Very cool. And since I'd never seen this mechanic before, I had no idea how valuable moss was. As such, instead of stopping and, you know, looking it up or something, I just spend the entirety of day five harvesting moss. A second reason that I chose to do this is that I do know how valuable fiber is gonna be in the future. Once we reach level seven foraging, it'll go a long way to helping out that tree farm. I'm talking, of course, about tree fertilizer. Tree fertilizer dramatically decreases the growth time of wild trees. Fertilized trees will also grow in winter, which is not normally the case. Ah, the rabbit holes. What defines a wild tree? Well, unsurprisingly, they're the trees found in the wild. The pine, the maple, the oak, and the mahogany. There are more wild tree variants, including mushroom, but really the biggest difference is that they do not bear fruit. Fruit-bearing trees and tea bushes are not affected by this fertilizer. The morning of day six is spent planting that tree farm and fertilizing the oak trees. I'm only interested in fertilizing the oak trees because I want to get some tappers on these immediately. Tappers on oak trees are going to give us oak resin, which we're going to need a lot of to build our keg empire. This is of course all to build our final egg empire. I spend the rest of the day mining when I get really tired and really beat up. Another thing unlocked in this train area is the spa. It's completely free of charge, just walk your way into the waters and you will begin recovering energy and health. Uh, we might not be able to afford salads right now, but it's all about appreciating the little things. Now that I feel like we have a solid foothold in the summer season, it's time to settle in for a few days of mining. On day 7, I make it to floor 100 in the mines, rewarding us with a star drop. There are seven of these star drops locked behind various achievements throughout the game. We'll cover them as we grab them, but obviously one of those achievements is reaching level 100 in the mines. Eating a star drop increases your maximum energy by 34 points permanently. If you remember during the character creation, whatever you set your favorite thing to is what will display in this dialogue box. If I'd kept my favorite thing as redundancy, then this would have read, it reminds me of the taste of redundancy. I'm not 100% sure what that tastes like, but it does sound more bitter than the eggs that I prefer. My life then becomes chores and mining for the next several days. On the morning of day 11 in summer, we see that some of those summer seeds have fully grown. These seeds take seven days to grow, and every time I harvest them, I can just recraft them into more seeds. This allows me a really cheap and easy way to continue expanding this field down here without having to invest a bunch of gold into seeds. Once we have enough money, I will be making sure to plant a bunch of melons down here and to make sure that I have everything that I need for the community center. Also on day 11 is the Luau. I haven't been and probably won't be focusing on social aspects for a little bit still, but this is a great event to gain some. You're able to add an ingredient to the potluck soup and based on what you add, it will have different effects. If you toss in something that the governor loves, you will gain friendship points with pretty much every villager. If you say throw in sap or something that doesn't taste very good, you will lose friendship. There's something special we can throw in, but I don't have enough friendship with Marnie to get it yet, so we'll revisit that in year two. 
Exciting news on the morning of day 12, our blueberries are ready for their first harvest. This will be our cash crop for the summer, so although I will be keeping a few blueberries, the majority of them will be going to the bin. Throughout my mining adventures, I am making sure to make periodic stops around the floor 40 to 60 range. I'm primarily targeting the dust sprites for coal, but this is serving a second purpose. There are monster hunting goals in the game that will again provide rewards as you complete them. Slaying 500 of these dust sprites is going to reward us with a ring that I really want. On day 12, I have enough kills, so I go visit the boys in the Adventurer's Guild. Here you can buy and sell weapons, and after completing goals, you can talk to the man in the armchair. Gil then rewards us with the Burglar's Ring. While we're wearing it, monsters have a greater chance of dropping loot. This is really going to help us with our coal reserves, but it also serves another purpose. This is not the only mine in the game, and these Skull Cavern mines have some enemies with some pretty juicy loot tables. For now though, it's mine, 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 mine. Overnight, our blueberry shenanigans levels us up to eight in farming, unlocking those kegs I was talking about. We also reached level seven in combat, but now the money train is starting to flow. That's just shy of 35K in the bank, and we're gonna be getting this four more times this month, just from the blueberries. On the morning of day 13, it's raining, so I decided it's time to pivot away from the mines. After the chores, I run up to the tree farm and you can see how much of a difference tree fertilizer made. Which of these trees do you think was fertilized? I slap on as many tappers as I was able to craft, and spend a little bit of time fishing the mountain lake waiting for Robin to open. Along with buying and selling basic resources like wood and stone, Robin also serves as the builder in the game. Now that I have a bit of cash to throw around, it's time to build a barn. I'm not going heavy on chicken coops quite yet, there are a couple goals I want to meet first. Then I scoot on down to Clint, turning in my pickaxe to upgrade it to gold. I didn't have the 10k to throw around before, but this is definitely going to make our mining adventures a lot quicker. The rest of the day I spend fishing on the pier at the ocean. I'm here collecting anything that I need for the community center, as well as pursuing our second legendary fish. The crimson fish is only available from this dock during the summer. Weather is irrelevant. Unlike the legend fish last season though, I cannot catch this guy again, so he's going to be stuck into a box until I can afford a fancy fish tank for him. Then it's chores on chores, continuing my fishing adventure on the next day. I wasn't quite able to catch all of the fish that I needed for the community center because it was raining and I need a puffer fish. They're kind of a nasty catch, but once it's done, it's done. Then, while we're fishing for the community center, I might as well pop by the secret woods and fish that little lake it has. I catch the wood skip and then spend the rest of the day pretty much just doing chores, gathering resources, the usual. On day 15, I grab my fully upgraded pickaxe and then just continue expanding the field. Going for aesthetics in the first year is usually not something that I do. These farms grow very organically. Again, I'm spending most of year one pretty much just getting rich. On the morning of day 16, our second blueberry crop is ready. I'm not going to be sticking this one in the shipping bin, however. We're actually going to be heading to town and selling it directly to Pierre. The reason I want to do this is because I'm also bringing some stuff to the community center. I fill out a couple of blank spaces in the bundles, but the most exciting part is that after selling everything direct to Pierre, we're coming here with 52,000 gold. The vault rewards are entirely money-based in the community center, totaling a donation of 42,500 gold. I donate all of it, giving us some pretty nifty items, but also unlocking the bus. This will unlock overnight, giving us access to the desert. Similarly to the minecarts that we repaired last season, this repair happens overnight, so we can't quite get to the desert yet. Instead, I pop down to Clint's where I can finally discuss geodes and the museum. Throughout your adventures, you'll be finding ores, gems, minerals, and artifacts throughout the world. You'll also be finding a bunch of these geodes, which, if you bring to Clint for processing, can be broken open to reveal just those. Or minerals, gems, you know. It takes a small fee to process, but generally will net you a profit. Before the profits, though, if you roll over the item, anything that says Gunther can tell you more about this means that it can be donated to the museum. This is the first that I'm showing you my museum, and yeah, it's got some stuff filled out already. I just had no idea when to include this. There's so much to talk about. Through donating things to the museum, you can collect even more rewards, most of which are going to be aesthetic, so I'm just going to let Gunther hold on to them for now. Any minerals and gems that have already been donated and aren't useful for me in the future, I'm just selling immediately. At the end of our mining adventures on day 16, I have some bombs on me which I can use to clear out this little piece of rubble. 
This gives us access to the dwarf in the corner who has a pretty nifty shop for buying bombs and mining materials. On day 17, the goal is to head to Skull Cavern, but the bus is not available until 10 a.m. That would be because the town drunk, Pam, is in charge of driving it, and she's far too hungover to get up before 9. So I keep myself busy doing a few chores, but I also pop down to Marnie's ranch. Robin completed construction of our barn, and so now I'm able to buy a cow. Let's see, cow nicknames. Steak! I then do a little bit of organization around the farm because even though I'm not going super heavy for aesthetics right now, I do still enjoy having a couple of nice things around. After that, we're ready to head to the desert, so I talk to the little box, pay 500 gold, and off we go. Yes, coming out to the desert, at least for now, is going to cost us 500 gold every trip. I grab the forage around here, both for the community center and because the cactuses are fantastic energy. And then we can head into the Skull Cavern Mines. These mines are locked until you get the Skull Key from level 120 in the mines back in the valley. Which, by the way, is also the bottom of those mines. This mine is bottomless and there's no elevator this time. You start at floor 1 every time. The deeper you go in this mine, the higher the chance of Iridium Ore spawning. I actually get incredibly lucky on floor 8, finding a cluster of the Iridium Ore. Usually, you don't even see Iridium Ore until you're in the 30s. One thing that really helps you get lower faster are the holes in this mine. When a ladder appears to the next floor in Skull Cavern from Breaking Rocks, it has a 20% chance to appear as a shaft. This shaft can drop you anywhere between 3 and 15 levels deeper. A note though, if you fall 15 levels, be prepared to take some damage, because it will hurt you. The enemies in this mine are also significantly more challenging to defeat, but they do drop some pretty awesome stuff, very much helped by our burglar's ring. We'll be getting a bunch of resources from them, including great food and even full-on iridium bars. The drawback to the higher reward is the higher risk. I don't even make it by the first day in Skull Cavern without dying. When you die, you will likely wake up in the clinic with Harvey telling you that somebody found you unconscious. There are a couple different dialogues, but pretty much when you die, you come back with zero health, zero energy, and you've lost some items. In this case, all I lost was a solar essence and a ruby, so fine. It kind of sucks, but hey, that's the game. We're then free to carry on about the rest of our day, but we are very much hurting. This differs from the passing out mechanic that happens at 2 a.m. If you pass out from the time, the day is simply over, you lose up to 10% of your money, and carry an energy penalty the next day. Noted, dying bad. The goal for the rest of the month is pretty much to spend it in Skull Cavern, upgrading our capabilities on the farm. Our blueberries are going to continue making us money, while I focus on farming materials for the next tier of sprinkler. We've been using quality sprinklers which water the 8 crops around them. I'm gunning for Iridium Sprinklers, which water 24 tiles around them. Unfortunately, I die again on the next day, but this time it hurts a little bit more. I lose my red cabbage seeds, which I really want for the community center because they aren't available until year two, and I lose 39 Iridium Ore. Oh, that's painful. You are able to buy back one of these items from the Adventurer's Guild after dying, but it's a little pricey on the Iridium side. Unfortunately, this is a loss I'm just gonna have to accept. Good news though is that I found a Prismatic Shard yesterday, which we did not lose during the death. Prismatic Shards are incredibly rare and incredibly useful. I always take my first Prismatic Shard out to this little cluster of pylons in the desert. If you present your Prismatic Shard to the center of this little cluster, it will upgrade to the Galaxy Sword. This sword is far and above the Obsidian Edge that I've been using thus far. Remember though, you can play this game any way you see fit. My girlfriend, for whatever reason, always uses her first Prismatic Shards to make fancy clothing. I don't understand, but they make her happy, so right on. After a few more days of mining, it's time to do a little bit of chores on the morning of day 21. A neat little trick if you have tappers set up at the train station is to have another tapper on the oak tree just outside of the train station. You can visually verify whether your tappers are ready or not from pretty much across the map just by taking a few steps out of the mine entrance. I collect all of the oak resin because I want kegs. 
I then turn a few more things into the community center on my way to Clint to process more geodes. Day 21 is primarily about making sure that during my mining adventures, everything else is still running smoothly. I take a quick stop at the Adventurer's Guild just to check on those monster goals, and yeah, you can see that there's some work to do yet. We still haven't even uncovered all of the different enemy types. On the morning of day 22, I'm setting up a couple of those kegs that I've been talking about. All of the melons that we have growing at the base of the farm right now will be processed through these kegs. We'll also be using them to create our own coffee instead of constantly having to buy it. And they're going to be processing pumpkins for us next season. From there, we can really start ramping up a wine industry, but again, little steps. Our recent round of donations to the museum has also granted us the Rusty Key. This grants access to the sewer in town. There are a couple of interesting things down here, but right now all I'm focused on is talking with Krobus. Over time, we will be befriending the shadow person, but right now all I want is that star drop that he's offering. 20,000 gold for a star drop is a steal. Thank you, blueberry money. At the end of day 22, we trigger a cutscene, which again, I have not seen before. Looks like Mr. Key is doing a little bit of crop dusting with some mystery boxes. I don't know what these are yet, but now we can find mystery boxes around the world. I also level up to 10 in farming, granting us a perk choice. We can either have our crops grow 10% faster, or we can have our artisan goods worth 40% more. Artisan goods are generally goods that are processed through a machine, like our kegs. We also make a little bit of cash, but throughout this season, I've been spending money as quickly as I've been able to make it. On the morning of day 24, we have another blueberry harvest ready. You can pretty much assume that all of the time that I'm cutting out is just me spending time in the mines. I will also mention that as we can afford it, I will continue to upgrade both our barn and our coop. There are three tiers of these buildings, the basic, the big, and the deluxe. Their footprint on the map does not increase, but their internal size does, as well as unlocking a couple of features. We'll come back to this more later, but right now, the biggest upgrade that I'm looking for is the diversity in our animals. With the big barn now upgraded, we can buy a goat to keep our cow company. The coop is next on the list to get some ducks rolling. I'm feeling pretty broke right now, so I spend the last part of day 24 doing a little bit of fishing. Honestly, I'm not convinced that this was the best use of my time because the amount of money that we're making from fishing has really fallen off. In the early game, making 4k off of a bit of fishing feels pretty good, but nowadays it's kinda lackluster feeling. Especially compared to the 40k that our blueberries just made us. As we progress through the last few days of summer, the plan is pretty much the same. Mine and harvest stuff when it's ready. At this stage in the season, replanting things is simply not worth it because they'll die before they can fully grow. You can see how much expansion I managed at the base of the farm here throughout the month, but honestly, most of this was done about halfway through. I haven't started introducing those iridium sprinklers yet, but don't worry, they're right around the corner. At the end of the day, after more mining, you can see that now that I've stopped crafting all of these forageables into more seeds, we're actually making pretty good money off of them. 10k for just a portion of that lower field? I'll take it. And to nobody's surprise, I pretty much spend the entirety of day 27 in the mines. And here we are on the final day of summer in year one. Thanks to the speed grow we applied, our blueberries have one final yield for us, as well as cleaning up anything that remains in that lower field. From there, pretty much the rest of day 28 is going to be spent setting up for fall one. It's time to clear out this last little bit of area on the left and start laying out those iridium sprinklers. I also reconfigure my kegs and get a little mini upper field ready as well. The animals for now have just been kind of shunned to their own island over there. Don't worry though, now that I can see the entire farm, I definitely have plans. Our tappers at the train station are once again ready so I can harvest those. And while I'm in the area, I donate a bunch more stuff to the community center. We're getting pretty darn close to finishing the pantry here. We just need a little bit more animal product and the fall crops to unlock the greenhouse. The greenhouse allows you to grow any crop at any time all year. Back in the old days, it was always a pretty hard push to get your greenhouse ready before winter, but uh, these days there's something different. We're gonna have to get back to that later though. Let's check out what we accomplished during summer. Taking a look at the screenshots of the farm from day one to day 28, we accomplished a lot. We cleared all of the debris from the map, started expanding our crops into the lower section, and now 
Now we're ready to go even bigger. Because it's a late night event and pretty beautiful, I'm gonna go to the Dance of the Moonlight Jellies. All the villagers are hanging out at the beach and once we talk to Lewis, we activate the cutscene. What a beautiful send off for summer. Taking a look at what we've accomplished, we've now earned over 360,000 gold, holding on to about 50k right now. For our skills, we're now maxed in farming, mining, and fishing, with foraging and combat not that far behind at level 9. Summer very much felt like a month where we made less progress, but very much set ourselves up for success in the future. So as we close our eyes and lay down for a hard-earned sleep after 28 days of summer, I'm reminded that we have like 37,000 gold of blueberries that just sold as well. Oh yeah, I'm feeling real good about fall. So far, I have not been doing an extensive amount of planning in this run, just kind of letting my heart guide me. I am trying to be reasonably intelligent about it though, so at the start of the season I made a plan. I have to apologize too for the darker screenshot on the first to fall here. Some egghead didn't remember it until like 8 o'clock. But using the screenshot from summer, I was able to determine how many crops we could water with our sprinklers. I figured a really good number to shoot for was 750 cranberries backed up by 484 pumpkins. I head to Pierre's to start buying up all those seeds and oh yeah, cranberry seeds are expensive. At 242 gold a pop, we can only afford 362, so, so much for my 750 plan. The good news though is that unlike our blueberries last season, we don't have to fertilize these to grow faster. We'll be getting five cranberry harvests as long as they're watered and in the ground today. The rest of the first day of fall is spent doing chores and setting ourselves up for the rest of the season. Near the end of the day I was checking out some of my crafting recipes and community center requirements and decided to throw a few crab pots into my river. I won't be investing heavily into these, but if you put a piece of bait in, the next day you should have a fresh piece of something in there. We only need one thing from the crab pots to finish off that community center bundle, so I don't care if we catch three newspapers. On the morning of day two, after doing my chores, I head to town and we trigger a cutscene. There is a board outside of Pierre's shop where you can do odd jobs for the townsfolk. Right now though, we're unlocking the special orders board just south of Mayor Lewis's house. These extra quests are a little bit more difficult to complete, but definitely are worth the time. You get a choice between two random quests, and there are a few that I have my eyes on. There are a couple of fishing quests from Demetrius that offer up the farm computer, which is a super nifty tool, but there's something else I have my eye on right now. The wizard has a chance of giving a quest for a prismatic jelly that will reward us with the recipe for monster musk. We'll get into why I want that so much if and when I get there. I did sell a few things overnight, making sure that I had a little bit of extra cash to visit Pierre this morning. I wanted to make sure that I had my community center crops covered, and then a large chunk of that money goes towards pumpkins. Just like blueberries and melons last season, it's going to be cranberries as our cash crop and pumpkins for the kegs. Speaking of kegs, we've got all this field space that's inactive right now, so I buy a ton of wheat. It's a really cheap crop that we can actually turn a fair profit on because wheat in kegs equals, hmm, beer. The rest of the day is devoted to planting all of this and getting it watered. On the morning of day three, I spend some time getting supplies ready to sell to Pierre. There's still sprinkler space that we can fill out there, but then I realize that it's Wednesday. Pierre is closed on Wednesdays and I just don't want to support Joja in any way. So instead, I head up to the tree farm in order to expand that. I'm once again making sure to put fertilizer down on the oak trees, but I'm also planting a few mahoganies. We have a hardwood collection quest from Robin right now that I don't think I'm going to be getting done simply because I don't have access to enough hardwood sources. Then the rest of the day is spent mining in Skull Caverns where I want to discuss another mechanic. That mechanic is luck. Luck is a stat that affects many different aspects in the game. Everything from the quality of your crops while harvesting to the chance of finding geodes in the mines. It also impacts the probability of finding a ladder, and so sometimes when you're mining on bad luck days, you find yourself pretty much breaking the entire floor. You can check your luck every day in your house using the TV. If you select the fortune teller option, it will tell you what your luck is for the day. The messages I feel are pretty clear on how they describe what your luck is looking like. 
They range from the spirits are very happy today, they will do their best to shower everyone with good fortune, to the spirits are very displeased today, they will do their best to make your life difficult. There are other shows to watch on the TV like the weather forecast which will tell you what's happening the next day, as well as every Sunday and Wednesday is an episode of the Queen of Sauce. Until you reach year two, Sunday will always have a new recipe for you, whereas Wednesdays are repeat episodes. Knowing and cooking all of these recipes is part of perfection, but we gotta upgrade our house first. I've been selling pretty much everything that I've been producing recently, just trying to get this field filled out. I fill out a few iridium sprinklers with pumpkins and then it's off to do chores. On top of always needing wood, a major push that I'm going for in this season is getting level 10 in all of our skills. That's going to unlock another new mechanic in 1.6 called Masteries. Oh, am I excited to check those out! Day 5 is spent mining in Skull Cavern, and then on day 6 we already have some crops to harvest. It's another great thing about wheat is that it only takes 4 days to grow, so it's a great filler crop. It's also awesome because different items have different time requirements when they're being processed by the kegs. Our melons right now in the kegs are taking six and a quarter days to produce wine. Putting wheat in will yield beer in only one day. So in an effort to try and keep as many of my kegs synced up at the same time, I'm simply waiting for my melon wine to finish by filling the kegs with beer. This month is all about production. I spend the rest of the day mining for more keg materials. I'm actually back in the normal mines, not heading out to Skull Cavern because floor 30 to 40 in these mines is actually pretty dense with copper. I always used to avoid these floors because of how dark they are, but with a glow ring on, it's not too bad. On the morning of day 7, I have another little trick for you. With my tree farm up at the train station, it's a little bit of a jaunt anytime I want to see if it's ready or not. So what I've done is allowed the bus stop and train stop tappers to sync up. Now anytime I see my tappers at the bus stop are ready, that means that my tree farm is ready to harvest. I've continued selling artisan goods and buying up as many pumpkin seeds as I can, refilling that wheat field with pumpkins. This is going to be the plan with pumpkins until day 15, which is the last day that you can plant pumpkins without applying speed grow. Because they take 13 days to grow, see? I continue working on the fields all the way till the end of the day, filling out as many of these iridium sprinklers as I could with more wheat. As we wait for the next batch of wine, all of this beer is really supplementing our income. Then on the morning of day 8, we have our first crop of cranberries ready to harvest. Oh yeah, they cost a lot to plant, but they are gonna make us a good chunk of change this season. I take all of this and the other artisan goods that I have right now off to Pierre to sell directly to him. I net just over 80k gold on the first harvest. My next stop is Robin's where I made sure to bring stone, but with this amount of money I have no problems buying a ton of wood. Wood is quite cheap right now at only 10 gold a piece, but at the start of year 2 that's going to increase permanently. The real reason I was here though was to upgrade our barn, but because I bought too much wood we now don't have enough money. Good math, buddy. So it's back to the farm where I build and fill more kegs and set up a few more sprinklers worth of crops. I couldn't afford a coop, but I could afford more pumpkin seeds. The rest of the day is spent doing chores and I make sure to come back and check the community board again. This board will have a new time sensitive quest every Monday, assuming you don't already have one active. Between these two, Pierre's makes the most sense because we're already growing a bunch of these crops. We will not need that 21 day time limit. Days 9 and 10 don't really hold much excitement. I do my chores and again spend all of day 9 in the mines targeting resources for kegs. Those resources are copper, iron, wood, and oak resin by the way. Then to mix things up I spend the entirety of day 10 foraging and chopping trees. Our last two skills, foraging and combat, are slowly making their way to level 10 and 12 experience for every tree chopped is okay. I feel like I've proven that the wood is infinitely valuable. Oh, but did I forget to mention? Yes, I bought more pumpkin seeds from Pierre's, but I also spent 10,000 gold upgrading our house. On the morning of day 11, things are looking a little different around here. And sorry to everybody who wants aesthetics right now, it's just not time yet. The bed and the TV go right next to the entrance again, but check it out, we have a kitchen. We're now able to reliably cook a few of those recipes that we've been learning. Then more wheat gets scythed up while more pumpkins get planted down. Then I swing down to Marnie's to pick up another friend for our farm. I'm only grabbing one duck, but welcome Reg to the farm. On a personal note, gosh man, I really gotta call Reg. 
I missed his call in, like, September. More exciting news, apparently wheat counts as a vegetable, so we have everything we need for Pierre's quest already. I take my 25 gold quality wheat and stick them into the bin in his store, completing the quest. For this we received a prize ticket, which is another new mechanic to 1.6. Prize tickets can be exchanged for, you guessed it, prizes at the prize machine located in Lewis's house. As you buy them, it cycles down the list of prizes, and looking at it, wowza. I'm not sure if I'm going to invest in this right now, but there's some pretty sweet prizes there. And the keg resource grind continues. On the morning of day 13, we have our second cranberry harvest. Looking back at the footage, I definitely had a missed opportunity here, but we'll get back to that on the next cranberry harvest. I have a kitchen now. I should use it. Heading into town to fund our next set of upgrades, we walk into a cutscene in Pierre's store. He's offering Gus this super amazing bunch of vegetables for 25,000 gold? What? That's outrageous? 10,000 maybe? No, Pierre, that's like still extortionate. This is one of the cutscenes where we as a character get to chime in, and I'm gonna tell Pierre to stop being so greedy. He pouts and is all disheveled because nobody wants to buy vegetables at a 10 times markup because he put an organic sticker on it. Why am I rooting for this man above Joja again? But he reminds me why at the end of the cutscene, taking a moment to reflect and realizing that if he makes his customers upset, he has no customers. Pierre at least is capable of growth, not like Morris. Gosh, that guy is so greasy, my eyes can't help but slide off of him. It's time to start upgrading our tools a little bit more, bringing our watering can to Clint, upgrading it to gold. Then it's up to Robbins to buy a little bit less wood than last time and finally get that barn upgrading. Then it's more mining, leading to the end of day 13 where we have even more excitement. First off, my lone goat got pregnant and has now had a baby. I name it, huh? And move on. More exciting though is that we leveled up to 10 in foraging getting another skill perk. Botanist is gonna make every piece of forage that we collect from now on iridium quality. I feel it's by far the best foraging skill, but I've spent so much money on wood so far, I'm kind of regretting not going with the wood cutting path. Don't worry if you pick the wrong one though, the perk choices are not set in stone and you can pay gold to reset them. On the morning of day 14, I'm greeted by a beautiful sight, 63 melon wines ready to go. I then visit the traveling merchant like I do every Friday and Sunday looking for some items. I kinda goofed in spring and summer and didn't end up catching a sunfish. If I can't find a sunfish from the traveling merchant here, we aren't getting the community center done this year. I do find a pomegranate which is helpful, but no dice on the sunfish. On the morning of day 15, I received a piece of mail reminding me about the Stardew Fair which I will want to be participating in. There's a display component of the fair where you can show off various items that you produce on your farm. Different items are worth different point values and you can get bonuses for including items from different categories. I won't get into this too deeply right now because the fair is actually tomorrow. I swear, I do something like this, similar to how I got everything ready to sell to Pierre before multiple times this season. I do my chores and head to the town for the festival and it's tomorrow. Back on the farm, I don't want to sort all of this out again, so I just make its own little chest. I spend the rest of the day in Skull Cavern, but it's less for mining materials this time and more for combat experience. The monsters out here are the toughest and therefore yield the highest experience. Combat is the last skill that we have to max. On day 16, it's time to actually attend the fair. That exists today. Our first steps in and Pierre has a little shop where he's selling a few fun things. One of which is a full-on star drop. You need star tokens to buy it, and you get star tokens by playing the games around the fair. There's the strongman hit the thing with the hammer style game, where if you max it out on the first try, definitely without any editing, tee hee hee, you'll get one whole star token. Then I take a quick moment to set up my display. I wouldn't call it min-maxed by any means, but it should definitely be enough to win today. I feel there are three main ways to generate star tokens here. If your display wins the competition, you're granted a thousand star tokens, but that only happens once. I feel that the best way, as long as you're decent at the fishing game, is to talk to this guy, go into his tent, and play the fishing game. 
You're given a time limit to catch as many fish as you can, all worth different scores. You also get bonuses based on how many perfect catches you manage, and that gives you a chunk of star tokens at the end. It used to be the case that the wheel in the center of town had a 75% chance to land on green. After playing with it a couple of times, and then going back and fishing, and then playing with it a few more times, I'm gonna say that's not the case anymore. That or my poison luck followed me from Pokémon. I eventually just give up fishing for the tokens that I need, and then talk to Lewis to start the Grange display. My display totally rocked at 105 points, winning the competition. We get our 1000 star tokens, and it's very important to remember that you can take the stuff back out of your display. I have my crimson fish in there, and if you leave it, it's gone. I then visit the shop buying my star drop, and spend the rest of my coins on the things that I find essential. Darn tootin', a rare crow and a fancy new hat. Rare crows have the same effect as regular scarecrows, they're just aesthetically a little bit more fun. And on the morning of day 17, it feels like we're very much getting into the maintenance part of this season. More pumpkins are ready, and since we're past day 15, I'm filling everything back in with wheat. I couldn't do it yesterday because the fair was going on, but I want to donate some items to the community center. I have been making the odd trip here donating things, but this is one of those exciting times. I can finally finish off the pantry, unlocking the greenhouse, and I forgot my pumpkin. Raskin around on run on run around way on around and I'll run all the way back, you know. Okay, back in the community center with the pumpkin this time, we finish off this room. To me, it has always felt like such a milestone to unlock the greenhouse. As long as we've got seeds, we can grow anything, anytime now. I spend the rest of the day targeting combat experience, and here are the results. That is the drawback to being out in Skull Cavern, is that things do hurt a lot out there. We lose a warp totem, fine, a heater, that's okay, and a bait and bobber book, which gives us fishing experience. That could have been so much worse, so let's just take it. Overnight, the Junimos repair the greenhouse while we make some serious bank. 40 gold blackberry, oh yeah! On the morning of day 18, we have another cranberry harvest ready, where I'm going to be taking advantage of our kitchen. I did make sure to hold on to a few different types of crops from every season as I was farming them. This allows me to grab a parsnip from the chest, and I will no longer, for a little while anyway, be selling our animal products. Instead, I'm going to be sticking them in the fridge here so that we can start cooking. Egg plus milk equals omelette, and then omelette plus parsnip equals farmer's lunch. You'll notice that on the tooltip, the farmer's lunch shows that it gives plus three to farming. Having a higher skill level, and of course, a higher luck level for the day, has a chance to increase the quality of the crops that you harvest. I feel like it benefits you even more earlier on because harvesting crops of a higher quality also grants more experience. Yes, we are max level farming right now, but once that combat skill level up. I then check the community board for another quest, and Demetrius is offering us the one that's gonna give us the farm computer. I don't think we have the materials to build one yet, but it's so nice to know that it's gonna be available. He wants us to fish 20 fish from the ocean, which is actually perfect because I need to do a little bit of fishing for the community center down there anyway. Before dedicating myself to fishing for the rest of the day though, I pop up to Robins to continue upgrading our buildings. It's time for that deluxe coop, which means that we will now have a max level coop and barn. I then spend the rest of the day fishing. On the morning of day 19, I'm realizing a critical error. My deluxe barn was ready a couple of days ago, and our pig here is gonna take 10 days to grow up. Spider pig, spider pig, does whatever a spider pig can. I really needed this pig to produce a truffle before the winter season, but once again, it's not gonna be the case. I guess I'm now looking for a sunfish and a truffle from that traveling merchant. Alright though, yesterday I got totally distracted by the fact that it's raining, so let's set up our greenhouse. Usually I would have found an ancient fruit seed by now, but I haven't in this run, so I think that this is just gonna be a hodgepodge in here for a while. First and foremost of which, of course, is getting all of our coffee back growing. I also make sure to plant a red cabbage seed, which is a spring crop that usually isn't available until year two. I've actually found two red cabbage seeds, and our greenhouse has other things to say about spring. And it's looking beautiful. I have the materials for the sprinklers cooking up at the mines as we speak. Because I've been investing so heavily in upgrades this season, I haven't been spending a lot of money on energy. As such, I didn't feel like going out to Skull Cavern again, deciding to farm the lower floors of the mine back in Stardew. 
On the morning of day 20, we have another huge pumpkin harvest ready that I'm again just gonna be filling back in with wheat. I suppose this is as good a time as any to start actually talking about the farming mechanics in this farming game. The farming skill is associated with planting, growing, and harvesting crops on the farm, and also the care of your animals. As you level up, you're able to learn more recipes and diversify your income streams. As you've been able to tell so far, I'm very much interested in setting up our artisan goods, but we had to get there first, and that's why I've been using my cash crops of strawberries, blueberries, and cranberries all year. Once your seeds are planted, they are at risk of being damaged by environmental factors. Crows will come and eat your plants, and so, no surprise here, this is why we have scarecrows. They can also be damaged during thunderstorms, which is why I have all of these lightning rods spread out around the farm. The lightning rods during storms will divert lightning strikes to them and generate a battery pack, which are used in making iridium sprinklers. Yeah, there's a bit of depth to what I've been doing without explaining it, but gosh, there's so much to talk about. You do need to keep your crops watered every day, which at the start of the game is very much a tedious and manual process, probably chewing up most of your energy every day. As you level up, you learn how to craft basic sprinklers, which water the four tiles adjacent to them. You may have noticed noticed back in spring, but I totally skipped them. You can then learn how to make quality sprinklers, which water the eight tiles adjacent to them, and iridium qualities, which water 24 tiles around them. There are even further upgrades for the iridium sprinklers, but we'll have to get back to them once we unlock it. Pretty much the farming mechanics are plant, water, harvest, profit? More excitement on day 20 is that while down in Skull Cavern, doing our thing, I see that glorious message pop up. I've got some new ideas to sleep on. That means that our combat just leveled up to 10, so I am out of here. In this instance, all that was required was leveling up to 10. We don't need to pick the perk overnight to go access the Mastery Cave. Back in the valley, just south of Leah's house in Cindersab Forest, we see this little hole-in-the-wall type of place. Now that we've maxed our skills, we can get in here, and there's another note from Grandpa. It says that if we're reading it, we found the secret room that he prepared for us. This is where some of his most cherished tips, recipes, and tools exist. Now, all experience that we gain, be it mining, foraging, farming, any of it, will go towards this experience bar. Once we level up our mastery, we're able to choose one of five disciplines, eventually being able to unlock all of them. The mastery points required start at 10,000 for level 1 and go all the way up to 100,000 for level 5. For reference, increasing a skill to level 10 requires 15,000 experience. But alright, we have new things to work towards. I'll discuss these perks more in detail as they become relevant. On day 21, our bus tappers are ready, so it's time to head off to the tree farm. When I mentioned earlier about syncing up my tappers and kegs, what I meant was simply letting them sit there ready to be harvested until everything was ready to be harvested. That means when I take the time to come up here, I only have to do it once for a full harvest. I'd say that we about doubled our tapper capacity this season, which isn't bad. I push things super late using a farm totem that I found to get back to the farm past 1 a.m. And all of our kegs have wine ready in them, oh no! Don't get me wrong, that's awesome, but I just don't think I have time to cycle them tonight. Which I don't. Overnight on day 21, there's a windstorm which unlocks another, another new thing in 1.6. We'll, uh, we'll check that out tomorrow. Oh, good morning, yeah, that's right, editing happens very quickly. I am more than happy to start my day getting a load of wine out of the kegs and putting in our first batch of pumpkins. I have to apologize if this footage is a touch too fast, but there's just something satisfying about this. I then expand our kegs and fill them up with even more pumpkins before heading south. That windstorm last night unlocked the giant stump right next to Marnie's farm. It seems like it's asking us for 100 hardwoods, so I might hold off on this. I'll have to do a quick bit of reading between seasons to see if this is worth pursuing right now. Despite feeling real good about the number of kegs on our farm, we don't have anywhere near enough yet, so it's more mining and more combat. It's Monday once again, so my last task of the day is to head down to the community board to try and get a new quest. No way, I got the quest that I wanted from the wizard. We have to hunt down a rare prismatic jelly in the mines, but this quest is gonna reward us with the recipe for monster musk. Ooh, I want me some of that. I guess I know what my next task is.
On the morning of day 23, we have another cranberry harvest ready, so I nom down on my farmer's lunch. Or brunch, I guess, this early in the morning, but within a couple of crops, we've reached a new level of understanding. This indicates that we reached our first level of mastery, and again, with the power of hindsight, I definitely should have gone and checked this out right now instead of finishing the harvest. Heading down to the mastery cave, I did have to do a little bit of thinking as to which path is going to give us the most benefit. Like I said before, we will unlock all of them eventually, but for now, I feel that farming is the best one to unlock right now. The farming mastery comes with a perk that allows us to find golden animal crackers. Feeding one of these crackers to our animals doubles the amount of produce that that animal will create forever. Given that I want an egg empire, I'm feeling like I want a lot of these. The only animal that this does not apply to are pigs. It also gives us the Statue of Blessings recipe, which will give us one of seven random blessings every day. But honestly, I'm most excited about the Iridium Scythe. I'll show off the power of that bad boy real soon. This day initially, anyway, is very much a chore day as I head over to Clint's to grab my new tool. I haven't been mentioning it a lot, but I have been slowly increasing the tier of all of our tools. With the exception of the trash can, everything is upgraded to gold tier or higher. I crafted these mushroom logs a little while ago that again are new to 1.6. They're gonna grow us mushrooms every so often, and they've just been sitting in a box for the last, like, month, so I'm gonna stick them up at the tree farm here. At the end of the day, I have a couple minutes to burn, so I'm just clearing out a bit of space south of the farm. This giant accumulation of rock and wood is getting a little annoying to walk around. On the morning of day 24, I decided that I had too much money and wanted to spend a bunch. I'm down at Marnie's where I plan on filling up the rest of our coop with rabbits. Rabbits, you say? That's an interesting one. You may not have noticed, but I am incredibly lazy with social objectives. I have been making an effort to chat with the villagers, give an occasional gift, just to accumulate a few friendship points, but I'm very much not interested in doing it yet. Once these rabbits grow up, they have a chance of producing rabbit's feet every day. Rabbit's feet are a universally loved gift in the town, except for, I think, Penny? We'll cover these mechanics more in depth later, but for now, just know that these rabbits are serving only to make the townsfolk like me. Then it's back to the mines trying to get materials and hunt for that prismatic jelly. The next morning, as I'm tending to my animals, the message pops up a second time. We have reached our second mastery level. I head down to the Mastery Cave, and it's time to make a decision that I feel is quite a bit more difficult than the first one. I was really scratching my head between combat, foraging, and mining. After some head scratching, I decided to choose Mining as our second mastery. This gives us a perk so that gem-bearing rocks will now give us twice the gems. For example, if we find a diamond node and harvest it, it will always drop two diamonds minimum now. It also gives us the heavy furnace recipe, which is more efficient than a regular furnace. But what swayed my choice is the recipe for the statue of the Dwarf King. Every day, it will give you a choice between two of five random mining-related powers every day. Since it looks like we won't be completing our community center before winter, I'm definitely going to be investing more time in the mines. On the morning of day 26, our first batch of pumpkin juice is ready. Oh yeah! Then it's just mine, 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 still hunting for that prismatic jelly. Another building that I've commissioned from Robin recently is the stable. This is a big reason why I didn't want to spend a hundred hardwood at the stump south of the farm, because this stable also costs a hundred. Now we have a pony! Who I have to name. I name my horse Caitlin, because I enjoy riding Caitlin. No man, inappropriate. Um, horse names. Ed. Sure. Then later in the day, I'm down in the Skull Cavern Mines and I finally find that prismatic jelly. It's a supercharged jelly, but it really doesn't matter because I just kind of pin him in the corner with my sword and win. Sweet! I continue mining and then I get a message indicating that the Spirit's Eve Festival has just begun in the town square. Ah, oh, I'm feeling good about today. How about we go check out the fair? As you can imagine, at the end of fall, it's a very All Hallows Eve themed event. And the most notable thing is this little hedge maze that they put up in town. I make my way through the maze, talking with the villagers along the way, just for that little bit of extra friendship until I reach the chest at the end. For solving the maze, we get a golden pumpkin, and this thing used to be worth 30k, so I saved it for the end of the season, but it's not worth 30k anymore. There was also another rare crow at the shop, so I made sure to pick that up, and, um, let's put the Wicked Witch of the West here, sure. And here we are on the morning of day 28, the last day of fall. We have our final cranberry harvest, and let me show off the power of this Iridium Scythe. 
Honestly, the scythe has never really felt truly useful because most of the function that it served could be copied with the sword. That is until the Iridium Scythe, which is now able to harvest all crops in its radius. Oh wow, we are carving through this harvest. This is so nice. It works on everything, including forage, so those clusters of spring onions during the spring season, we can get them in a single swipe. I run down to the wizard's tower, turning in that prismatic jelly and finishing the quest. That's another 5,000 gold, and tomorrow morning the wizard should mail us the recipe for monster musk. Then it's just a series of chores preparing us for the next season. Starting with the tree farm, where you can see that we also have some mushrooms ready for us. Useful? I don't know, but we might need them. Then it's down to Clint's to process Geode and these mystery boxes. It occurs to me I haven't really shown what these mystery boxes give, and it's pretty much just useful stuff. Mixed seeds, assorted resources, but you can also get a couple of these books. I get one book that increases the chance of finding more mystery boxes, and I get a book for farming experience. Very cool. I've been feeling a little short on storage, and instead of just blasting out more chests, I got the big chest upgrade from Robin. Big chests are another update in 1.6, and you can simply place them over top of existing chests. This preserves the contents of the chest while doubling the size and returning the smaller chest to you. And that's all I got for fall of year one. I kept that batch of pumpkin juice around so that we could sell everything on the final night of the month. We earned 215,509 gold for the day. Uh, it would have been nice if that pumpkin was still worth 30k, but eh, I'll take the 2750. Let's take a quick look at our money and skills. Our total earnings are now just shy of 1.2 million, holding 270,000 gold in our hands right now. Our skills are maxed across the board, and we managed to get two levels of mastery already. We're also missing only a duck feather, sunfish, and truffle for the community center. Taking a look at our collections, it's obvious that we've done a lot of work, but have a lot to go still. I think our most filled in section is minerals, and there's still like 10 missing. But you know what? For fall of year one, I feel pretty good about this. The first day of winter greets us with a pretty chilly looking map. Since the ground is now frozen, our fields aren't going to get much use this season except for a few scattered wild seeds for some forage and the new powder melon seeds added in 1.6. After the go 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 attitude for the last several months, I thought that winter would be a great time to get a bit of organization under us. After doing a few chores, I head off to Pierre's to buy a few seeds. Well, more accurately, saplings for some fruit bearing trees. Different fruit bearing trees grow in different seasons, but we have a greenhouse now and we can grow them in there as well. Then, and honestly, this is gonna be the case a lot of the time during this season, I go mining. After a successful day, I decided that I had a little bit too much money in my pocket, so I headed up to the dwarf in the Stardew Valley mines. I buy a bunch of cherry bombs from him, which I felt would help us greatly in our mining endeavors this month. On the morning of day two, we have a big batch of pumpkin juice ready. I make sure that they all get refilled, and then it's off to the mines for more resource gathering. One of my primary goals this month is completely upgrading all of our tools to a Iridium quality. My first priority though is to get the 20 Iridium bars for the statue of the Dwarf King to get my mining mastery blessings. Then it's going to be all about getting our pickaxe upgraded because this month is going to be a lot of mining. And so I mine, 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 mine! On the morning of day three, I've gained enough experience that I can head back to the mastery cave to choose another one. A little head scratching later and I decided to go with the foraging mastery this time. This was actually a fantastic choice because those golden mystery boxes have some incredible items in them. The mystic tree seeds and treasure totems I'll of course get into later, but for now those mystery boxes are all I wanted. After returning to the farm and doing a little bit of maintenance work around the place, I decided that it was a little bit too late in the day to head out to the mines. Instead, I'm going to start tearing down all of this old infrastructure so we can start planning out our new farm. I'm going to affectionately be calling the new layout Farm 2.0. As I've been wandering the map for the last couple of days, I've collected the last of the winter forage, being able to now complete that bundle. Oh, we're just missing the sunfish and that truffle. We were so close to getting this community center done. But honestly, that's fine. We're still going to have an awesome winter. For completing that bundle overnight, the Junimos repair the quarry bridge for us. We now have access to the quarry via that bridge, but it's also a minecart location if you have them unlocked. On the morning of day four, I now have my statue of the Dwarf King, so let's grab our blessing. 
Higher chance for finding ladders and shafts? Absolutely. I actually have a fair amount of iridium ore right now, so instead of going back to the Skull Cavern mines, I decided to clear out our quarry. Every day there's a chance that new rocks, nodes, and trees will spawn up here. Also, you may have noticed the little bit of cave tucked away in the top left. This leads us into a separate, more dangerous part of the Stardew Valley mines. There's only the one floor, as well as some new enemy types, and if you make it to the end of this floor, there's a golden scythe available. This gold scythe is in no way superior to our iridium scythe, but hey, this is a perfection run. I want to grab absolutely everything. Day 5, I do not have my pickaxe because Clint is upgrading it to iridium for us, so I'm chopping away at our farm infrastructure with an axe. Don't worry, I'm a professional. If I'm not too far off, our keg should be finishing the next batch of pumpkin juice right as we're ready to start rearranging this farm. Since I'm so wealthy now, I also decided to go and check out the bookseller who I haven't seen yet. This is another addition to 1.6, and after scrolling through, I decided to buy all of the books that gave me abilities, but none of the books that gave me experience. I am more than capable of getting experience right now. I buy four books, one that no longer slows our speed while walking through crops and grass, one that makes our pony go faster, one that makes us go faster, and one that will show us the price of things from our inventory. I have a bit of a sneaky plan here for winter that that final book is sure gonna help with. Our community board quest this week was overpopulation of perch, so I spend the rest of the day fishing to complete that. On day six, those kegs are ready, so it's time to start breaking things apart and rearranging our farm. First, I want to break down all of this stuff that's on the ground so that I can move my buildings around more freely. I head up to Robin's because she's the one that actually allows you to move stuff around. Back on the farm, I'm then taking a look at what materials I have available to me, just kind of laying them out on the ground to see what my palette is. I have no clue what I'm doing, by the way. Palette makes me sound fancy. I finish setting up a little storage slash production area, and it's time to show off another neat little thing that I picked up from Robin's. I bought myself a workbench, which is a crafting screen that allows you to access the eight inventories adjacent to that crafting bench. So obviously the best place for it is in the center of our main storage. And the rest of the day is spent transferring those inventories. On day seven, renovations continue as I start setting up our new keg area. I visit Clint next to claim our now fully upgraded Iridium pickaxe. Oh yeah. Actually, that's not entirely true. Although this is the top tier of the pickaxe, there are still ways in which we can make it better in the future. Oh yeah, we're nowhere near done yet. Isn't it a nifty dink? The tree farm is also ready to harvest today, which lends to the fact that we're expanding our farm. But because there's like 7 billion things going on at any given moment, that's probably going to happen tomorrow. Instead, I spend the rest of the day organizing and transferring all of our chests over to the new area. I get those put down and working, and then I start laying out our sprinkler configuration for the next season. I have no doubt that we're going to be able to get the raw ore resources that we need, but I'm very much doubting that we got the number of battery packs that we need. There's a good chance that this field will not be fully iridium by the end of the season. On day 9, I'm working on another community board quest that I got from Robin this time. It's actually the hardwood one that we failed a few weeks ago, but now we have all of these mahogany trees at the tree farm ready. Mahogany trees are by far the best way to get hardwood. While I'm in the neighborhood, I decided to stop by the Adventurer's Guild and spend even more money. I really love the galaxy sword, but the hammer is more my style. I also check out my monster hunting progress just to see where we're at. My last stop is then turning in all of that hard wood to Robin's box. Wow. All weapons have a special ability. These abilities have a cooldown which is indicated on your toolbar. Swords block, daggers go stab stab stab, but hammers go smash smash. There is a glitch with the hammer's ability though. If you repeatedly click the left mouse button while that animation is playing, you actually strike the ground a bunch of times. Given that this was left in for the 1.6 patch, I'm simply ruling that this glitch is too fun to not use. Always remember, it's not the size of the hammer, it's how you wield it. And I spend the rest of the day in the mines playing with my hammer. I spend all of day 10 in the mines, and I will show you that yes, I do still die sometimes. I could make the excuse that the hammer swings slower than the sword, so I'm still getting used to it, but um, I still died plenty with the sword. On day 11, first thing in the morning, I am busting in Clint's door the second he opens. I want to crack open a couple of geodes, but I'm really interested in what's in these golden mystery boxes. I only have two, but the first one gives us four mystery boxes, and the second one gives us a cherry sapling. 
Those four mystery boxes then turn into some mixed seeds, a bunch of deluxe speed grow. Like, this stuff is fairly useful, to be honest. And I would definitely say that there are better things I can get from these boxes. Back at the farm, it's time to cycle through another batch of pumpkin juice. You gotta love it. And it's more mining, coming back to the valley after a long day where my loyal horse waits patiently for my return. It's the little touches like that that give this game so much charm. On the morning of day 12, I have the perfect circumstances that I've been looking for. The spirits are very happy today, so it is the best natural luck, plus my Statue of Blessings gave me a plus one bonus, plus the Statue of the Dwarf King gave us an increased chance for ladders and shafts. I also, from one of my mystery boxes, found a magic rock candy that I've been saving for exactly this moment. It provides an insane amount of buffs, and today we are pushing hard in Skull Cavern. The goal is to get as deep as possible and get as much Iridium Ore as I possibly can. Having all of this luck on my side is incredible. It's only 6.30 p.m. and I'm already almost 50 floors down with seven new golden mystery boxes. I mean among a bunch of other awesome treasures, but in Skull Cavern you can also find these treasure floors randomly. This one gives me an auto petter, which is absolutely fantastic. Sticking this thing in our coop means that I no longer have to go in there and pet all of my animals every day. Which, yes, I have done every day since the start of the farm. I push it right to 1.50 a.m. before using a farm totem to warp home. There's still plenty of ways that we can get deeper in this mine more consistently, but having 135 Iridium Ore at the end of today feels pretty good. The next day, I'm super interested in seeing what's inside of all those mystery boxes, so I head to Clint's. We get some nifty seeds and life elixirs, which are great health and energy for the mines. But I'd say that the most exciting piece of this batch is the treasure chest that we found. As far as I'm aware right now, there's not a whole heck of a lot of use for the treasure chest aside from selling it for 5,000 gold. On the morning of day 14, I have another mastery available, so I head back down to the mastery cave and select combat this time. It gives us two more recipes, the anvil, which allows us to reroll trinkets, we'll get to those in a second, the mini forge, which we can't build yet because we don't have access to Ginger Island, and a new perk. That perk being that we can now find and equip trinkets. There were a couple that really interested me, but I ended up using one at the end of this month that I could not believe the power of. First you gotta find them though, so it's back off to Skull Caverns. I have not yet mentioned the desert merchant out here. There are different items available, and instead of gold as the currency, things like Omni Geodes and Jade are used. Sunday is significant because it's the only day that you can exchange one Jade for one staircase. A staircase is an item that you can place in the mines that builds a staircase and allows you to drop one floor. This is why my Crystallarium has been pumping out Jade since I got it. We're now halfway through winter, and honestly, it seems to be a trend that halfway through the month, I kind of run out of new things to talk about. This month could be considered a little bit monotonous, as I pretty much spent the entire time in Skull Cavern. Cause baby, it's cold outside. Don't worry though, we Canadians are pretty good at filling time in the cold months. For instance, in every season, there's a rooster that will signal the start of the day, but not during winter. I was then reminded of rubber chickens when I slowed that sound down to a quarter speed. Okay, that's enough of that. Then I enhanced the audio and passed it through a series of filters, and I think I hear something if I play it backwards. Subscribe to Exceptional. Wait, hold on. I think I can isolate the frequency. Subscribe to Exceptional. Well, shucks. Who would have seen that coming? The first trinket that I find is a frog egg that gives me a little frog companion that follows me around. This little dude is super hungry and is just gonna nom on enemies for me, but I don't get drops or experience from it. It's cool, but I think there are better ones. The next day I find another trinket, the basilisk paw, which makes you immune to debuffs. That's more like it. That's a trinket that's gonna be real useful. That one is a little short-lived though, as I find one of the ones that I really had my eye on. The Golden Spur, when you get a critical strike, gives you a speed boost for five seconds. You may not have noticed, but I like going fast. On top of all of the other benefits down here, I'm also getting some of those Monster Slayer goals knocked off. I mean, heck, it's all part of the perfection goals. I haven't been mentioning it every time, but I have been rotating the kegs every time they're ready. I'm now pretty much out of pumpkins and am absolutely carving through our supply of wheat. 
I really need more things to put in these kegs pronto. Day 17, it's more mining, and I die at, like, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that's unfortunate. Plenty of daylight left. Let's head right back out after stuffing some broccoli in our face. Eat your vegetables, kids. Broccoli is high in iron, and we need to steal ourselves for the rest of the day. And the broccoli keeps us healthy for the rest of the day. Remember that wheat process is much more quickly than the pumpkins were, so I'm pretty much refilling these kegs every day. Our stock of wheat is not gonna last. Throughout the month as well, I have been tending to our greenhouse pretty regularly, and you can see at the back of the greenhouse that I have a bunch of trees planted. That's right, crops might have to go in the center section, but you can plant trees along the perimeter. I have one of each of the fruit-bearing trees that are available to me right now growing. Then it's a bunch of mystery box and geode opening at Clint before handing him over another tool for upgrading. I have been working all month at getting all of our tools to the iridium tier. More beer. And on day 20, with another really good luck day on our side, I decided to push Skull Cavern hard again. Most of the time I'm taking the bus out there, but if I'm able to leave early enough, I'm definitely using the totems. I have an incredibly successful day using some of those staircases that I bought with Jade to propel myself even lower. I make it all the way down to level 100, which does have a guaranteed treasure floor. I get a red cowboy hat, so that's lame, but cool, level 100 in Skull Cavern. There's more mining and slaying in store, continuing to nail off those monster slayer goals. And while mining on day 22, I see that glorious message pop up one final time. I have reached a new level of understanding. That is the final level of our masteries. I finish out the day heading to the Adventurer's Guild just to see how our Monster Slayer goals are actually coming along. Honestly, incredibly well. I didn't think I'd be going after these until year two at least. And instead of going down to the Mastery Cave on the morning of day 23, I just kind of wander off to the mines again. I had actually taken a small break here while playing and completely forgot that I had maxed out my Masteries. We're also completely out of wheat, so I'm filling all of our kegs with the coffee that I've been growing in the greenhouse. And on day 23, I find that trinket that I mentioned is so powerful earlier. I completely overlooked it when I was first looking at the trinkets, but after playing with it, wow. It summons a parrot companion to follow us around who has a chance to find gold coins when we slay monsters. But after playing with it and killing a couple of those large purple slimes that split into a bunch of smaller slimes, that was 500 gold right there. I keep teasing and then not explaining Monster Musk, but trust me when I say this parrot is gonna be awesome. On the morning of day 24, it's time to claim that mastery. I take fishing as the last one and we feel Grandpa's hand patting our shoulder. Gosh, if that isn't just the most heartwarming thing ever. This day is when I really started to appreciate that parrot trinket. I'm heading into Skull Cavern at 4.30 p.m., so pretty late in the day, with 5,200 gold on me. About eight hours later in the mine, and I've almost made 10,000 gold. That's just steady income that I now get all the time when I go mining. Masteries are incredible. Day 25, and it's Christmas! Oh, I mean the Feast of the Winter Star. This event has a Secret Santa gift-giving component. You get assigned a random person to bring a gift for, and mine was Harvey. I have nothing that Harvey likes, so thank goodness for all of these rabbit's feet. I give the rabbit's foot to Harvey, triggering a cutscene. It looks like my Secret Santa was the vapid blonde of the town, Haley. She gives me a blackberry cobbler, which is actually super good. Thank you so much, Haley. Now please go read a book. And is it any shocker that I just continue mining? Between our parrot and our golden trash can, which allows us to reclaim 40% of the item's value that we put into it, I'm making bank. If you've been keeping track of my gold all month, you may have noted that it hasn't exactly been impressive. Like I said, I had a bit of a secret planned. These days it's feeling like every day in the mines is a good day. As I'm able to progress more quickly through the mines, I'm also getting a bunch more resources, a bunch more golden mystery boxes. It is all good news bears. I feel like I've been making good use out of all of the goodies that I've been getting out of those boxes, like the farm totems and a bunch of these mega bombs. At the end of day 27, I came up with a plan for day 28. I don't know if this is gonna work or not, but my thought process was to try and propel myself into year two. I make a bunch of basic retaining soil that has a chance of staying watered overnight when it's mixed into tilled soil. My thinking was that if I got as many fields ready as I could today, it would reduce the workload tomorrow. 
Having a full suite of Iridium tools sure helps though. We're now able to water and hoe 18 spaces at a time. I get done as much as I possibly can before turning it in for the end of year one. For the end of the year, I thought it would be fun to showcase everything that I have in my chests right now. These bottom chests are split into the spring, summer, fall, and winter items, with the black chest on the end being anything that I want to process in my kegs. On the outside row, I have general farm materials and supplies, followed by prepared food and gifting items for the villagers. The top chest on the outside row reveals my little secret. I have been selling things throughout the month in order to supplement my income so that I could continue upgrading the tools. If I didn't have to sell it though, I didn't, and I hoarded it in this box. All of that goes in the shipping bin, so we'll see how much that's worth overnight, and let's take a look at the material chests. I have a monster chest with all of my mob drops and combat items in it, a kind of random garbage dump chest, a chest that is specifically for trash items which we can recycle, a nice full box of fish and fishing materials. I also have the legendary fish that I've caught so far in here, and they will get a new home eventually. The next box is associated with forage that you find around the map that doesn't really have a season. And my basic materials chest. I'm feeling pretty good about our stockpiles, and yeah, look at the 88 cloth in there. That's worth a fair amount of money by itself as well. My most valuable chest, though, by far, is the mining chest. I've stockpiled a lot of wealth in this thing, a good chunk of which is probably going towards gifting. With that, let's take a quick look at our character at the end of year one. Our total earnings so far is just over 1.3 million, but that's about to change, and we're holding around 7,500 gold on our person. Our skills and our masteries are fully maxed. There's still plenty of socializing left to do, but check it out. Harvey's had three hearts after giving him that rabbit's foot during the festival. I think I've talked to him, like, once otherwise. My perks, masteries, and collections are all filling out nicely as well. And as we tuck in for the night, let's see how much money we made. Yes, that is exactly what I was hoping for. Just over one million. That is gonna be one heck of a way to start year two. Ah, there's nothing like rolling out of bed in the morning as your money counter shoots up over a million. Thanks, Past Egg, and oh, as we step outside, look at it. Well, first I guess cutscene. This is Kent. He's Jody's husband, and he's just gotten back from dot 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 overseas. He's being a good, polite neighbor, introducing himself and letting me know that I have another person I need to figure out gifts for. The first order of business is checking out our mailbox where we have a notice informing us that the price of raw materials at Robin and Clint's shop have increased. I'm gonna be trying to not buy as much wood this year as a result of that, but let's be honest. We all saw what was accomplished in the first year, I'm hoping that price won't be an issue. And all right, it's time to start prepping the fields. Unfortunately, all of that hoeing, watering, and retaining soil that I fertilized with yesterday did absolutely nothing. So let this egghead be the first to tell you, don't do that. I've had a couple of strawberry plants growing in the greenhouse, and I've been turning all of those strawberries into seeds using the seed maker. I have enough seeds to cover the top field in those, but we're gonna have to get something else for the rest of the farm. I then head over to Pierre's where I'm gonna be buying a bunch of seeds. I'm gonna be buying a thousand cauliflower seeds because that's what our fields are gonna be filled with at the start of the month anyway, but I'm also making sure to grab every single other seed that Pierre has available. Especially now that we have the greenhouse, it's nice to have all of these seeds on demand because they are not available out of season. At least, not yet. The rest of the day is spent repeating all of the work that I did on Winter 28 and planting as many cauliflowers in the ground as I can possibly get done. By the end of day one, the top fields are filled and the bottom field has a sizable crop of cauliflower growing. And the morning of day two is spent expanding the cauliflower crop to all of our iridium sprinklers. A flaw in my ability to look ahead is about to reveal itself. I have all the materials in the world to craft more sprinklers, but I need more battery packs. And trust me when I say, we need more battery packs. At the end of the day, we have a bunch of blackberry wine available, and it isn't super valuable to be honest, but I just wanted to keep our kegs working. I'm actually pretty much out of things to put in them aside from some coffee from the greenhouse. Good news at the end of the day though, the early season push to get everything set up for spring is pretty much done. It's time to shift the priority back to getting the community center done, and I already have the truffle from the pig. I'm gearing up for a fishing adventure to go and get that darn sunfish tomorrow. 
On the morning of day three, this is unfortunately the last of what I had to process through the kegs. It's a little unfortunate, but they will be sitting idle for a few days anyway. Chores done, let's head south and start our adventure trying to catch a sunfish. I cast my line, there's a fish on it, and it's done. We've got a sunfish. Um, fishing adventure over? The reason I came down here to fish was actually so that I could visit Marnie once she opened at 9 o'clock. I was only here to pick up a couple of auto grabbers, which will automatically collect all of the produce that our animals produce. Well, everything within the respective barn and coop. It won't say pick up truffles, which the pigs are finding outside of the barn. I also happen across this animal catalog, which allows us to access Marnie's shop when she's not around. Given that I'm a little bit rich right now and have definitely been caught a few times by her yoga schedule every Tuesday morning, I'm definitely picking that one up too. I put one in the coop and one in the barn, and as you can see on my toolbar, we have a sunfish and truffle. I only get a little distracted on my way to the community center to turn these in and finish that off. I think I might have overdone it slightly, completing both of these bundles at the same time though. As you can see in the little cutscene here, all of the Junimos are celebrating while the other one is trying to put up the star from the fish bundle. The Junimos have one final message for us. The last bundle. Farewell, egghead. That completes one of the most satisfying goals in this playthrough. With the community center done, we're going to be opening up a little bit more of the world, but a couple of things have to happen first. Ah, just take a second to appreciate it though. Beautiful. Repairing the community center is actually going to change a couple of the behaviors of the people in the town. Now that it's repaired, they actually do hang out in it and use it like a community center. It's super cool. Since I spent the entirety of winter pretty much in the mines, I needed a small break and decided to keep fishing. We don't have any more fish submission goals, but in order to get the Master Angler achievement, we have to catch at least one of every fish. There are some unique ones, ironically enough in the mines, which I was trying to avoid, on floors 20, 60, and 100 of the Stardew Valley Mine. I spend most of the next day as well pursuing the same goal. There's another legendary fish we can catch now that we have the sewers unlocked, so I head down there and we have another cutscene. It turns out that the dwarf character from the Mines and Krobus don't really get along that well. They're fighting it out when the wizard shows up, explains to them that the elemental wars have passed. There's no reason to be feuding any longer. They aren't exactly the best of friends by the end, but they've both agreed to move forward peacefully. They have nothing against each other directly after all. The reason I'm down here though is to find the legendary fish, which again just happens to be the first thing I hook. I then catch the legendary mutant carp and go to explore the little tunnel access that we have on the northwest part of the map. We're blocked by a magical barrier, so we'll check that out later. Since I finished off two rooms at the exact same time in the community center, I actually had to wait an additional day for the community center completion to take full effect. Because we completed the community center, everybody in town is just that little bit happier with us, and I've got a lot of new recipes in the mailbox. When you get to a high enough friendship level with all of the townspeople, they will send you recipes as well as random gifts in the mail. Scrolling through a bunch of them, ah, this is the one I was looking for. Willy is letting us know that we've unlocked the back room of his shop and we should go check it out when we have a chance. This is what I was really gunning for completing the community center. But, uh, yeah, remember those battery packs. I head to town and it's time for one of my favorite cutscenes in this game. The community center is done and the village is celebrating. Fun fact, now that the community center is repaired, the clock on the front of it will actually be accurate to the in-game time. We head inside and the camera pans across, showing every single community member here and enjoying the center. It's a pretty jovial atmosphere until we hear a grumble 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 from the door. Morris comes in, ah, oh, my sales have been plummeting, where have my customers gone? Pierre confronts him and we the player have a choice. Let's see, be reasonable or settle this the old-fashioned way? <laughs> yeah, old-fashioned way. Morris offers a 75% off coupon to everybody in the town and Pierre puts up his dukes. Morris says Pierre is primitive, Pierre says Morris is scared, and oh, you gotta love the schoolyard baloney. Pierre then insults Joja Corp, and that's when Morris kicks into gear. I'm gonna have to blur this out because this fight is so brutal. You're weaker than your fresh produce selection. Yeah, well, you throw punches like Joja, quantity over quality. Pierre finishes the battle with a sick uppercut, holy man, and tosses on the Thug Life glasses. I love this game. Ah, the next stop is Willy's, where I'm going to be waiting extremely patiently for him to open. Once inside, we can go check out what's in his back room. 
It's time for another cutscene as Willie reveals his boat to us. Just his boat. It's actually his dad's boat, and he's been wanting to fix it, but doesn't have the materials. Well, hey, Willie. I got stuff. The material list is going to be three turn-ins of 200 hardwood, five iridium bars, no problem, and five battery packs. Like I said, we're completely out of battery packs. All of them have been used for iridium sprinklers in our fields. And this is the point in spring of year two where I lose the plot a little bit. And because we don't have battery packs and I essentially just have to wait until stormy weather to find some, I didn't really know what to do with myself. You can get battery packs as a monster drop from Iridium Bat, so I guess I'll just go mining. You have to appreciate the irony too, I just spent like 50,000 gold on auto grabbers and immediately find one in the mines. So the question really became what to do with myself. There's always chores to be doing, including keeping up on our greenhouse, our coffee is ready every other day, as well as all of our fruit-bearing trees have grown up on the back row. They'll be producing for us as well now, and the reason I like them in my greenhouse is because they'll produce all year round, whereas if they're planted outside, they will only produce during their respective season. Then, in a beautifully executed egghead thought process, I realize, hmm, battery packs come from lightning rods. The lightning rods, of which all of mine are sitting in a chest because after reorganizing the farm during winter, I never put them back out. Or provided scarecrow coverage. What can I say? I'm not perfect. But once those are in place, it really does become a question of filling time until we can gather those battery packs. My plan extended onto Ginger Island, but uh, that kind of fell apart. Day 8 is a rainy day, and it's just a rainy day. No thunder today, so no battery packs. I pick up a new quest from the community board for Gus. He needs 24 eggs. That shouldn't be a problem at all. And I decided to check out the Jojo location now that they've been chased out of town. There's actually another bundle within this building that we can now complete. It requires much more advanced materials, honestly, most of which we already have access to. Right now, though, I'm not going to be calling this a priority. And then it's pretty much just filling time in the mines, waiting for battery packs and hunting down as many of those purple bats as I can find. Don't get me wrong, being in the mines is a useful thing to be doing right now. I need all of these raw materials eventually, but it's just a little tedious. I've spent so much time in the mines lately. I've been trying to make sure that progress continues in other aspects where we're not waiting for battery packs. Completing the fish tank in the community center gave us access to the pan as well as the ability to pan for ores. As of 1.6, this pan can be updated to have better yields and a chance to immediately cause another panning spot to appear. I don't plan on doing much panning, but this is definitely going to make the small amount that is required a lot easier. Mining, 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 and chores fill the next several days. I've had those auto grabbers set up for a couple of days, so let's check out what they've produced for us. Ah, it's a beautiful thing, and yes, all of the eggs that I'm grabbing out of this thing are counting towards our quest for Gus. He requires that you not only submit 24 eggs, but gather 24 eggs, and it does count coming out of the auto grabbers. Only the first time, though. You can't just put the same egg in 24 times and pull it back out. And on day 10, I decided to come up to the tree farm to check out how those mystic seeds I planted are doing. These mystic trees were unlocked by our foraging mastery, and I'm pretty keen to check out what they have to offer. You can just barely tell, too, that they're quite red because I did use tree fertilizer on these ones. Mystic trees count as wild trees. And I know you're shocked by this, but it's mine, 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 reaping every benefit from that parrot. These infested floors are particularly nice for that. Just look at all that cash. A small little cluster of monsters for two golden mystery boxes, an iridium bar, 3750 gold, two bombs as well. It feels good. On the morning of day 11, I'm picking up our steel pan, which I'll be resubmitting immediately to be turned to gold, but first it's time to do a little bit of geode processing. Well, these days it's geode and mystery box processing, which I am fine with. I'm finally starting to process my omni geodes as well. I no longer need to use them as currency to get warp totems to the desert. This is definitely going to help us fill out our museum collection, as well as we get our first dwarven computer, which once we get our second one, I can finally craft the farm computer. Yeah, we'll come back to that when it's relevant. This museum is definitely starting to fill out. Then the remainder of days 11 and 12 are pretty much spent in the mines, tearing it up. On the morning of day 13, I have something to report that isn't mining, hooray! Our first batch of cauliflower is now done, and holy moly, look at that one! 
Certain crops like cauliflower, melons, pumpkin, and powder melon now in 1.6 can morph into giant crops. This requires the crop to be grown in a 3x3 three three area. Iridium sprinklers have the coverage now that we can get away with a lot of those. Or at least a chance for a lot of those. You need to break them with your axe and it will yield more produce. In this 3x3 three three area, instead of getting the 9 typical cauliflowers, I actually get 17. Heck yeah. If you remember the significance of the 13th of spring from last year, it's time for a festival. I have exactly one goal at the festival this year. I walk like 15 paces in, buy a thousand strawberry seeds, and it's time to go. Catch you later! Despite being at the festival for all of like 30 seconds, the time still advances to 10 p.m., but that should be enough for us to get these seeds in the ground. After all, I'm just replacing all of the cauliflower that I harvested this morning, so these tiles are already hoed and watered. The next morning, the rest of the cauliflower is ready, so I harvest it up and replant the rest of the strawberry seeds. Then after consulting the growth chart online because I didn't feel like doing math, I made a trip to town to Pierre's. I am also this year making more of an effort to speak to the villagers and give them salads as I pass by. With the exception of Krobus, Leo, and Willy, every single townsperson at least likes salads as gifts. It's just a great way for me to start building up some of these relationships because, eh, social stuff, eh. The point of the trip, though, was to buy a bunch of deluxe speed grow from Pierre. I then run around my fields applying it to every single new strawberry plant that we have. It's slightly inefficient to put it on the crop that we planted yesterday, but we will still see one additional yield from it. For strawberries, that is very worth it. And as I kept mining at the end of day 14, I decided it was time for a break. I guess I'll spend a little bit more time socializing, but ooh, there's something new I didn't know about. And as a result of not knowing about it, I'm gonna miss out on a little bit of potential from the Desert Festival. We'll get back to that in a second though, my initial goal on the morning of day 15 was to get some of these quests out of my backlog. Because I've been making sure to keep at least a couple of every item that I collect, I'm able to just kind of go through the quests and go through my chests, finding things that people want. I then started a big loop going all the way around the valley trying to turn in all of these items. I ran into a bit of a problem though, in that I couldn't find a bunch of the villagers. Where the heck did they all go? During the spring, after unlocking the bus, on days 15, 16, and 17 is the Desert Festival. Here's where everybody went. And I just again cannot help but laugh at the irony that the second I decided I am done with the mines, I am so over this, we get an event that has challenges in the mines. Sweet, new challenges, let's jump in. But first I did want to check out this festival a little bit because I haven't been here before. I gave Emily an apricot and she offers us a makeover. Well, yeah, sure. She kind of ends up turning us into Ted Shackelford, so um, thanks, but no thanks? Despite not having battery packs, I don't feel I have time to monkey around a lot. Let me just put my clothes back on. Thank you, though, bye. I descend into the depths of the mines once again, but this time I'm collecting some of these calico eggs. As you make it lower in the mines and activate shrines which give random effects, you get more egg points. Egg score? I don't know how it works, but at the end of the day you're able to talk to Gil and get a prize based on your egg score. Cool, and I'm definitely back the next day checking it out again. Day 17 is going to be the last day of the festival, but before we head out there, I have exciting news. After harvesting them, I popped a bunch of those cauliflowers into the kegs, and this is our first batch of cauliflower juice. Since this is the last day of the festival, I decided to try and spend as many of my calico eggs as I thought would be worth it. Turns out this bender has a magic rock candy, which heck yeah I'm gonna buy, those things are incredible. Another cool thing that I haven't mentioned is the food vendor out here. I have been taking advantage of this every day, and what he does is provide a food buff based on a couple of options that you choose. This food buff, by the way, is on top of your drink and food food buffs. They're additional, you can stack a lot of buffs including this. I go with the rare fruit and uncomfortably spicy combination, which gives plus three luck and plus one speed. At the end of the day, after grabbing our reward from Gil, I decided to go check out those shops. And it's midnight, apparently, that all the villagers turn in and go back home. Well, shoot, okay, let's go talk to the other merchant. I just decided to buy out his stash of mystery boxes and all of the mega bombs that I could afford. For a first crack at this festival, not bad at all. Now that the festival is over, though, I'm back to wondering what to do with myself as we wait for battery packs. 
I just, I can't seem to keep myself out of the mines because now I'm deciding to go and knock off a few more of those monster hunter objectives. There are a couple enemies that don't show up very often, like these Duggies that are only available in the low floors of the Stardew Valley Mines. Instead of going up and down the elevator looking for ore, I'm looking for monsters. Actually, if I'm gonna be going after monsters, I should finally tell you what Monster Musk is all about. I head back to the farm to craft some because it's gonna make our monster hunting just that little bit more efficient. I don't need much help with this, but it makes us smell irresistible to monsters, doubling the amount that spawn on every floor. It's gonna help knock off those monster hunting objectives for sure, but can you see what I mean by this parrot and monster musk? When we're all powered up and uber later, I wanna take a shot at the hard mode mines with Monster Musk and the Parrot just to see how much money we make. Let's be honest, I'll probably die immediately. After the Duggies are complete, it's then to the lower floors to take out Void Spirits. I gotta keep myself busy somehow as I continue waiting for a thunderstorm. Day 19, it's a bunch of the same again, just trying to fill time. Another thing that I became aware of is the book Friendship 101. Since I'm starting to give a care about social relationships, it feels like an incredibly powerful book to get. After we read it, this book is going to increase all of our friendship gains by 10%. It's available as the ninth prize from Mayor Lewis's ticket machine, so I'm definitely gunning for that. And at the Traveling Merchant today, I found a couple of neat things. The bed? Honestly, I can't remember where it came from, but the more exciting part was this Judomo catalog. Furniture catalogs did exist before, but 1.6 has added a bunch of new furniture. This Junimo catalog is gonna give us free access to a whole bunch of Junimo themed furniture and decorations. Things are looking a little spartan around here, but don't worry, I will decorate eventually. Easily, the most exciting part of this entire month though is the morning of day 20. It's a rainy day, the strawberries are ready, okay, let's get harvesting. And then it hits. Thunder. Glorious thunder. That means that tomorrow morning we have battery packs. All right, I just need to keep myself busy today. Stop one is Krobus. He's actually really easy once you have a bunch of money to gain friendship with. One of Krobus's loved gifts is a void egg, which he just so happens to sell for 5,000 gold. I buy one and I give it right back to him. He loves it. While I'm down here as well, I'm also going to be talking to the dog statue. This statue, for the cost of 10,000 gold, will allow you to reset the perks of one of your professions. I'm going to be resetting foraging, and I'll discuss why overnight. The rest of the day is spent doing chores and preparing myself for a long adventure away from home. That's not entirely accurate. I will be home most nights, but the farm is definitely not going to be my priority in the last week of spring. I've also now unlocked that area in the sewers so I can jump into there to grab the dark pendant as well as catch a slime jack. The talisman is going to help us unlock even more of the world, and the slime jack is going to put us one fish closer to being a master angler. And since it's raining, I decided to go check out this challenge bait in the river. I got access to it when becoming a master fisherman. The challenge bait allows you to catch up to three fish at a time, but it is challenging. The fish behaves no differently, but for every time that the fish leaves your green bar, you will lose one of those three fish. That includes on more challenging fish as well, like catfish, and this one pretty much got away from me immediately. Well, that's fun and all, but I want to go to Ginger Island. I'll see you tomorrow. Because I reset my foraging skill with the dog statue, overnight I'm able to pick new perks. Instead of going down the gatherer path this time, I'm going to be going for Forester to increase the amount of wood we get by 25%. Then for my level 10 skill, I'm going to be grabbing Lumberjack so that all trees have a chance of dropping hardwood. I'm not going to be relying on foraging for money at all anymore, instead using it to gather resources which are going to build us things to make even better money. There's still so much to do. So what do you feel is more exciting on the morning of day 21? Is it the fact that we have more cauliflower juice ready? Or is it the fact that our lightning rods have finally produced us battery packs? Speaking for myself, after waiting for like 20 days for a couple of battery packs, I'm gonna go with those ones. As it turns out, I'm just shy of the amount of hardwood that I needed, so I head up to the tree farm to harvest that. Fortunately, I have been fairly diligent about planting down my mahogany saplings, so I have five trees ready to chop down. Also, yes, the mystic tree did grow up, and I intend to put tappers on these for mystic sap. We'll come back to that. 
It is just past five o'clock and I am finally ready to go see Willy. Oh, actually, hey Shane, what's up? Do you want a salad or some crab cakes, man? Be my friend. I finally get down to the beach and uh, of course Willy's shop is closed at five. I know this. Well, I guess we're not going to Ginger Island today. Fine, so I just head back up to the tree farm to fill in as many tree spots as I possibly can. I want the wood, I want the hardwood, might as well plant it. On the morning of day 22, I have to wait for Willy's shop to open, so let's go check out the bookseller! I'm definitely convinced that whatever's going on in my brain is both a superpower and a curse. Don't worry, I'll stop getting distracted eventually. I make it down to Willy's and we can submit everything that is required to repair this boat. And it's gonna be repaired overnight. Uh, I guess I'm getting a little tired of walking through all this clutter, so I'll clean up the cinder sap forest. Like I said, I do need the wood and it just feels good to clean up this environment a little bit. On the morning of day 23, it's sunny, it's beautiful, and it feels like sailing weather. Lewis informs us that the flower dance is tomorrow, sorry man, don't care at all, and Willie lets us know that his shop, because the boat is repaired, is now open at 8 a.m. Also, you may not be able to see her in there, but my house is upgrading to the next tier. Having Willie's shop open an hour earlier is gonna be so nice for our Ginger Island adventures, so of course I get super distracted on the way down, turning up at 10.30. Similar to the bus, we do have to pay Willy every time that we want to go out there, so I pay the thousand gold fee and off we go. Ginger Island was added in the 1.5 update to Stardew Valley, so I have played through it once before, but only one time. We take our first steps in this tropical island paradise and we're kind of greeted, I guess, by Leo who screams at us and runs into the bushes. Leo, come back, friend. I want to be your buddy, guy. While chasing Leo down, I encounter the first of the golden walnut bushes. After, of course, getting distracted and cutting down all of the fiber because we do need fiber. I head into Leo's treehouse where he's hiding in a spot that I cannot get to him. I can give the golden walnut that I got outside to his parrot companion and this triggers the progression of Ginger Island. I was kind of hoping that my parrot might have some kind of fun interaction with the other parrots, but nothing that I've seen so far. There are now parrots spread around the island that will accept golden walnuts to unlock even more of the island. Also, as you step back onto the beach, there's this little flame spirit that's gonna guide you towards the mines. In total, there are 130 golden walnuts spread around the island and there are various ways of getting them, either through exploration or through tasks. I will not be showing all of the golden walnut locations though because I have enough to talk about. This mine does not behave like the Stardew Valley or Skull Cavern mines. Instead of going down through a bunch of procedurally generated floors, you're instead going up through 10 floors that reset daily. Be sure to bring your watering can though because you need it to get across some of these lava lakes. While progressing on Ginger Island is now going to be my primary focus, I will not be completely ignoring our farm, especially on the morning of day 24 when our entire strawberry field is ready to harvest. Then it's back out to Ginger Island where I continue mining. I'm not aiming specifically for ore, but I feel like the mine, especially with how equipped I am right now, is definitely the fastest way of getting a few more golden walnuts. In this mine, there are a total of 17 walnuts available, five from breaking rocks, five from killing enemies, five from breaking metal crates, one from a common chest, and one from a rare chest. The common chests are spawned randomly throughout the floors, and then the rare chest is always at the end. There are also mini puzzles in this mine, like having to activate switches to open the gates. Like I said, don't forget your watering can because you can't get through this dungeon without it sometimes. The ninth floor is always the last floor, which will lead you out into the volcano's caldera. Here we find the anvil, which is gonna allow us to do some pretty cool stuff. We can combine our rings to effectively get four ring slots instead of two, but even more exciting, we can forge and enchant our weapons and tools. It uses cinder shards as a reagent, a resource exclusive to this mine, to add diamonds and prismatic shards and oh, all kinds of things to your weapons. Different items give different effects while the prismatic shard gives enchants. The enchant is random and on my first go I get vampiric. This gives us a 9% chance to regain some of our health when we kill a monster. Cool, but not the one I'm going for. At the end of the day I head back down to the beach to make our next golden walnut purchase. For 10 golden walnuts, I'm unlocking the west side of the island, where arguably the most important stuff lies. Including, oh yeah, you see it correctly, another whole farm we can use. The rest of the day is spent exploring and collecting more walnuts. Feeling only a little bit torn between worlds, on the morning of day 25, we're back on the farm harvesting. More strawberries are ready, more cauliflower juice is ready. 
The greenhouse, by the way, just continues producing all the time. And yeah, I'm trying to get through these chores as quickly as possible because I want back on that island. Easily one of the most challenging golden walnut puzzles is the Simon Says Crystal Puzzle. The crystals light up and make a noise and then you have to try and repeat the pattern. Seems easy enough, but it actually gets pretty intense at the end. Anytime you fail, the puzzle starts back from the beginning. After failing a couple of times, I decided to cheat. What can I say? I record all of my footage, so why don't I just watch it back really quickly and see what the order was? Oh yeah, great success! First try! I spend the rest of the day unlocking walnuts and I want to start preparing this farm. I still need more walnuts to unlock the farm, but clearing it out now isn't gonna hurt anything. I spend the entirety of day 26 doing exactly the same and it's time to unlock that farm. For the low low cost of 20 golden walnuts, we now have the second farmhouse unlocked. I then spend the rest of day 26 fishing because there are 5 walnuts that you can find from fishing. On the morning of day 27, I want to try and organize myself a little bit. A recipe that we unlocked with the mining mastery was the mini forge. Another nifty thing added in 1.6, so now I don't have to go all the way out to Ginger Island in order to enchant and combine my rings. My rings are going to be an iridium band combined with the burglar's ring, and then a slime charmer's ring combined with the napalm ring. We now glow, have magnetism, do 10% more damage, we're immune to slimes, and when we defeat enemies, they blow up. Tell me what part of that isn't amazing. On top of there being a couple of golden walnuts left in the mine, I'm also gathering a bunch more of those cinder shards. More cinder shards means more enchants and more tool upgrades. And suddenly, after what felt like an eternity of waiting for those battery packs, we're on the last day of spring in year two already. Our final strawberry crop is ready to go, and once our kegs are done with the cauliflower, we have a lot of strawberry wine to make. To the point where including my plans for the summer crops, we're gonna need more kegs again. Then, no surprise, it's back out to Ginger Island where it's actually raining today. On rainy days on the island, a gem bird will spawn in one of the four quadrants of the island. North, south, east, and west. That gem bird will drop one of five possible gems, which is part of a puzzle. Right next to Leo's treehouse is a puzzle with four pedestals. We just got an emerald from the west part of the island, so this goes on the west pedestal. We'll either have to wait for the next rainy day to find out what the next gem bird is, or we could just randomly guess at it, but I'll wait for now. I then continue collecting and spending more golden walnuts, unlocking the dig site next. I did it this way because the farm is going to give us a lot more convenience, while the dig site unlocks a lot of opportunity for more walnuts. Well, soon it will anyway, I guess my pickaxe can't break this pile of rocks. We'll come back in summer with bombs. The rest of the day is spent hunting walnuts, and I finish off by doing a bunch of fishing, again looking for walnuts. And with that, it's time to turn in for spring of year two. It's a strange month where I feel like I didn't quite progress as much as I wanted to, but we have definitely laid down a solid foundation for the coming months, including all of those resources that we mined up. The next big farm egg expansion is definitely in the works, but you'll have to stay tuned for that. As always, at the start of any season, the first task is setting up our fields to be productive this month. Remember that crops that yield multiple harvests will leave stems in the ground between seasons that you can just scythe away, but those spots will still be watered. It definitely accelerates the first part of a season, taking away a lot of labor. I won't be going for blueberries again this year, though, instead using a desert totem to go visit Sandy. For the summer this year, I'm going to be growing as many starfruit seeds as I possibly can, but I always forget just how stinking expensive they are. 400,000 gold goes away pretty quickly when you're buying a bunch of these. I stopped in at Piers as well to buy some wheat seeds just to have some filler crop to put out. And I'm definitely more focused on social stuff at the moment, although it's still not a priority. As I mentioned before, I'm rich enough to just be giving out salads as gifts right now, which aren't ideal gifts, but hey, it's still friendship. It's definitely going to make maxing everything out later much easier. Also because it's Monday, I'm making sure to grab a new community board quest. And then it's back to the farm to fill out all of our prepared space with starfruit. The starfruit wine is gonna make us a lot of money. After unlocking Ginger Island, I made sure to donate the hardwood to get this large stump progress going. 
The raccoon has additional bundle-style quests that we have to complete for him. We won't see a ton of benefit from this right away, but later when we unlock more stuff from the shop, oh boy. I have some plans, let's just hope I can pull them off. As I gain social standing with all of the townspeople and complete more of these community board quests, we will be encountering more cutscenes. Like this one, where Gus is using the 24 eggs that we got for him to make a gigantic omelet. I will not be covering all of these cutscenes because again, I do encourage you to check these all out yourself. I'll likely only mention the ones that make me giggle. At the end of the day, I decided I felt a little bit poor after all of that spending selling some of that blackberry wine that I made. It's not that expensive, but hey, an extra 56k in the bank is nothing to complain about. With the fields now set, my attention can turn back to Ginger Island. Day two of summer, it's raining out here, so that enables me to get a couple of extra golden walnuts. There are journal scraps around the island that will reveal clues for certain puzzles, or hidden walnut locations. On rainy days, a mermaid appears after unlocking the resort. You can find note blocks and tune them, playing her a song for a handful of golden walnuts. I then spend a good chunk of the rest of the day fishing for that community board quest I got from Willy. Ginger Island has a couple of unique fish, and this all helps us towards our Master Angler achievement. With the farm and resort now unlocked, I feel like the next best thing to unlock with my walnuts is the Fast Travel Parrot Express. Now there's a handful of these fast travel options that are going to help us get around the island a lot more quickly. What can I say? Isn't efficiency really just planned laziness? The next day it's raining again on the island and the plan pretty much remains the same, just hunting down walnuts and fishing for that willy quest. After wrapping that up, it's back to the farm where I have a batch of strawberry wine ready to go. After that, I'm back at the mini forge trying to optimize our enchantments a little bit better. My first priority is the weapon. I want to get the artful enchantment. Artful reduces the cooldown of our special move on the hammer by 50%, aka the smash 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 that I love so much. That also stacks multiplicatively with our acrobat perk at level 10 combat for a total of a 75% cooldown reduction. Once I get that, it's time to start enchanting the tool, starting with the pickaxe where I'm looking for Swift. Swift is going to make our pickaxe swing 33% faster. I actually get fairly lucky here, getting Artful on my weapon and Swift on both my axe and pickaxe. I'm out of Cinder Shards though, so I'm gonna have to head back to the Ginger Island Mines to get more of those. And that's how I spend the next day, including getting more of these secret notes to reveal more walnut locations that I can hunt down. And that's where the rest of the day is spent, then going home at the end of the night trying to keep myself as organized as possible. For the next little while, the main priority is gonna be Ginger Island progression. I feel I got a little over sidetracked here on the Ginger Island progression instead of, say, setting up the Ginger Island farm, but hey, what are you gonna do? While I still have random chance walnuts to find in the mine, every morning I start off by coming up to the dig site to clear that out, looking for some skeletal fragments, and then I spend as much time as it takes to clear through the Ginger Island mine, grabbing as many cinder shards, dragon teeth from the lava creatures, and any other resources that I can find. After all, I'm gonna need all of them, especially these dragon teeth, but we'll get back to that a bit later. On the morning of day six, though, we experience our green rain day for this year. So, okay, plans change today. I'm just gonna be harvesting with my scythe all day. The moss is super and useful and all of that, but it's this fiber that I want so desperately. I don't even feel that I've really been using fiber as heavily as I could be, and I'm still pretty much perpetually out of it. And I do mean I spend the entire day doing this. I'm able to do it much more effectively this year as compared to last year, that's for sure. At the end of the day, I've cleared so much of the map, I'm actually hanging around Robin's cabin just looking for more fiber. Speaking of Robin, I have been visiting her regularly to continue upgrading my house. On the morning of day seven, I finally have the quote, final upgrade, end quote, which unlocks the cellar. The cellar also unlocks the ability to craft casks. Casks are going to allow us to age things like wine and cheese. Aging them increases the quality and therefore the sell price. Different items take different amounts of time. If you stick in a piece of gold quality cheese, for instance, that you got from a large milk, it will take seven days to age to an iridium quality cheese. That's on the quicker end compared to wine, where if you just put in basic wine, it takes 14 days to become silver, 14 days to become gold, and then 28 days to become iridium. The basement is the only place that you can place casks, and two months per batch is quite an order. Trust me when I say, though, once we have all of that set up, we are going to be making bank. 
There's, of course, the never-ending chores that I just don't show all of the time, like tending to the greenhouse every other day for our coffee. You can start to see on the edges and the front left corner that I am swapping crops out, though. I'm going to be using this greenhouse to expand our ancient seed production, which I finally have, as well as our sweet gem berry production. I'll get more into those later, but for now, I thought that you should at least know what I'm doing with the greenhouse. It's finally time to set up that ginger island farm, though, and thankfully, it's raining on the set seventh day again. That means all I have to do is hoe. I don't have to worry about watering this as well. Also, I still don't have enough battery packs, so I'm gonna be setting this up with quality sprinklers expanding to iridiums once I have the resources. Also, this field is gonna be a bit of a Frankenstein for the next little while. We can grow any crop from any season at any time on the island, and there are no crows. As such, I feel that Ginger Island, at least while we're establishing it, is the perfect time to knock off goals like polyculture, which is selling 15 of every crop. You'll also notice in the top right corner, I have a garlic, melon, and wheat growing. These are for the Gourmand Frog Quests, which will give us a total of 15 golden walnuts. The next morning, I want to get those casks working, so I tear down what's in the basement and start setting up my casks. Unless I'm mistaken, this should give us 124 casks. I don't have 124 of anything too exciting at the moment, so I fill them all with strawberry wine. I'm now a little bit stuck in waiting mode on Ginger Island, so I head back to the Stardew Valley mine to finish off a Monster Hunter objective. These skeletons and then the flame spirits on Ginger Island are the last two that I have to complete. Oh, make that just the flame spirits on Ginger Island. Now with that done, I want to prepare the quarry for my next big move. I clear out the entire quarry once again because I'm prepping for, you guessed it, more keg space. In all honesty, I could be putting a lot of this at the farm. I do have the space for it right now, but I really want to keep that open so that I can really work with the space and get a better idea of what I want the final farm layout to look like. The next day, it's back to Ginger Island targeting the same resources I have been all season and more walnuts. I must be getting close to getting all the walnuts in here, but I definitely still want the cinder shards to continue enchanting and forging my gear. Days 9 and 10 are actually fairly boring, just spending the entire time on Ginger Island and in the mines. That is, until I warp home at the end of day 10 and we have another batch of strawberry wine ready. It's definitely too late in the day to be dealing with this right now, and I want to be moving these kegs instead of just refilling them. That sounds like a tomorrow project. Which it is! After pulling all the strawberry wine out and starting to break down these kegs in preparation for the move, the little message pops up telling me that the luau has begun. Aw oh man, the one event that I care about this season. So I make sure to grab something from the chest that's gonna give me the maximum amount of friendship with all of the villagers at the luau and finish chopping down my kegs. It's a little bit unfortunate having the luau cut into the middle of my keg production, but I feel that the friendship is worth it. Also, I mentioned doing something funny this year, but we're gonna have to hold off a little bit longer longer. I'm still in make people like me mode. The luau ends up pretty much cancelling the majority of the day, but I still have enough time to get some of those kegs established. Then on the next morning, it's time to finish getting all of those kegs set up. Oh, and obviously working again. I want these kegs working. This is actually the first time I've ever used the quarry for kegs, and I gotta say, this vertical alignment, I'm really digging. I find that I miss a lot less kegs in this vertical alignment when I'm going up and down the line. With the kegs all set up, I fill them once again with strawberries, and I end up with a couple of kegs left over. First, though, I'm making sure to drop down an indicator keg that will be on the same routine as the kegs at the quarry. This way, I can see right when I walk out my front door if the quarry kegs are ready or not. My stock of coffee has been kind of dwindling lately, so I lay those last couple of kegs down at our farm just to process some coffee. With the materials that I've been gathering in the Ginger Island mine over the last few days, I now have plenty of cinder shards to continue enchanting my gear. I'm also going to be forging my hammer, which is unique to weapons. I add on an emerald for a little bit of additional speed, and two rubies for additional damage. I also enchant the hoe and watering can with the reaching enchant. This gives us one additional level while charging our tool, now being able to process a 5x5 five five area. It's all random, so it takes a few tries, but this is why I saved all of my prismatic shards. On the morning of day 13, it's back out to the desert to spend all of my money. Our starfruit seeds should be ready to harvest tomorrow, so I want to make sure that I have enough new seeds to plant right back down. Ugh, you know when you make millions and millions of gold and then you're still perpetually broke? It's gonna be a great feeling when we break past that threshold. 
The first crop of wheat is also done on Ginger Island, and the reason I chose wheat is that you're able to get five golden walnuts randomly from harvesting crops. That is exclusive to crops on the island, by the way. I then take those golden walnuts to go and unlock the island trader. They're not gonna have a huge amount for us, but there's a couple things that are nifty to have access to. Then, and I know it's a little difficult to see, I'm up at the tree farm for a little bit of progression. I've completed the prerequisites to now talk to this witchy tombstone flying thing to get it out of the way. This reveals a little tunnel in the northeast portion that's gonna lead us to the witch's hut. There's a henchman, orcish, bodyguard type dude that we have to get past, but I came prepared. This dude loves some void mayonnaise, so I just give him some and off he goes. Excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, I'm trying to get in your boss's house. I came in here for the magic ink for the wizard, but there are three statues that have different effects. One allows you to wipe the memory of your former spouses, if it comes to that. That costs 30,000 gold, by the way. The second one, for the cost of a prismatic shard, will turn any children that you have into doves and makes them fly away, which permanently removes moves them from the game. We're gonna see if children are any less annoying in 1.6, we'll find out. And the final one for the cost of a strange bun will lift the magic seal of protection from your farm, allowing monsters to appear on your farm at night. There also just happens to be a back door to the wizard's tower here, so I use it to turn in that magic ink right away. And then on the morning of day 14, our first star fruit crop is ready to harvest, so I do just that and replant it with, you guessed it, more star fruit. And I'm feeling like I need more kegs, so it's off to the tree farm to chop down the entire thing. I'm leaving the mystic trees up because they're too valuable to chop down, but everything else goes. I need wood. I end up with a pretty decent haul of lumber, so I'm hoping this is enough for our next keg expansion. The next day, it's back to the routine of just hunting for RNG drops on the island. The dig site is a staple of this because there's a bone that we can only get from panning in this river. That's a big reason why I upgraded the pan to iridium quality because eh, if it makes this easier, I'll take it. Probably one of the most dense places to get golden walnuts is the archaeologist tent. You find different bone items in different regions for different tasks. There are a couple that are a little tedious to get, but we will get them eventually. I just need to diligently come and check every day. On the Ginger Island farm now, our melon has finally grown up, so the three crops that I planted specifically for the Gorman Frog are ready to go. Do not harvest these. With them fully grown, you can just go into the cave and talk to the frog three times and he will give you 15 golden walnuts for growing one of each of his requests. Okay, now we can harvest them. It's time to expand our kegs a bit more and one of the more secluded areas is the bus tunnel. Let's not worry about the logistics of getting a bus through here because I'm filling it with kegs. First, I'm making sure to drop a battery pack into the little box in the wall. This is for a key quest, but then I once again fill up the entire area with kegs, loading them with wheat until they're ready to be synced up with the quarry kegs. The next day, I'm back at the tree farm replanting that entire thing. This time I'm placing 50 oak saplings along the first row. Those are gonna be tapped once again. Then I'm gonna be filling up the rest of the space with pine trees, which are pretty much just for cutting down. I might tap a couple for some pine tar, but I'm kind of eh about it. While I was in the area, I decided to check out those monster hunter goals and holy moly, all we need are five magma sprites. That's all I need for the protector of the valley goal. Well, that's gonna be easy to clean up on the island, but first on even non-rainy days on Jin Island after unlocking the resort, the pirates visit the cove. If you win at darts three times here, you get more golden walnuts, so yes please. Then once I knock that off, I spend the last few hours of the day back in the mines and boom, there it is. The last monster hunting goal is completed. And since the Adventurer's Guild is now open all the way till 2 a.m. in the 1.6 update, I just had to go look at it. Oh, would you just look at it? You know what they say about monster eradication goals, you know, you gotta look at them, you know, would you just look at it? Turning wheat into beer in the kegs is actually the most efficient gold per day that you can get out of the kegs. The downfall is that it's a lot more micromanagey, having to swap out these kegs every day until they sync up with my quarry kegs. It's then off to Cliffs to process a massive amount of geodes. I really want to finish this museum collection, but despite my best efforts, we won't be finishing that off today. 
Back on the island, I find myself with a small surplus of walnuts, so I decide to unlock the mailbox for five and the farm totem for 20? Yes, 20. I had to double check that. This allows us to warp directly back to the farm from Ginger Island. As I continue working towards my endgame goals, traveling around the world faster is definitely gonna help. Or I guess more accurately, I could say that more free access to the world is beneficial. Also, you might notice a gigantic egg sitting in my inventory. I managed to find myself an ostrich egg out here, and although I can't do anything with it yet, he he he. I never said anything about making a chicken egg empire. After collecting a total of 100 or more golden walnuts, you unlock the key room. This is gonna open up some seriously awesome endgame items. Just like the community board back in the valley, there is a new quest here available every Monday. They are definitely more challenging, but reward you with a new currency, key gems. You can then exchange those key gems for incredible things, like the horse flute that will summon the horse to our side instantly anywhere. Well, anywhere but the mines. There's also heavy tappers for more syrups, a key to the town to give access to all buildings any time of day. But the thing I'm pursuing first are the galaxy souls. I'm gonna need three of these to upgrade our galaxy hammer to the infinity gavel. And because the key quest that I chose was to collect and submit four prismatic shards, I'm back in the skull cavern mines. You may not believe me, but despite all of the mining that I've done so far, I'm actually pretty low on iron. The excitement continues because on the morning of day 19, our indicator keg is ready to go. So our primary objective today becomes swapping out all of our kegs to start producing starfruit wine. Strawberry wine is nifty and all, but starfruit wine is where it's at. I want this batch ready as soon as possible because I'm actually going to pull all of my strawberry wine out of my casks in order to put in the starfruit wine once it's ready. Then it's back out to Ginger Island to once again harvest up all the wheat and plant down more wheat. I definitely feel like I could have used this Ginger Island farm more effectively, but we'll see how it plays out in the long term. After all, last winter I did run out of things to put in the kegs, so it's nice to have backup, but still. I've spent a fair amount of time swapping out wheat fields, and gosh, there's just so much on my plate right now. Overnight, my lone cow steak gives birth to another baby, so I name it ABOMINATION! And I'll be selling it immediately the next morning. Hot, I don't want another mouth to feed right now. Then it's more adventures in the mine, and this time I'm definitely pushing to get down to level 100. I brought bombs, I brought staircases, and the reason I did this is for A, a quest, and B, the lower you get, the higher chance of iridium ore and prismatic shards. I make it to floor 100 where Mr. Key is waiting for us. He calls me dishonorable, but smart for using so many staircases to get down here. He praises my dedication nonetheless, and that's another quest knocked off. Our reward is a permanent increase of 25 to our health. That's gonna be helpful. And as fortune would have it, as I ready myself to go home at 1.30 in the morning, I have my four prismatic shards. The next morning, I'll show you a little bit of that greenhouse maintenance that I mentioned before. I acquired a couple of rare seeds from the traveling merchant over the last few months. They take 28 days to grow, and once they're ready, I process them through seed makers to make even more. It's the same principle as the ancient fruit seeds that I've been gathering, however, ancient fruits are a multi-harvest crops, whereas sweet gem berries are single. I hold onto one sweet gem berry, which I'll be using right away. You also might notice the treasure totems, we'll be playing with those today too. After dealing with that, I take that extra sweet gem berry that I saved down to the secret woods. If you give a sweet gem berry to the statue in the northwest corner, you'll be rewarded with a star drop. Yummy, yummy. That's gonna give us four out of seven total star drops. Then it's back to Ginger Island to turn in those prismatic shards. I can't really afford anything impactful with the key gems yet, so I'm just gonna hold on to them for now. And it's more of the same doing my loop of Ginger Island and coming back on day 22 to the tree farm. I did use tree fertilizer on it, which is why this batch grew so quickly. Tree fertilizer has definitely been my biggest sink of fiber so far, because I want kegs and I want casks. I then stopped by Robbins to build a couple of farm buildings. With the kegs now removed from my farm, I have this little bit of extra space and I want to start playing with the layout a little bit. This definitely feels like something I have to set and then just stare at for a while until the idea hits me. I'm actually buying the cabins that are meant for multiplayer. I won't reveal why quite yet, but I'll let that one stew in your brains for a while. The reason I didn't consider the basement upgrade as the final farmhouse upgrade is because we can continue to add rooms now. 
And it looks like in 1.6, even more rooms got added, like the attic and the cubby. These cost quite a bit of money, but rest assured that I will be getting all of them. Ugh, and I'll keep the crib around for now. I then process more geodes at Clint, just hoping and hoping to finish off this museum collection. Unless I'm mistaken, I have three items left to get. And my new community board quest for the week is hunting down bug meat in the mines. The community board quests are giving us some good unlocks as well as more friendship with the townspeople. Day 23, I replant the tree farm, but this time I don't have the fertilizer to do the entire thing. So I won't fertilize anything this time and save the fertilizer for better things. With all of this extra wood now, you bet your butts it's time for more kegs. I keep filling up areas in the world with kegs, but don't worry, the long-term plan is to make everything centralized back at the farm. My new key quest this week is called Danger in the Deep, and this one is super important. The Stardew Valley mines have been completely reset. Our goal is to make it down to floor 120 once again in the next week. But something's a little bit different. These are now the hard mode mines. There are different and more difficult enemies in these mines, and they also come with a new ore called radioactive ore. And you thought iridium was the end game ore, no way man. Well, I guess it is, but the radioactive ore allows us even more crafts, such as those heavy tappers that I mentioned from the key store. And oh boy, if you want to talk about inventory management, these mines have so many items. Now that I've unlocked these hard mode mines, I'm going to be spending a lot of time in them. Probably one of the most threatening things in these mines are these ghosts. Not the green ghosts themselves, but these little slimers are able to give us a debuff. That nauseated debuff prevents us from eating. Not being able to eat and recover health in the mines, especially the hard mode mines, doesn't feel good. I didn't exactly know what to do about this debuff, so I tucked tail and ran away from the mines once my health got pretty low. There's still like two minutes on the debuff as well, so I guess for the second time this playthrough, I'm gonna go to the spa to recover. It's not gonna help at all with the debuff itself, but at least we can get our health back and jump back into the mines while the debuff ticks down. Just to help progress through this mine as well, I've actually swapped out my parrot trinket for the basilisk paw. The Basilisk Paw makes you immune to debuffs, so that solves that problem for now. As a quick spoiler, during the fall season, I figure out that you can actually eat ginger to get rid of the nauseated debuff. Very cool. And the next couple of days are spent just questing down through the mines. The monsters in the hard mode mine also have a chance of dropping key gems, so I have been taking advantage of that. As you can tell though, these mines are not for the faint of heart. You should come prepared. On the evening of day 26, I make it down to floor 120, completing the quest. I feel that getting this quest as only our second key quest was so lucky. Finishing Danger in the Deep allows us to now toggle between the hard mode and regular Stardew mines. The hard mode mines are gonna be farmed very soon, especially in the floor 40 to 60 range where I can get all of this hardwood, mahogany saplings, and iron, which I very much need right now. The morning of day 27, we have our second starfruit harvest ready, and this time I won't be replanting anything because no crops grow in two days. This ends up working out beautifully because on the same morning, our batch of starfruit wine is ready. So after harvesting, I just take all of that freshly picked starfruit and pop it right into the kegs. I've also slightly expanded the kegs, also now taking over this section of the bus tunnel. No NPCs path through here, so I don't have to worry about the safety of my kegs. And speaking of starfruit wine, check it out, our basement is now full of silver quality strawberry wine, which compared to starfruit wine is kind of garbage, so I'm gonna be replacing all of this with starfruit wine. The way I saw it, I might as well have had these casks aging something, right? And there's nothing more exciting to report, finding ourselves on the final day of summer year two. The first order of business is heading up to the tree farm to get more of that mystic sap. Currently, the goal with the mystic sap is to turn it into the treasure totems. This is because I so desperately want to finish my museum collection. I have other plans for the mystic sap after this, but uh, you'll find out about those later. Then it's off to Clint's where I have a chest pop down outside so that I can really maximize my processing potential. I've actually been taking all of the omni geodes that I've been getting recently and exchanging them at the desert trader for artifact troves. I was mistaken earlier, by the way. After this batch, I only have three items left to find. Speaking of those treasure totems, let's go have a little bit of fun with them on the island. 
One of the last skeleton items that I need for the archaeologist comes from golden coconuts. I haven't had much luck finding them yet, but uh, these treasure totems are gonna help with that. Let it be known that I am fully aware that I am not using these totems to their full potential. There's definitely some overlap in the spots, but I really wanted to do a big hoe charge and hoe up a huge amount of them at once. Gosh, that is just so satisfying. I then take them to Clint for processing, getting the skull that I needed, as well as a banana sapling. Any banana saplings that I find are going straight to the greenhouse. I want bananas pronto. That skull is actually the last piece that I needed to finish off the archaeology tent, heading back there to turn it in. With the collection complete, the archaeologist rewards us with the recipe for an ostrich incubator. That ostrich egg that I mentioned earlier, we now have a use for it. I'm gonna have to leave you in suspense for that one though, because this season is over. I didn't make a ton of money directly, but you don't know what's in my chests right now. New season, same problems. As is tradition, the first couple of days in the season are geared towards getting our fields working for us. With all of my fancy new enchants on the gear, it's getting a lot easier to do this. Being able to hoe and water in the exact radius of my iridium sprinklers is pretty awesome. After prepping the top field, I grab a few items from the chest that I'm not letting you see. Yet. I head over to Pierre to sell my goodies, making a cool 600,000 gold. I won't spoil too much about my secret chest, but um, it's not empty. The plan for fall again this year is to go heavy on pumpkins, and I do mean heavy. 4,000 should be enough, right? I make sure to buy a few of every single one of his other available seeds because I want to start converting Ginger Island. That farm is primarily wheat at the moment, and I want to fill it with all of these crops that I have to grow in order to get the polyculture achievement and then convert it into a profit-making machine. The remainder of day one and start of day two are all geared towards filling in as many pumpkins as I can. I fill out all of my existing sprinklers, but I still have a lot of farm space, so it's time to expand this farm. I would have been capable of doing this before if it weren't for those darn battery packs. I keep expanding the field all the way till the end of day two, thinking to myself, you know what, I can fit a couple more sprinklers down here. I'm not going for maximum efficiency here, but hey, over half coverage on each of them is good enough. On the morning of day three, I decided it's time to enjoy this massive house of mine a little. I stroll on up to my attic space in order to enjoy some breakfast. You know when you first move into a place and you kind of have like one room half set up and the rest of the house is empty? That's kind of how I feel, barring the fact that I've lived here for like a year and a half at this point. Ah, uh, let's decorate a little bit. The bed can go here, the lamp can go here. Ugh. Say magnifique. I'm done for now. And now for a quick update on what's happening inside the greenhouse. Coffee is still the predominant crop in here, but as you can see on the first row, the ancient fruit is expanding. I will be converting this greenhouse to be fully ancient fruit, but for now it's also growing my rare seeds on the right side. I'm not entirely sure I want to switch over to these crops for making profit. Either way, amassing large amounts of these seeds isn't really possible without patience and seed makers. With the main farm pretty much buttoned up for the time being, it's time to head back out to Ginger Island. I'm making sure to grab as many varieties of seeds as I possibly can to start growing out there. On the way through town, I pick up a new community board quest, and Island Ingredients is available! This is probably one of the most exciting ones to me, and of course she's asking for the ginger option. The other two options are taro root and pineapple, both of which I have planted at the Ginger Island farm already. Just waiting on this quest, so of course she goes with the ginger option, which we have to find 100% manually. The first stop on Ginger Island is Keys Walnut Room to grab a new quest here, Skull Cavern Invasion, I'll take it. Then after a quick loop of the island looking for ginger, I decide to visit the trader really quickly. As I mentioned before, they've got a couple of things I want to buy, most notably the recipes at the bottom. Part of the perfection achievement is crafting and cooking every single recipe in the game, so I need these. I update my sticky note shopping list and move on. I then spend the rest of the day in Skull Cavern not going for the 100th floor, but more just going down with Monster Musk and having fun. Since I have started to put the bare minimum of effort into my social stuff, I am getting a lot more of these cutscenes. Unless something has changed, this is the only time you will ever see Alex's dog. Okay, he's real. I was starting to wonder. The two main ways of getting ginger are hoeing it up from the little wormy spots on the ground, or from killing the tiger slimes. 
There's a small cluster of them that spawn daily on the island, so I'll be farming these, looking for wormy spots, and spending my days in the Ginger Island mines looking for more ginger. And if you thought my Ginger Island farm looked a little messy before, check this out. The wheat's gone and I'm planting down a huge variety of seeds. They're all mixed in together, growing on different timelines. This island is gonna be a mess for a little while. The goal being polyculture, selling 15 of every single crop type. At the end of the day, I make sure to check my raccoon buddy to see if he has a new quest for me, and yes. The items for these bundles are randomized, so I can't really prepare for them and just kinda have to react and hope I have it. As you can see in my inventory though, the plan tomorrow is mining. With my bombs and staircases and rock candy, I unleash pandemonium down here. This level of insanity is all I wanted when I first made my way out to the desert. The Skull Cavern invasion requires getting down to level 100 in the mine, but sometimes there's floors like this that are just too awesome to pass up. Forget the resources I'm getting, this is just fun. Well, maybe a little too much fun. We're gonna take this one frame by frame. It looks like I managed to swing the hammer three frames late. At 60 FPS, that's 50 milliseconds late. So close, but maybe danger in the deep with Monster Musk was ill-advised. I saw it as just kind of taking my licks when I realized that fate might be pointing me in a different direction. Our starfruit kegs are ready to rotate and it's so cool, I'm actually rotating them as they complete. I managed to replace them all, but this is gonna be down to the wire making it to bed. Um, I'll drink a coffee for a little extra speed? Come on, come on, make it, make it. Nope. 14 tiles from home, eh, 20 from bed. Surprisingly enough, dying in the middle of the Skull Cavern invasion does not complete the quest. As it happens, I did get enough key gems from the monster loot though that I have enough to grab three galaxy souls. I head back home to forge them onto my hammer, and I have a problem. After getting the first one forged on, it looks like heading out to those ginger island mines is gonna be required for more than just ginger. I need cinder shards, which is exactly where I go next. Also, now after unlocking all of what I consider the important stuff on Ginger Island, I can finish the last couple of parrot unlocks. I smash my way through once again to the end of the mines, collecting as many cinder shards and ginger as I can along the way. By the end of it, I've got enough to finish forging our hammer, so let's finish this upgrade. For a total cost of three galaxy souls and 60 cinder shards, I now have the infinity gavel. Tja, my hammer's about as uber as it can go now. Awesome. The morning of Sunday, the 7th of fall, presents an opportunity to finish that Skull Cavern invasion. The quest resets on Monday, tomorrow, so I'm gonna have to get this done today. As I mentioned in previous seasons though, the Desert Merchant on Sundays alone will trade Jade for Staircases. My Crystallariums have been pumping Jade since I got them. I buy 96 staircases and let's get this done. With what I bought combined with what I brought, I have just enough staircases to get me down past level 100. So it's a little cheesy, but zip, zip, zip. And before I know it, I'm hitting floor 100, completing the quest. I didn't exclusively use ladders on the way down, popping out anytime I thought a floor felt interesting. Remember, as you get lower into Skull Cavern, you have a higher chance of finding Iridium. Now in the hard mode version, that also applies to radioactive ore, which I do want some of. I take the rest of the day in the mine getting down to the 160s before heading home. And the next day, the focus shifts once again to getting ginger and cinder shards. Yes, I do still want cinder shards, I'm not done with them yet. After running that to completion, it's once again off to Key's Walnut Room to choose another quest. Um, no, you've already taken four of my prismatic shards. You don't get any more. Danger in the deep. Now that I have the galaxy souls, I want to try and plan out my next key purchases. I decide to buy the recipe for the heavy tapper, part of the reason why I want radioactive ore, and I don't have enough gems to get the horse flute, but I really want the horse flute. I want to take a quick moment to thank you in the comment section for giving me tips. Since I maxed out my skills, I've been just trashing all of these books, but they're really useful. You can actually sell them back to the bookkeeper for really good items, actually. Thank you so much for helping me become a better player. I'll also show off the farm computer really quickly. It gives a quick and dirty little readout of what's going on at your farm. As you can see here, I've only got 137 pieces of hay in the silos, so let's go correct that real quick. The next morning, it's off to the tree farm with a few of those heavy tappers in hand. 
I want to throw the heavy tappers on these mystic trees that I've slowly been accumulating more of. I want more treasure totems to try and finish off the museum, but after that, I have a different plan for the syrup. Your hint is that it involves the raccoon. And then the quest for ginger continues. My ginger loop is coming in from the beach, walking up to the dig site, then taking the fast transport back to the farm. I follow the loop left, killing the slimes and looking for more wormy spots. The reason I'm choosing to emphasize this is because the ginger quest is legitimately annoying to me. Maybe, just maybe, my methods can help you get through it should you find yourself needing to. Instead of heading to the Ginger Island mine though, I'm heading back to the Stardew Valley mine to restart Danger in the Deep once again. Hi ho. Hi ho. I'll give you a quick peek inside my production chest. Anything that needs to get processed ends up in this chest. I'm also using it to collect items for Clint to process, as well as the items for my theater bundle. That is all greenhouse coffee, by the way. When I say I go in there every other day, I do mean it. And then it's a whole bunch of time spent in the mines continuing danger in the deep. Floors 40 through around 60 are by far my favorites, especially when you have the napalm ring and monster musk on. Another thing to note is that now that I'm done investing battery packs into repairing the ginger island boat and my iridium sprinklers, I'm able to invest them now in more crystallariums. More crystallariums, more jade, more staircases, more better. The next day, I continue pushing hard in the mines, making it almost all the way down. Floor 110 by 130 in the morning. All right, I'll finish it in the morning. No matter how much that ready starfruit keg tempts me, I need to focus, focus, man. It only takes me till nine in the morning to get down to floor 119 and oh, there's the ladder right there. Quest done and I wanna go play with some kegs. The keen-eyed among you will notice that I was out of starfruit though, and I don't really feel like putting strawberries back in. I did have an excessive amount of coffee beans though, so that's what I'm putting in. The thing with coffee though is that it processes so quickly in the kegs that I can actually just continuously move around this area. It takes me longer to empty and replace the kegs than it does for the kegs to brew the coffee. And regardless of the monotony or tedium of doing it, I'm gonna process all all of that coffee. And I just keep at it all the way through until the next afternoon. When that glorious requires five beans message pops up for the final time, oh, that's good. I had originally planned to start refilling the kegs with wheat for more beer, but after that much kegging, yeah, let's do strawberries. Seven days away from these kegs instead of coming back tomorrow sounds A-OK -okay by me. I mean, I do still have coffee rolling in, but I'm hoping that I do not need to process any more for the rest of the playthrough. If all of that wasn't exciting enough, we have our pumpkins ready on the morning of day 14. Heck yeah, I'm gonna ignore those till tomorrow. Pumpkins only take 13 days to grow, so I have a little bit of leeway and would rather have the fields matched up. It's then off to Clint's for the umpteenth time, processing geodes and hoping to finish off that museum. Not today, so I head back out to Ginger Island to trade in those key gems I just got. I buy my horse whistle, thank you very much, and I have enough gems left over to buy something else. I feel the next most important item here, especially since I have social goals on my mind, is the key to the town. That's going to give me access to any building, any room, any time. For context, the businesses are only open during certain hours of the day, and you have to be a certain friendship level to get into people's bedrooms. That came out creepier than I intended. The horse whistle allows us to summon our horse to us anywhere. Well, anywhere outdoors. So I take my pony on a quick little scoot down the beach and we're gonna be playing with some more treasure totems. Once again, super not optimal, but super fun. Let the hoeing carnage begin. Oh, so satisfying. The next step is then to start chopping down our Franken crop. Are you noticing something I did wrong though? I need 15 of every crop, not eight. With the power of hindsight, I definitely could have done this better, going for less wheat and more polyculture insanity. We'll get there in the end. Something else I haven't mentioned is that I've changed my outfit a little bit. The gold shirt is, yeah, pretty and all, but you can actually wear your pan on top of your head. Let me just take a moment to express how the pan is now viable in my mind. I feel it used to be dead inventory weight before, but now that it can be upgraded, enchanted, and worn on my head, sold. And I never thought I would say that about the pan. And one final thing at the end of day 14. 
Along with the crops that I'm shipping for our polyculture, I wanted some new toys. Toys require money, so I decided to sell my first stack of starfruit wine. High million gold richer and feeling good. The next morning, the rest of the field has caught up, so it's time to harvest and replant our pumpkins. It's looking like the home farm field is producing somewhere around 1,500 crops for us now. I pop all of those into the production chest, which is looking a lot nicer with all that coffee gone. I then start an equal parts tedious and equal parts satisfying process. I'm going through all of my chests, making sure to sell one of every single item. That's going to help us towards another perfection goal of shipping one of every item. Now that I have the money, I'm definitely looking for more free access to the world. I head down to the wizard's tower because he can build us some pretty awesome buildings. For the cost of 1 million gold, 20 iridium bars, 10 coconuts, and 10 cactus fruit, I can build the Desert Obelisk. This is a static building on your farm, which acts exactly like the warp totems do. Except this one is infinite. That hodgepodge of items ends up netting us another 23,000 gold. Not bad, honestly. The next morning, our greenhouse's banana trees have started producing, so I'm gonna take a single banana with me out to Ginger Island. I make it down to Willy's, and that's when it hits me that today is a festival. On festival days, key to the town or not, you're not getting in. So, fine. I head back to the farm and craft an island warp totem. I want that island obelisk, but I need 10 bananas, and right now I have one. Actually, make that zero, but this is my second last task to finish off all of the golden walnuts on Ginger Island. All I have left is the questline from Birdie to get the pirate's locket. I then spend the rest of the day hunting down Ginger. By the end of this pass through the mines, let's check out how our progress is going. Out of 100 required Ginger pieces, I have harvested 69. Nice. You'll notice the strange little blue beans in my inventory. These are for key crops for another key quest. It rewards the most key gems out of any of the quests, but I feel it's the most difficult to pull off. I wasn't actually sure if I'd be able to complete the quest, but I wanted to do anything that wasn't mining. The pickled eggplant is for the raccoon, by the way. Pickled eggplant and cave carrot juice were his requirements this week. Strange, but fulfillable. The next morning, I'm off to the desert to spend even more money. It'll probably be a couple of weeks before I actually get these in the ground, but I'm buying 2,000 starfruit seeds. Gee, I wonder what Ginger Island is going to be converting to, eh? I make it back to the valley and go visit Robin to spend even more money. I buy out all of the remaining upgrades, so this house is now as big square footage-wise, or square tileage-wise, as it can possibly be. What am I going to fill all that space with? I don't know. We'll figure that out later. Any time lately that I see a townsperson, I'm giving them a salad and a chin waggle. These little convenient chat and gift sessions are definitely going to make my life easier once I commit to getting the town to like me. Every single villager, every single time, up to their maximum gifts per week. On my usual ginger loop today, I decided to pop inside of the mushroom cave. I haven't had a lot of motivation to come in here, especially because my foraging skills are more aimed at woodcutting at the moment, but hey, this guy's new. Some more new things in 1.6 is that not only can you use Joja to pay for the community center, but apparently you can pay for walnuts and perfection points. Biz here seems to special in legally complex matters if you catch his drift. I have words for him that I'm not including in the video. But if you're swimming in cash, supporting Joja, and after a perfection goal, this guy seems to be your ticket. 500,000 gold per percentage of perfection. I'm gonna pass, but let me know in the comments section if you'd like to see a Joja-style playthrough in the future. This house is so stinking big right now. I felt bad about how empty it was, so here's a couple of random items I got from those treasure totems. Oh, wow, look at this place. It's really starting to fill out. The next day, the tappers are ready up at the tree farm, and yes, once again, I have been doing this every cycle. As you can see, without the speed grow on the trees, it grows pretty inconsistently, but most of these trees are growing up. I'll be looking to cut them down and replace them with maple soon enough. I'll once again leave you in suspense as to why. And it's more hunting for ginger. I always appreciate when I find little clusters like this. Another tip for the ginger quest is that any tiles that you hoe, make sure to pickaxe them to revert them to the normal terrain. This will keep ginger spawning more frequently on those tiles. 
And this was the moment that I realized the difference between 15 and 8. I fill in Frankenfield 2.0 and I'm really looking forward to when I can take this field into its final form. I felt that I could try going after that key quest given how fluid the Ginger Island field is right now, but yeah, I'm not convinced. By the end of day 18 though, I've realized that I'm running out of things to do that aren't social. It's time to start pulling out and getting gifts ready. With those rabbit feet being universally loved by every character except for Penny, she gets diamonds. On the morning of day 19, let's check our ginger progress. 96 out of 100, with 17 shipped. Well, I have a solution for that right quick. I grab half the stack and, well, hey, that's 83. That's how much I needed. I didn't trust it being that easy, so I double-check the quest and, yeah, we're good. That gets shipped overnight and we should be able to get our last four pieces of ginger today. Another nifty bit of rotating stock is in Krobus's shop. Every single Friday, he will have one iridium sprinkler for sale for 10,000 gold. I have not been diligently grabbing these, though I have every time it's been convenient. There are two things that I typically wait for before decorating my farm. Outside, I'm waiting on the golden clock, we'll come back to that, but inside we have these furniture catalogs. These did exist before, but 1.6 has added so much furniture. I want to collect as many of these catalogs as I possibly can before going hard on decorating. Another, another thing to set up for is cooking every recipe. There are a few items that I find a little bit more tedious to get my hands on, so I crafted 33 crab pots to bring to the beach. I also changed my fishing profession to not requiring bait in crab pots because yes, I am that lazy. Day 19 was very much an all over the place, nailing off objectives kind of day. I have a quest to bring Maypal Serop to the Sea Crit Woods. The educational system for bears seems to have really declined since the days of the Berenstein Bears. Understandably, I'm a little bit wary of the speaking and writing bear. I don't recall casting speak with animals on myself. But in exchange for maple syrup, our new bear friend gives us a new power. Salmon berries and blackberries are now going to be worth three times the gold. How relevant is that going to be in this playthrough? Well, probably not at all, to be honest. The completionist in me needed it. If ever you're looking for a dense cluster of townsfolk, always go to the saloon on Friday nights. Just like the bear in the woods, I've been knocking off as many of my quests as I can. This last little batch should about do it. My community board quest this week is fishing up trash for Linus. I figured a clever place to do this would be fishing in the mines. I have to fish up and dispose of 20 pieces of trash, and it's pretty common in the mines. On the morning of day 20, I organize myself, grabbing all of the pumpkins that I need to rotate the kegs, as well as the materials I need for another toy. I visit the wizard's tower, and this time for 1 million gold, 10 iridium bars, 10 dragon teeth, and 10 bananas, I can get the island obelisk. Yes, please. Every single time I make an island warp totem, it costs a dragon tooth, which are not the most common items. Won't be needing to do that anymore. But before I play with my new toy, I go and I swap over all of the kegs to produce pumpkin juice. Completing the island ingredients quest, the ginger one that I just slaved over, we unlock the solar panel recipe. Every seven sunny days that the solar panel C nets us one more battery pack. I love passive resources. Like I mentioned, I am hurting on a couple of resources, only being able to craft four for now. I then empty out the crab pots, the lobster and shrimp being the most important things that I'm after. Then it's off to Ginger Island to pop down the cellar panels on this beautiful sunny day and continue with our polyculture goals. I wouldn't say that I'm close yet, but definitely getting there. Back in town, the saloon is hopping on Saturday nights as well, just with slightly less people. I take a quick scroll through my relationships real quick, and these are the results of salads and quests. That's a great head start on the socializing. Another habit that I mentioned early and haven't really mentioned again is making sure to check the TV on every single Sunday. There's a new Queen of Sauce recipe every Sunday, and even this far into the game, I'm still learning new recipes. I'm also making sure to check the Wednesday reruns just to be diligent, but I'm not sure it's necessary. On top of those new recipes trickling in, all of the work I've been doing with friendship has also been granting a ton. 
feel free to verify this because I ran out of fingers as I was counting, but I believe there are 35 out of 81 recipes that are exclusively available from Friendship. And once again, pursuing perfection requires all of these. Exciting news on the 21st of fall, year two, I am turning in the quest to Birdie and these are my last golden walnuts. For completing her quest, we also get the recipe for Fairy Dust. Fairy Dust allows you to advance any machine by one stage instantly. For example, the wine in our cellar right now is taking 56 days to go through three stages of aging. With three Fairy Dust per bottle of wine, I can now convert it from base quality to iridium quality instantly. Or, you know, as long as it takes me to click three times. It also works on things like furnaces, completing the smelting instantly, but those things I can wait for. 56 days for iridium wine is a long wait. I'll take a quick moment to show you the perfection tracker in Key's Walnut Room. As you can see, 130 out of 130 golden walnuts. Awesome possum. You can also see my progress towards the other perfection goals with a total completion so far of 46%. Not bad, and now that we're done with golden walnuts, that's one less thing to worry about. It's Sunday, so I take my now 198 jade out to the desert to exchange for staircases. The rest of the day, and honestly quite a bit of time in the next few days, is going to be spent mucking about in the hard mode mines. I need the ores, and the monster musk in combination with the parrot is giving me a steady stream of thousands of gold. I've also now figured out that eating ginger gets rid of the nauseated debuff, so I'm cruising. The next morning, I'm processing the key fruits that I harvested through the seed makers, trying to expand the crop to the 500 that I need. This is the last time I'll be mentioning this key quest because I will fail it. This and a bunch of extra effort goes to complete waste. I also decided on day 22 to check and see if I had everything that I needed for the missing bundle. That's the movie theater bundle I keep mentioning and not realizing that you don't know it's a movie theater yet. My bad. After coming up with a plan for those, it's back to the mines. That's gonna be another 5,000 gold in like 25 seconds of footage. The entirety of day 23 is spent in the mines and on day 24, eehoo. This Ginger Island farm is a mess. You can see me just kind of stopping and thinking for a moment. I was doing mental math. I have figured out that the number of seeds that I have planted and growing right now, though I would be able to get one more crop out of it, will fall well short of the 500. I know I said I wouldn't mention it again, but you know, this was the moment of defeat. And yeah, like, I'm out of here. I don't need to harvest this right now. Then it's off to cleanse to mass process geodes, golden coconuts, mystery boxes, everything. Again, in hindsight, I should have waited until after the key quest expired because I'm getting more beans from this. That is just wasted loot table as far as I'm concerned. On day 24, the next batch of pumpkin juice is also going into the kegs. And it's back to my favorite floors in the mine. As a fun little creator's note, I'm actually getting really good at recognizing the sound waveform of harvesting kegs versus mining. You know you spend too many hours staring at your own footage when. The next morning is a lovely little tree farm update as I'm grabbing the tappers again. It's definitely getting close. Then it's off to Ginger Island to deal with this mess a little. Pretty much everything that I'm harvesting is just getting dumped straight into the shipping box, except for the beets. I have to stick 10 beets in the mare's fridge as part of another quest, so I'm keeping some of those. Then my raccoon friend needs a smoked ghost fish, so I'm down in the Stardew Valley mines trying to get one of those. Ah, man, these darn key beans, go away! A large portion of the day is spent doing a lot of maintenance and pursuing little things like that, and at the end of the day I'm able to set up a whole bunch more solar panels. Battery packs are something that I'm not able to buy en masse, so I feel it's very much worth spending the iron on these right now. And I know it's shocking, but more time in the mines. Can I just point out that a few days ago I mentioned the parrot and we've made a hundred thousand gold since then. Oh yeah, this little cluster right here, 8,250 gold? No problem. Another awesome thing that I've been collecting down here as part of the monster loot table are these sprinkler nozzles. We'll see more of those when I'm ready to convert Ginger Island into its final form. The next morning I realized that I didn't get a new key quest this week, so hopefully there's one I can nail off in like two days. Looks like I have nine days to complete the key cuisine, which is a really awesome one. For this quest, you have to ship 100,000 gold worth of fresh cooked food. This might seem a little bit daunting, but I have a lot of coffee. 
three coffees can be cooked into one triple espresso shot, which I've been doing anyway because the buff is so much more convenient to manage. The number of triple espresso shots that you need to cook is 223, and I go a little bit over, but it's fine because I'll just drink the rest. If you don't have the coffee, you can buy 669 from Gus's shop. If you have the money to spend, this is one of the easiest key quests to complete. More money. And Uda Lolly, on the morning of day 28, our pumpkin harvest is ready, and I have quite a few of the big boys. That's hopefully gonna keep our kegs busy until I'm ready to convert Ginger Island. Glorious timing. More pumpkins become more pumpkin juice. After the harvest and rotating all of the kegs, I'm up at the tree farm because I have more mystic syrup and more mystic trees grown ripe for tappers. Heavy tappers. And my last hurrah on the final day of fall year two is dealing with this Ginger Island farm again. Embrace the chaos and fill in all the blank spots with wheat. Also, I'm not sure if I've shown my ostrich all grown up yet. Aw, oh, good day, mate. Say hi, Malta. The real reason I'm in here is to grab the now processed dino mayonnaise for the theater slash missing bundle. But that's gonna be a wrap for the fall of year two. Taking another quick gander at how the farm's doing, our total earnings are just over 8 million gold now, with 843k in hand. My efforts doing key quests and in the mines have provided another 96 key gems. And our social standings are actually pretty decent considering all I've done is convenience conversations and salads. Those who are well versed in this game will notice that even though I have 130 golden walnuts, somebody's missing from this tab. I'll figure that one out next month. Our powers are definitely filling out, only needing three more and knowledge from one more book, which is crab pots. Taking a look at our logs real quick, our shipping and fishing is definitely filling out more, but we have some work to do. It's when I get to the artifacts and minerals tab that, yeah, I'm still looking for those same three items. I will find them eventually. The cooking tab is looking not so filled out, but the good news is, is that I do know most of these recipes. I just need the ingredients and to actually cook them. The achievements as well are filling out quite nicely. Looks like we've got about half to go. I've gotten a lot done, but there's still work to do. I start the day with a quick pop down into the cellar to check out how our wine aging is going. All gold quality, it's looking good. Unfortunately, the path from gold to iridium is the longest for wine, taking 28 days. I'll also make a quick note about my kitchen. I've been running around with a double speed buff from coffee and food pretty much since year one. That's largely in part because of the crab cakes and spicy eel that I was finding in the Skull Caverns when mining. Since I haven't been doing nearly as much of that lately, I've actually been using pepper poppers and coffee. I don't really care what the secondary buff is, I just want to cruise around the map faster. The greenhouse is coming along nicely, our trees are filling out, and our ancient fruit crop is getting bigger, our rare seed crop is getting bigger, and most exciting to me, the coffee crop is getting smaller. With the amount of time I have for idle thought while harvesting kegs, I think I will be incorporating these into my money-making strategy. You'll have to find out more about that later. Next on Ginger Island, I'm picking up a new key quest. I took a moment to hum and haw about this. Extended Family is a quest that I'm going to want to complete at some point, but I'm not feeling fishing at the moment. I end up going with Key's Prismatic Grange, needing 100 of each color of item. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. At the moment, it's easier for me to complete and rewards more gems. While I'm here, I decide to spend a few more of those key gems. I buy the recipe for Magic Bait. Then I pick up Pierre's missing stock list. And although there's still plenty in this shop that I want, I'm not going to be frivolous with these key gems quite yet. Back in town, I want to give Pierre his stock list, but oh, hi, Maru. Yep, you get a salad. Entering Pierre's, I activate another cutscene, and this one's fun. I have no idea what motivated my character to be rummaging through Pierre's bedroom bookcase, but we find his secret stash. We get a player choice, either telling Pierre that his secret is safe with me or that his wife deserves to know. I would definitely say that when you're in a partnership, your partner needs to know what's happening with you. But this is a video game, and I enjoy sowing a little chaos. Not to mention when that cutscene is over, I trigger a second cutscene in the same building with Pierre's wife, Carolyn. She doesn't have a secret stash, she has an entire little extra room behind the kitchen. This is actually a friendship event, which will unlock another recipe for us. Carolyn's secret indulgence, it seems, is this tea. I mean, it's pretty twinkly, but it's when the little absinthe fairy from Eurotrip shows up that I start having questions. Whoa, man, what's in this tea? 
The funny thing is that all of this triggered after giving Pierre his stock list. I guess we just weren't good enough friends five seconds ago. Usually, you are not able to buy seeds that are out of season. Out of season seeds are now available all the time, but they do cost 50% more gold while they're out of season. Then I start wrangling together supplies for the key quest. I wasn't in love with my blue item options, so I'm at the saloon manually buying 100 Joja Colas. I don't regret choosing this quest at all. The items I chose because I had so many of them were 100 Void Essence for purple, strawberries for red, sap for yellow, salad for green, the Joja Cola for blue, and the dye guide online said that coffee would work for orange, but no dice. I was gonna use some pumpkins, but that felt like a terrible idea, so the next morning I bought some ore from Clint. Copper ore will count for our orange item. All right, nailed it, what's next? My community board quest for the week involves collecting bone fragments, so I'm down harvesting skeletons with Monster Musk. It's nice to do this with a purpose now and then, not always just for fun. My rabbits in the coop have actually been providing a huge amount of wool. I'm so confused as to why I would ever want a sheep. But another big processing task that I'm taking on is going through all of that wool, processing it into cloth. Just add it to the list of chores until the several hundred go away. Then I decided to start chasing down some of these secret note clues. Funny enough, some of those items that I need from the museum I can get by solving these clues. I start off in the desert getting these strange doll and check out what the pan on my head allows me to do. Ooh, a little pan spot in the pond. I'll just pond this up quick and holy moly. Yep, that was worth it. I've also stopped converting all of my Omni Geodes into artifact troves. One of those last items that I need is Lunarite, and it can only come from Omni Geodes and Frozen Geodes. And with a few hundred Omni Geodes sitting in the box, I'm gonna be here a minute. I'm holding on to what I feel is important and then just selling everything back to Clint. I find my Lunarite, and that is the last item being donated to the museum. I check my rewards, and again, I will come back to claim all of these once I start decorating the house, but I want that star drop. That's gonna be star drop five out of seven. We need to catch all of the fish and woo somebody. Originally, I was gonna get Krobus as a roommate, but then I found out that you can't adopt kids with Krobus. As much as I don't want them, I'm gonna need them. As far as our polyculture and Frankenfield at Ginger Island are going, progress is being made, but there's still a little bit to go. The rest of the day is then spent in the mines. The mines just kind of feel like a universally good thing to be doing with downtime. The next morning I'm up at the tree farm collecting more resin for probably more kegs, and ooh, I do something so different today. I come to swap over the quarry kegs from the west side instead of coming via the minecart. Just shaking it up, you know, keeping it interesting. Then I start gearing up for a fishing adventure, including grabbing some of that magic bait. Magic bait allows you to catch fish from out of season regardless of weather. Given it's the dead of winter, that's probably gonna be helpful. The first one that I go after is actually another legendary fish. In winter, fishing off of the southern point of this little island in Cinderstap Forest, we can find the Glacier Fish. This should be the last legendary fish that I have to catch. It's a bit of a struggle, but I get him in the end. Then, one of the trickier fish to get your hands on is actually the Gobi. You have to fish down into the lower section of the waterfall pool. I have not mentioned to this point that you can actually change the direction of your cast a little bit. If you hold down the directional button as you cast, you can send your lure to the left or right instead of straight out in front of you. You kinda have to do that to catch this goby. Next I go after the Dorado, and I don't feel the need to show you all of these. I'm just looking at my log, figuring out what I'm missing, and then figuring out where I can find it. As I said with the magic bait, season and weather are irrelevant. And of course I can't forget to mention our little raccoon friend. As you continue to help the raccoon family, the shop will expand, and today is the most exciting part. This is the sixth bundle that I'm completing for them, and I get rewarded with fairy dust. Not only that, but the trade is now available in the raccoon's shop for one fairy dust for one mystic syrup. Can you see where I'm going with this now? Also, as I come up to harvest even more of said mystic syrup, I will note that I have tapped a bunch of these pine trees. I don't have a huge amount of use for pine tar, but I figured while I was waiting for all of the trees to grow up, I might as well be collecting something from them. I'm glad that I got to mention this, but this is the last we see of the pine trees. Like Saruman says, I ripped them all down. 
I will be replacing these with maple trees, but again, secret secret. I then track down more fish catches going after the void salmon in the witch's swamp. A second reason that this fish is exciting is that it's required for the theater bundle. Another nifty thing that I've crafted lately is the farm obelisk. If you craft two and place them at different locations on your farm, you can instantly warp between them. Why would I walk all the way to the animals when I can just... Pachoo! This might just be my opinion, but easily one of the most exciting things that I get to talk about is finally ripping down Frankenfarm. I'm so excited by this that I'm even ignoring that cluster of battery packs at the top of the screen. And I think at this point you're aware of how much I want battery packs. I left only the green beans behind because they should be the last thing we need for polyculture. Now I start laying out the field with not only iridium sprinklers, but pressure nozzled iridium sprinklers. There are two upgrades to these sprinklers. One, the pressure nozzle, which I'm using, expands the radius to a 7x7 instead of a 5x5. The other one is the enricher, which when supplied with fertilizer will automatically apply it within the radius of the sprinkler. I wanted to get as much out of this field as I could, going with the pressure nozzle for less sprinklers. I take a bit of extra time with the layout, just making sure that I will never have to touch this again. I run out of time on day 7, but I'll be back tomorrow. First though, after realizing that I only needed 5 of the 6 items for the theater bundle, let's turn that in. 1 dinosaur mayonnaise, 1 prismatic shard, 1 gold quality void salmon, 1 silver quality wine, and 5 gold quality ancient fruit. This triggers an adorable cutscene with this little fella. All the others made it back, except for him. And he can go home now. Goodbye, little fella. We're left with the message that something will happen soon. Alright, it's time to finish off the Ginger Island conversion. I do have to redo a little bit of the work, like the hoeing that I did yesterday, but it doesn't matter to me. If this conversion takes the whole day, that's what it takes. I fill out and water all of the spots that currently have sprinkler coverage with, you guessed it, starfruit. Then I head down to the bottom row just to eke out a little bit more usable space. Down here though, I'm only using iridium sprinklers and even quality sprinklers, just cause there's no need for anything more fancy down here. And I repeat the process on the west edge. You'll notice across the water, there is a little bit of additional farm space that I have been growing things in. I want that to be more opportunistic farming as opposed to being part of the main field. Key's cuisine looks good enough for me again this week, and overnight we get the cutscene of the movie theater being repaired. Now we don't have to look at that horrible abandoned Jojo warehouse anymore. On the morning of day 9, let's go check out the fruits of our labor. It's beautiful. Once I decide which of the townsfolk I would like to court, I will have to bring them on a date here. There is a friendship event with Abigail where you get to play Journey of the Prairie King. You may have noticed the arcade machines in the saloon, and there are a couple of little mini-games on them. In this friend event, you actually play with Abigail cooperatively. This is the only Journey of the Prairie King that you will be seeing in this video because I don't like it. Despite the completionist in me, getting a deathless run of Journey of the Prairie King is not something that I have any interest in. Years ago, I did spend a couple of weeks trying to get this achievement, and that's when I decided, nah, we have even more keg rotating. And then I try my darndest, despite how dark it is, to try and get all of the spots in Ginger Island covered with speed grow. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but I only miss three out of like, eh, somewhere around 800. With all of that behind us on the morning of day 10, I'm back to tracking down fish. And even more fish! Magic bait is pretty awesome. I catch a midnight carp followed by a rainbow trout in the early afternoon while it's snowing in the middle of winter. Have I mentioned just how much fun the endgame progression is? The next morning, I am officially out of excuses. It's time to start wrangling up a bunch of items to use for gifts for the villagers. They all like, dislike, and love different things, but there are quite a few overlaps, as well as a couple items that are universally disliked or universally loved with a couple of exceptions. Rabbit's feet are a great example, being loved by every character except for Penny. Obviously, the more the person likes the gift, the more friendship you gain, as well as if you give them a higher quality item, you will get even more friendship points. Thank goodness for time pausing in single player, because I did spend quite a bit of time referencing the wiki, trying to find the best gifts that wouldn't completely overwhelm my inventory. Diamonds for Evelyn, Gus, Jody and Marnie, Krobus and Maru, Penny and Willy. Oh, wait, actually, no diamonds for Maru, I have gold quality strawberries. Duck feathers go to Elliot and that missing 
person I mentioned before that I still haven't realized. Deep breath. Pink cake for Jazz and Vincent, pumpkins for Abigail and Willie, coconut for Haley and Linus, coffee for Harvey, emerald for the dwarf Emily and Clint, beer for Shane and Pam, peaches for Robin, void essence for the wizard, strawberry for Demetrius and Maru, cactus fruit for Sam, leeks for George, salad for Leah, and crocus or daffodils for Sandy off in the desert. I also discovered that making pumpkin soup was fairly straightforward, so those go to Sebastian. Anybody not mentioned on that list gets a rabbit's foot. You can only give a townsperson two gifts per week, so two days per week I'm gonna be doing social stuff. Trust me though, the introvert in me just wants to go back to hiding at the farm. While visiting Sandy in the desert, I pop into the back room, which is Key's Casino. It's another super laborious process, but I decided just to buy all of my key coins. There's some pretty cool stuff at the shop, but the one thing that I absolutely need is the Rare Crow. After purchasing this one, I only have one more left to grab. And the next day is spent once again handing out gifts. Come on, Haley, it's 9, 10 in the morning. Get out of bed. Here's a coconut. Passing out gifts and tracking down villagers is pretty much an all-day thing sometimes. But I just had to take a moment to come and appreciate the Ginger Island Farm. Also, you can see that tiny little bush in the top corner. That's the bush that gives us the ingredients for Carolyn's tea. I have to sell both the tea leaf itself and the brewed tea. So I guess you could call that getting two birds stoned at once. At the end of the day, with the socializing complete, excuse me for a moment while I go blow stuff up. The kegs were just recently rotated, the socializing is done, Ginger Island is growing. Well heck, I guess I'll be a part of Squid Fest this year, let's check this out. I decided to pretty much spend the entire day here trying to catch squids. At the end of the day, I've managed to catch 10, which is actually gonna net us some pretty nifty things, including that final book that I needed. Crab pots for dummies or something, who cares? That's my last book and I got it done. The week resets on Sundays for gift giving, so on the 14th, I'm back out doing my social loops. Ah, shoot, but I don't have any of my gifts with me right now. For organization's sake, I have been keeping all of these items that I set aside for gifts in a separate chest on the side of the farm. That way, anytime I have to go do some socializing, I just pull everything into my inventory and off I go. After the first round of gifts, I made a decision that I wanted some more toys. I'm rounding up a few items that may look pretty random, but there's also a few stacks of pumpkin juice in my inventory. I sell all of the pumpkin juice for just over 3 million gold, also triggering the legend achievement. That one is for earning a total of 10 million gold on the farm. The 3 million that's burning a hole in our pocket right now, though, isn't even gonna last the day. Stop 1 is visiting Krobus so that I can buy the Return Scepter for 2 million gold. The Return Scepter has infinite uses and will instantly teleport me right to my front door on the main farm, no matter where I am. That means I don't have to be carrying around these farm totems anymore, and I decide to do a little bit of inventory management. The next stop is the Wizard's Tower to finish spending all of this coin. I'm gonna be buying my last two obelisks, the Beach Obelisk, which warps you to the beach, and the Earth Obelisk, which warps you up to the mountain. And the rest of the day is spent socializing. Ah, what do you mean I can't give Robin her gift while she's asleep in bed? I was able to give Haley my coconut the other morning, how come Robin won't take my peach tonight? The next morning, Leah stops by for another cutscene. She presents me with a statue called How I Feel About Egghead. I guess the townspeople are starting to figure out that this bachelor is available. Right on, thanks Leah, I'll put that here, next to my gigantic cow. It's the second day of the gift-giving week, so priority one becomes just that. A beer for Shane at 8.30 in the morning, Jazz gets a pink cake, I am such a good influence. A quick tip is to remember that all of the information that you need to complete everything in this game is inside of this log. You can even click on each of the townsfolk to review them individually. That tab even shows you the history of gifts that you've given them and whether or not they've liked them. As I continue hunting down people to give them gifts, I'm reminded that the night market is in town. This does last a couple of days and there are a few fish I want to catch here, so I'll be back. First though, the kegs need tending. I've been using them for beer recently as I wait for that starfruit crop from Ginger Island. The next morning I grab a new key quest, Key's Hungry Challenge, once again getting down to floor 100 in the Skull Cavern Mines, this time without eating. But with my full tilt jade production, I can just staircase to the bottom and that's gonna take me a couple of hours, maybe. I didn't want to sacrifice the prismatic shards either, and speaking of, I spend a few more prismatic shards to change the enchant on my fishing rod. I wasn't entirely happy with the auto hook enchant and wanted the master enchant instead. It's the same old chores throughout the day until the night market finally opens down on the beach. The fish that I need to catch are actually at the bottom of the submarine ride. 
For a thousand gold, this guy will take us down to the bottom of the ocean where a couple of unique fish lie. The first of which that I catch is the lovely blobfish. If you're unaware of what a blobfish is, I suggest a quick Google. They're strange little creatures. The next one I hook is the spookfish, and I have really exciting news. Wait for it. Master angler achieved. I have now caught one of every single fish, with a couple of exceptions. Once I get the extended family quest from the key room again, I'll come back to those. That honestly took so little time that I was a little bit frazzled of what to do with the rest of my day. So, Monster Musk, Ginger, let's go mining. Boom boom, ain't it great to be crazy? The next morning I can speak a little bit to working smarter, not harder. I've been bringing a bunch of wool to bed with me every night because in the morning I can just pop right out the front door and cycle the looms. Plus the wool is super cozy to sleep with. In the mailbox, Willie has sent us our prize for becoming a master angler. He explains that this star drop has been passed down from Willie Sr. to Willie Jr. for oh heck, probably a thousand years. A thousand years and oh, my character did not hesitate down the gullet. It tastes like eggs, thousand year old eggs, I guess. But that's going to be Star Drop 6 out of 7. Let me quickly present Key Mining Quests with Robust Jade Production. Since I was that deep anyway and still need supplies, I decided to just carry on mining for the rest of the day. I wasn't really using a lot of staircases through that process, but then I get down to floor 190. Notice that it's 1.30 a.m. Staircase, staircase, staircase. Floor 200, no problem. My rewards are three life elixirs, pretty good, and an apple sapling. Uh, thanks. And this is why I make sure to keep my bed close to the door. I don't know how close I shaved that one, but I'm sure it was within milliseconds. Speaking of working smarter, not harder, the next morning I'm rotating the kegs, and then I pop out to Ginger Island and don't! Oh, the starfruit crop is ready to harvest, and I could have put these in those kegs instead of the wheat. It all needs to get processed anyway, and then I re-sow the field with more starfruit seeds. As of right now, I have no plans to grow anything else on this island. The rest of the day is spent doing chores, and I wanted to knock off another secret note. At 12.30 at night, something's going on at this bush. I click on it, and Mayor Lewis and Marnie pop out scurrying off in opposite directions. <laughs> what were you up to? The morning of the 19th, it's time to unify the greenhouse crop. This is the last of the sweet gem berries for a little while. I do have a plan for the ancient fruit. The entire greenhouse is now planted with ancient seeds. I now have nine mystic trees producing syrup every three days thanks to the heavy tappers. And now it's finally time to start producing starfruit wine again. Aging or not, that stuff is so profitable. And now it's time to start knocking off some of those crafting goals. I do have to craft one of every single item in the game, and if you have advanced tooltips selected in the options, it will show you how many you've crafted. This workbench is miraculous throughout this process, being able to access all of the inventories around it. After doing that for a little while, it's back to hunting down those items that I haven't shipped. I crafted a dinosaur mayonnaise, but that went to the bundle, and I haven't sold one yet, so grab another dino egg. This, by the way, is why I hoard pretty much everything in my runs. And thanks to the book that I got quite early on, I don't need Marnie at the desk to buy a couple more animals. I didn't plan ahead the best on this one, and my goat and cow are both producing large milks. Turns out I didn't sell one of the regular sized milks or goat milk, so I need a couple new animals. The next day I decided to go a little bit crazy in the mines, deciding to see what I could accomplish if I invested a full day into it. This wasn't even a favorable day luck-wise or anything like that, nor did I have the best buffs on me, and I made over a hundred thousand gold. Not bad at all. A cool little trick I accidentally discovered is that you can actually move your chests around while they're full. I'm 99% sure that this is another addition to 1.6 because I don't remember this being a thing before. Unfortunately, playing chest hop seems to have scrambled my brain a little bit, but I'll get there in the end. The end being tomorrow because I pass out trying to fix it. The morning of the 21st, it's time to start thinking about my long-term goals. My goal is to reach perfection, but like I've said, this game is exactly what you want it to be. I plan to achieve perfection by the game standards, and then I want to do perfection by my standards. That's going to involve more barns. This morning, on the way out the door, I had a bunch of butterflies in the old tummy. 
Why, you may ask? Well, I stop at Pierre's shop to buy a bouquet. Gifting this bouquet to somebody is your way of asking them out. After much consideration, I decided that Miss Egg is the only woman for me, so I'm gonna be marrying Harvey. Eligible people to date in the town are maxed at 8 hearts, and once you ask them to date you, they go up to 10 hearts. Beyond that, once you marry them, they go up to a maximum potential of 14 hearts. I need Harvey to at least like me 12 and a half. It's a lot more of the same stuff. It's the first day of the week, so it's more friendship and double checking with the raccoon to see what he's got for me this week. I have unlocked what I wanted from the raccoons, but there is an achievement to continue helping them. I'm back on Ginger Island at the key shop, where my focus, I think, is going to be entirely on getting the rest of these recipes bought now. I buy the bluegrass recipe, and I think we need 90 more key gems in order to buy out the last of these recipes. On the morning of day 22, I decided to actually establish that little strip of farmland on the other side of the river at Ginger Island. I craft a few more solar panels, really staying with my knack of installing solar in the rain, and I use the now-prepared strip to start growing fiber seeds. There's a fun way in which I can kind of cheese an infinite amount of ancient fruit, but I might not go down that path. If I decide to do it, I need a lot of fiber. I have also been staying diligent with the community board quests, and I'm at a point where we can't get the three last ones that I need. I want to complete one of every type of order, but the three that I need aren't in season. I will continue to do these quests, however, because I do need to complete a certain number of them for another achievement. I'm finding more and more that I have these blank spots in the day. I've just been using it to knock off little things like more of these secret notes. There's a Junimo statue behind the community center. I'll put that here, next to the solid gold Mayor Lewis statue. Yep, that's a thing. I can't let you in on every secret in this game. A big part of its charm is being able to explore it. On the morning of day three, it's time to start filling out that cooking tab. I'm grabbing pretty much one of anything that I think might be involved in food. Start with broad strokes and then get more focused from there, right? It's again a little bit of a process, but the interface does once again show you what you have and have not cooked. If you're curious where I'm pulling these ingredients from, clearly not my inventory, they're all in the fridges that I have. You start with one fridge in the kitchen, and once you unlock it, you can buy as many mini fridges as you want, which will share the same inventory. Well, they're different inventories, but as far as the kitchen cooking is concerned, they're all one inventory. As I start coming down to the last couple of recipes, I want to highlight another tool that is really useful. Sorry console players, this is definitely more for the PC, but there's a website called the Stardew Checkup. I will leave a link to it in the description, but this is a super useful tool for tracking your perfection. It not only tells you what you need to find in order to get perfection, but it also provides links to the wiki. If you're having trouble locating your save file, the easiest way that I can suggest is in-game going to the bottom of the option menu. Just under the screenshot, you'll be able to open the destination folder. This brings you to the screenshot folder, but if you go up one level, hey presto, that's where the saves are. The next day I want to continue buying more farm buildings, but I decided to go against getting another barn. Perfection first, then expansion. I drop down a fish pond. I will be getting multiple of these, but the number one priority is getting a sturgeon in so that I can make caviar. Sturgeon row is the only fish row that will convert to caviar. Since I've never dated a man before, I haven't seen this cutscene with Harvey. I'm sorry that my profits are getting in the way, but mm, look at those mystic trees. Harvey's planned a romantic balloon ride for us, even though he's afraid of heights. This is actually a super sweet and heartfelt cutscene. I've put like seven, eight hundred hours into this game since it first released in 2016, and I'm still finding new things. Today is the day, too, that I finally figure out that missing person in my friend list. Poor Leo, I have completely neglected him up here. Ooh, wait, that's a bunch of fiber, I'm gonna grab that. Which is exactly the mentality that led me to ignore Leo this long. Hey, buddy, yes, yes, I'm bird friend. Unlocking Leo as a character has been available to me for far too long. Let's scroll down to the bottom of the friendship heap. Yep, there he is, a blank slate. This is gonna take a little bit of catching up. Unfortunately for Leo, my friendship hours are only on Sundays and Mondays, so I'm back in the mines. I do that for the entire day, making another 100,000 gold. I have a bit of time at the end of the day, and I want to turn in the next raccoon bundle. 
For this one, I'm rewarded with a star drop tea. That's right. The next day, the starfruit wine is ready, but the starfruit crop is not, so I'm back to filling these in with wheat. See, I told you it didn't matter that we missed the day before. On top of his now usual duck feather that he'll be getting two of every week, I feed Leo all of the star drop teas that I collected. This boosts him up four hearts equal to the dwarf. When we reach six hearts with Leo as well, something's gonna happen that I feel makes him easier to track down and give gifts to. We're only a couple of days away from spring of year three, so it's time to plan ahead again. I took a little bit of time figuring out what my options were, and I've decided to, once again, just go with a strawberry crop. Tried and true, plus the multi-harvest crop is gonna leave me that nice stem moving into summer. At this point in the game, I am all for reducing labor. As I convert a huge amount of strawberries into seeds using the seed makers, I'm also getting a couple of extra ancient seeds along the way. I mean, sure, awesome. And this month just keeps getting better. On the morning of day 27, all of our wine in the cellar has aged to iridium quality. That is a glorious sight, swapping it out for the next batch immediately. And this day just keeps getting better. The next harvest of starfruit is ready on Ginger Island. I'm sure you know the shtick by now. Starfruit out, starfruit in. And of course, once that beer from yesterday is done processing, in goes more starfruit. The last part of the day is once again spent just converting strawberries to seeds. And here we are on the final day of year two. Since it's Sunday and the first day of the gift giving week, that's pretty much what the day is gonna be. This is the part of the friendship grind that I feel starts getting really exciting when I can start being more selective with my gifts. You have to get everybody to 10 hearts or with eligible dating candidates up to the maximum eight hearts. Not to encourage such behavior, but you are able to date the entire town at once. If you just so happen to be doing this, be sure to pop by the saloon for a really funny cutscene. Not this guy though, Harvey is my boo. I managed to get another star drop tea from prize tickets, so that's going to Leo. The star drop tea is super nifty, granting one full heart of friendship outside of the weekly gift cap. That's how I was able to boost Leo up to six hearts so quickly. Because we're now at six hearts with him, we trigger a cutscene on the beach. Leo's story is pretty sad, actually. He was shipwrecked on this island, and his parents have been missing since. Yes, missing. He's been raised by the birds ever since, but since we're now good enough friends with him, he trusts us enough to introduce him to other people. The first time I saw this, I was so happy because Linus and Leo become the best of friends. Leo needs parenting and guidance, and Linus wants nothing more than to pass the lessons of his life down to another. I just can't get over this game. It is so wonderful. Because Linus is such a wild man himself, he and Leo bond over bird calls. Leo will no longer be exclusively on the island, but I'll come back to that in just a second. First, I just need to quickly hammer off the key quest of the week, popping down once again to floor 100 in Skull Cavern. The reward today, a dark cowboy hat. Cool, catch you later. The rest of the day is spent doing chores and preparing myself for spring. The last thing I wanted to do on the 28th of winter year two is give you an update on where we're standing. The perfection tracker in Key's Walnut Room reveals we are 72% completed. With the exception of the great friends achievement, I'm pretty darn close to the rest. The farm so far has earned a total of 11.8 million gold. For now. And check out the friendship standings. As far as the tracker is concerned, we're 52% of the way there, but I'd say we're beyond that. Taking a look at the powers, we have one left to get. I already know what that one is. That's the Spring Onion event with Jazz and Vincent once you have enough friendship with them. Finally, checking out our shipping. Oh yeah, we're getting real close. Fishing is 100% completed, heck yeah. Artifacts and minerals, both also 100% complete. And the cooking tab has some serious progress on it compared to the start of the month. With the achievements as well, we're getting closer by the day, only having seven left to gain. Probably six if I'm honest, I'm not doing the Prairie King. I thought it would be fun once again to do a quick little chest tour as well. Feel free to pause and really investigate them if you feel compelled to. There's one chest, though, that I've been teasing showing you all year. It's empty. Nah-ha. I sold everything in it. You'll see it overnight. 
As I tuck into bed on the last day of year two, we get one final cutscene. Like I mentioned, Linus and Leo are now gonna be the bestest of friends, and Leo moves in to the tree right next to Linus's tent. The part we've all been waiting for, though, is this screen. I've only been selling exactly what I've needed to to afford the things I want. Everything else has been shoved into that chest, netting us 5,861,250 gold. The cloth that I finished processing, 500k, the iridium quality starfruit wine, only 125 of which are worth almost 800k. Probably my favorite is the 102,000 from the 69 truffle oil. Nice. But through all of the fishing and everything else, if it was an artisan good, I pretty much shoved it in this chest, also putting all my smoked fish in here. The last tab is then again just expensive stuff that I've been hoarding. Most of this loot is from golden mystery boxes. And that's gonna be a wrap for year two. In the transition between years two and three, we get our evaluation from Grandpa. Depending on how much we've accomplished, we will get between zero and four candles lit at the shrine on our farm. Grandpa is super proud of the work that we've done, and despite it being mostly obscured by a coop, we do get the four candles lit. Like so many other things in this game, there is no time pressure to get this done. You can always submit a diamond to Grandpa's shrine and be re-evaluated to get your four candles. There are a maximum of 21 points that you can get, but a score of 12 or higher will net you the Statue of Perfection. Slap this bad boy down on your farm and it will produce between 2 and 8 iridium ore every day for free. It's a new year and a fresh field, so let's get to work. The plan this year is to incorporate a bunch of those ancient seeds that I've been growing into the field. Without any buffs, they take 28 days to grow, but then they regrow every 7. 28 days unboosted, that is. We can use some fertilizer to accelerate this. You might think it odd that it has a grow time of 28 days. Isn't it gonna die going into the next season? Not these ancient fruits. They will continue to grow all through spring, summer, and fall. Unfortunately, I don't quite have enough seeds, so the rest of the field is just gonna be strawberries again. Now that we're back in spring and the townspeople like me a little bit more, I can get my final cutscene. With Jazz and Vincent at seven hearts apiece, we will get the spring onion cutscene. This is going to unlock the final power, making spring onions more valuable, but not that valuable for me. I have a lot better ways to make money at this point in the game. With my new boo Harvey, I have to make sure to take a trip down to the beach while it's raining. This guy only shows up when it's raining, and you're able to buy the mermaid's pendant from him. This is the mechanic that allows you to ask your boyfriend or girlfriend to marry you. After that, I start chasing down some cooking ingredients. Carp surprise is among the things I need, so I'm fishing for carp using the challenge bait to try and catch three at a time. Once I've snagged those, it's off to the river in front of Leah's house to get some more rainbow trout. It feels good to be knocking off these tasks. Next on Ginger Island, I've been using the little strip across the river from the main farm to grow fiber. For being such a low-tier resource, I sure put a lot of value into this. And of course, we're nowhere near done with these kegs. I have so much kegging in my future. On the seventh day of spring year three, it's time for our wedding ceremony. Mayor Lewis is the one that conducts the ceremony, and he says that I am now going to be as much a part of this town as any of them. Incorrect. I alone am going to be responsible for this valley's income in the coming months. We kiss, cut to black, and life is going to be different from now on. Which is true, because the first two years I went hard, pushing every day until like 1am at least. For the remainder of this series, if there's nothing that I feel needs to get done, I'm gonna be going back to bed. With the field outside now carrying our ancient fruit, I'm gonna be swapping the greenhouse over to the rare seeds. This is the only way, aside from buying them one at a time from the traveling merchant if he happens to have them, to expand your crop of rare seeds. Taking a look at our friendship tab, I am getting so stinking close. Harvey now shows up as my husband, and I have a quick note about the friendship. Until you max out your friendship with each of the individual townspeople, your friendship will decay slowly. Once you reach 10 hearts or 8 hearts with eligible dating candidates, it will no longer decay every day. 
So, after becoming best friends with everybody in the town, I'm slowly working my way back into my hermit lifestyle. While editing this final section of the playthrough, I'm definitely debating on how much of the starfruit and kegging I should be showing. Just know that even if I'm not showing it, I am diligently harvesting Ginger Island, replanting Ginger Island, and heading back to the kegs to refill them. This pass with the kegs is likely one of the last times you're going to be seeing beer coming from these things. With Ginger Island rocking starfruit and our farm now producing ancient fruit, I think we're going to be good for wine. And how appropriate that with a pocket full of beer I find this cutscene. Shane is definitely one of the more troubled bachelors in town. This scene is quite heartbreaking actually, he's wasted and convinced that he's a waste of life. I let him know that that is definitely not true. All life is precious, and just like Gandalf said, all we have to do is decide what to do with the time that is given to us. I help him to the clinic, and it looks like Shane is going to be working with a therapist from Zuzu City. It's going to be a long and difficult road, but that's what makes life worth living. Looking back at the challenges you've overcome, and forward at the challenges you've yet to tackle. The next morning, the first of the strawberry crops is ready. This strawberry crop is going to be serving only for cash. I will not be processing them at all. As I mentioned, the starfruit and ancient fruit wine are going to be our breadwinners from now on. Ancient fruit wine, of course, being the second most valuable wine in the valley. I have also been nailing off more key quests if they've been worth the time. I've got the 100 items of different colors quest again, and as you can see, I'm just emptying chests at this point. Aquamarine? Sure, I have no other use for it. I turn that in for a total of 69 key gems. Nice. And immediately spend it on the last recipe that I need to buy from the key shop. One thing that I've definitely been keeping an eye out for are these furniture catalogs. As of this update, there are a total of seven available. These catalogs provide any furniture pieces, flooring, wallpapers, any of the decoration items that we want for free. You just have to obtain the catalogs first, which cost money. This Joja themed one should be the last of my special catalogs. The last two should be available for purchase from both Pierre and Robin. And here it is, the last of the beer coming out of the kegs. No more one day cycles. I have so much kegging in my future that I will happily take the seven day wine cycle. Back on the farm, there's more strawberries ready. And ah, oh, this Iridium Scythe, I haven't mentioned it in a long time, but it is still so glorious to use. Not if, but when I play through this game again, I am 100% pushing for the farming mastery first. While cooking one of every single recipe, I have been saving them in a chest. This works out beautifully, as I pretty much have everything that I need for the trash bear available already. The trash bear is going to have a couple of quests for us involving random items. Here's your red plate, buddy, and what do you want next? Oh, plum pudding, okay. I had one of those in the chest too, here you go. Upon completing the last of his requests, we get a cutscene where the trash bear cleans up the trash in the valley. A little bit outside of the sewer, but a lot in front of Pam's house. What's that? Do my eyes deceive me? Alex's dog for a second time? I get excited by these strangest things. The next day, the desert festival is back on and I have two goals that I'm here for. The first being the recipe for tropical curry. It's available from Leo's shop, but that's only if he is selected to have a shop this year. It is also available for purchase from Gus when he decides to go to the island resort. It's random which group of the townspeople is going to the beach, and Gus is just refusing to get his vitamin D. Yes, I have been checking every day for quite a while now. Goal two is going to be having a bit of fun. Since I need the calico eggs in order to purchase anything from the vendors, let's see just how many I can get in a day. By, of course, abusing a bunch of staircases in Skull Cavern. I remember from last year that the townspeople go home at midnight, so in the last couple minutes of the day, I'm blasting through ladders to get down to floor 250. There's no real goal in mind with that, aside from 250 is a nice even number. I pop back up to get my egg rating evaluated by Gil, and I think I break Gil a little little bit. With a rating between 55 and 999, we get 500 calico eggs, a magic rock candy, and one surprised gill. If you manage to go above a thousand, you will hear a voice in your head. It would be dishonorable to submit an egg rated acquired through the use of cheat code software. That's right, cheaters. Concerned Ape is watching. 
Including this reward and what I gathered throughout the mine today, I have 1200 calico eggs to spend. And of course, no inventory space. I check out some of the other shops and Jazz has another rock candy available, heck yeah, why not? But that's gonna do it for today. While I wait for the festival to open the next day, I'm back on Ginger Island doing what I do. The merchants don't really have anything exciting for me the next day, and I have so many calico eggs, I'm just gonna buy some mystery boxes, sure. I've now also collected the leaks required for Evelyn's community board quest. This should be the second last one that I need to do. And to round out the day, I'm back at home re-enchanting my axe. I did have the swift enchant on it originally, but I switched over to the shaving enchant, and after using that for a while, I decided that I want my swift enchantment back. Patience is not among my virtues. For completing the Leaks for George quest, Evelyn rewards me with a coffee maker. Well, isn't that convenient? I'm trying to get Harvey up to 12 and a half hearts, and he just happens to love coffee. This coffee machine is going to provide one coffee every morning, which I can then just give to Harvey. Gosh, I'm lazy. Or is my laziness just planned efficiency? Let me know in the comments. It's the final day of the Egg Festival today, and you know what? Let's get Emily to redress us again. What kind of costume is she going to come up with this year? I'm reminded of Tweedledee and Tweedledum by this latest outfit. And you know what? Just for you, Emily, I'm gonna rock this outfit all year. No dice on the tropical curry recipe, so I'm just spending whatever I have left for calico eggs. I grab another rock candy and uh, some mega bombs, sure. Ten eggs left, uh, desert flags. Sounds good. The next morning, my master plan starts to unfurl. Roll out of bed, grab the coffee from the pot, give it to Harvey, give him a smooch, and I've fulfilled all my relationship requirements. Which pays off, it's time to get the final star drop. Just like all of the other mystical ancient star fruits that we've eaten, it tastes like eggs. Delicious, what a start to the day. I harvest up the strawberry crop once again and then head south. This triggers another cutscene with my forest friends. I've now completed enough quests with the raccoon to get the Good Neighbors achievement. Their family seems to be thriving, and it almost makes me want to start my own. Eh, Harvey's in charge of that. Of course, I can't go three minutes without mentioning kegs. And let's take a look at this progress. All of the powers have been unlocked. All of the shipping, all of the fishing, all of the minerals, all of the artifacts, and I'm missing that Darn tropical curry recipe. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. My key quest again this week is to get 100 items of each color, so I'm back at the saloon buying Joja Cola. Soon, very soon, I will come up with a solution to keep me from having to do this anymore. The next day, the egg excitement continues and the first crop of ancient fruits are ready to harvest along with more strawberries. I decide to head to town and there's another cutscene that activates. I didn't mention it when I purchased it, but there are community upgrades available from Robin. For the low, low price of half a million gold and 950 wood, I'm able to upgrade Pam and Penny's house. I can choose whether or not to let it be known that I was the one that funded this. I choose not to because doing a good deed is reward in itself. As a result of my actions, we've now cleaned up all of the garbage around her house and converted the trailer into a home. Unfortunately, changing what's on the outside does not change what's within. Pam's had this house for all of a couple of hours and there's already beer cans all over her room. Why is she the designated bus driver? My new key quest is to once again cook 100,000 gold worth of fresh food, so it's off to Gus to buy coffee. Yeah, I am not stooping to the peasantry of creating my own coffee anymore. Ginger Island Star Fruits. Which leads us to something that I've really been waiting for the next day. I've completely ignored the flower dance up to this point, but there's a rare crow and a recipe that I need. I've been too shy to come to the flower dance by myself, but Harvey helps hold my hand throughout it. I'm lined up with the women, which tells you everything you need to know about our relationship. Grabbing that last rare crow unlocks the recipe for the deluxe scarecrow. Instead of a radius of 8 tiles, this thing has a radius of 16 tiles. And it's one more box checked in the quest to get all of the items crafted. Without any more recipes to buy in the key shop, I decided to start spending my gems a little bit more frivolously. 20 gems are going towards the aquatic sanctuary, the biggest fish tank available. And that bad boy's going into the bedroom, living room. Oh gosh, I think it's time to decorate. I'd love to say that there was some kind of overarching plan in this whole process, but that's not exactly my wheelhouse. 
I'm just gonna be throwing starfruit at the wall and hoping it sticks. I did decide to theme a couple of the rooms based on the catalogs, but aside from that, I'm just throwing it down, picking it up, throwing it down. Ooh, I like it. Since I don't really feel you need to hear me say that over and over, let's turn up the music a little and just enjoy a nice building montage. I'll see you on the other side. rooms decorated is feeling pretty good so far, but I had to throw this in. Uh, not the kegs this time. As you can see, Robin is here, and she's doing a little bit of work on this cliffside. After buying the community upgrade for Pam's house, the next upgrade adds a bunch of shortcuts to the valley. Clearly, this shortcut is not gonna mean too much at the moment because my kegs are sitting here, but that will be changing soon enough. I spend more time decorating, this time going with a more retro theme, but it's time for another fun cutscene. I kinda wish I'd gotten this cutscene after I'd decorated because it's quite dark. No wonder Harvey is struggling so much in the kitchen. He's preparing us a lovely meal that we're going to enjoy in front of the fireplace. This is his very own angel hair pasta primavera with clams. Ooh, sorry honey, didn't I tell you I don't like seafood? This tastes like your mustache. Extra fiber indeed. The next day marks the start of summer, and I have another ancient fruit harvest ready to go. The summer season is going to be all about growing more starfruit. After filling out the fields with my starfruit, I head to Pierre's to buy a few more seeds. Looking back on this footage, I have no idea what I was thinking, but I buy 525 corn seeds. I head out to Sandy's in order to buy another 3,000 starfruit seeds, and once I get to Ginger Island, I realize my mistake. Corn seeds. You can even see player me getting confused here. With that, though, I'm once again going to be shutting my trap and enjoying this beautiful soundtrack as I continue decorating. Overall, I'd say that this house has turned out quite nicely. Oh yeah, that thing appeared in the crib. I'll get back to that. The aquatic sanctuary is not just a home for fish, you can actually add a bunch of different decorations. Thank you once again to the Stardew Wiki and the endless supply of information on it. I grabbed a few extra items from my chest, but it's by no means full at the moment. I'll see what I can wrangle together over the coming weeks. The next day I'm definitely up to no good as we're visiting the Luau. Why, you might ask? Well, I've had the Mayor's Lucky Shorts that I extracted from Marnie's room sitting in a chest for a couple of years now. As we've seen in the past, we're able to add any ingredient we want to this potluck soup. <laughs> I add in the Mayor's Lucky Shorts and let's see how the governor likes it. It's a bit tangy, but actually the flavor is quite good. 
I guess that's what the fermentation process gets you. The governor finds the shorts in the soup and his tune changes pretty quickly. We fade to black and the governor is MIA while Lewis tells us how this appalling act is truly reprehensible. Ah, uh, come on, Lewis, I don't make the poops, I only disturb them. In typical sociopath fashion, I move on the next day to harvest more kegs. You can see now the shortcut that Robin has created, but it's completely blocked off by my kegs. I do have a plan for those kegs, and you'll be seeing that soon enough. Harvey now likes me about as much as I need him to, so the coffees are going into the fridge. Sorry, buddy. The middle of the month also marks a starfruit harvest on the main farm. Starfruit out, and wouldn't you guess it, starfruit back in. Now it's time for some real shenanigans. Why play one Stardew when you can play four? Those multiplayer cabins that I built months ago are now finally going to be getting put to use. They're far too small for me at the moment, so I created three little minions to upgrade them. Unfortunately, the primary player on the farm cannot upgrade these houses. You have to do them with the actual player that lives there. The 16th day of summer in year three is going to be our green rain day. So, as is tradition at this point, I go off and harvest a bunch of Harvey's mustache. I, I mean fiber. Believe it or not, even after all of this, I will be running out of it. The next day, I'm back to my shenanigans upgrading all of my player homes. I am going to be making an error here, though. As you can see, after I queue the upgrade, I am exiting each of the minions. I will be finding out over the coming days that these guys need to be logged in in order for the house to upgrade. The passage of time while they're logged out does not seem to apply to their individual house upgrades. The next day, it's time to unveil my next master plan. In case you'd forgotten about all those maple trees at the tree farm, they've been tapped and producing maple syrup. That maple syrup is going towards building a massive field of bee houses. If you're curious about where some of these designs are coming from, it's not my brain. The Stardew Wiki has a bunch of them available, as does Reddit. I'm going to be building these bee houses out surrounding fairy roses, which is going to give us the most valuable honey. After more kegging and ancient fruit harvesting, I'm back at the island harvesting starfruit. As you can see, my bee house layout is getting quite a bit more filled out. I don't have the bee houses quite yet, but the wooden planks indicate where I'll walk, while the stone indicates where the bee houses will be placed. And yep, more kegging. Day 27 is my favorite day of the month because the iridium wine is done aging. Sweet, glorious, iridium quality starfruit wine, you gotta love it. Which requires a lot of starfruit that I'm once again harvesting. I will not be replanting anything though because summer is almost up. It's now been 10 full days since I queued the upgrades on these cottages and they're still not upgrading. This is when I really started to investigate my boo-boo and figure out that the characters actually need to be in the game. I won't be quite so cloak and dagger about my sellables chest this time. As you can see, I've got some decent stacks of materials ready to sell. Since I'm feeling pretty flat broke at only 57k, I decided to sell everything that wasn't high value. Well, super high value anyway. Overnight, that nets us a dandy 1.8 million, which is likely going to disappear as quickly as it just appeared. Before the start of fall, I'm celebrating by planting a bunch of pumpkins. I'm definitely not getting any originality awards here, but hey, if it ain't broke. There is a little bit of danger in how this honey farm is being laid out. As I walk down the line, I can't really see what's in front of me because of all of the honey, and I end up harvesting one of the fairy roses. Once I harvest it, I not only have to regrow it, but the bee houses around it are now giving wild honey instead of the much more valuable fairy rose honey. I'll be showing you a solution for that once I figure it out. And I still can't seem to make it more than a few steps without mentioning something involving starfruit production. This is the only time that I'm going to be showing harvesting the maple syrup from the tree farm because I can only fit in so much redundancy. That latest harvest allows me to head back to Ginger Island with another 65 bee houses. The technique that I discovered is going to be splitting any stack of items to fill my entire inventory. That way, if I accidentally click on one of the fairy roses, it's unable to be put into our inventory, and therefore the character will not harvest it. In my opinion, it's always beneficial to work smarter, not harder. The next morning, I start to fix my boo-boo by simply having all of the characters wake up with me, and they go straight back to sleep. It's a hard life here on Exceptional Farm. A couple of days later, and I'm ready to queue up the next set of upgrades. I run all the minions up to Robins, and we need hardwood. 
Going back to grab all that hardwood is gonna be a real pain in the butt with all the minions, so I just have the main character bring it all up to Robin's. I pop down the supplies in a chest in Robin's shop, and this allows me to correct something that I mentioned earlier in this playthrough. It used to be the case that having chests in NPCs' walking paths meant that they would get destroyed, but it seems as of 1.6, they just kinda get shoved to the side. That is a massive quality of life improvement. With the supplies now available, I queue up the next round of upgrades and start sleeping again. For my own convenience, I just decided to play out the days that they were sleeping on the tiny screen, harvesting a bit more ancient fruit. The faster this process is over, the faster I can get back to one screen. Over the course of the upgrades, I'm definitely getting smarter with how I'm managing the minions. They all have a little bit of coffee and a couple of farm warp totems in their inventory now. This is exclusively to make my life just that little bit easier. On the 10th of fall, I have the extended family quest from the key room, so it's time to bust out the fishing rod, probably for the last time. This quest essentially repopulates all of the legendary fish, except for they're a little bit different this time. These catches do not count specifically towards the master angler achievement, but the completionist in me does need them done. The minions' houses are now fully upgraded, and it's time to expand all of the rooms. It's gonna feel real good to get this done, but I can't seem to build the attic. This is because there's a window in the way, so it's back to the main character to save the day once again. Ah, there we go. This is gonna mark the last time that you see the minions. Back at the farm, it feels real good to be on a single screen again. I will not be putting any effort into decorating these places aside from making them consistent with their wallpaper and flooring. Oh, and getting rid of all the furniture. I don't think it's necessary, but I will be leaving a single bed in each of the houses in this little cubby. With what I'm about to be doing in these houses, I think the minions deserve at least one small piece of home. We're halfway through the month, and that means that it's going to be pumpkin harvest number one. Of all of the giant crops that are capable of forming in this game, I definitely feel that pumpkins are the best, regardless of their monetary value. Alright, it's time for some more shenanigans. I was prepared to reset the day at the luau just to keep these shorts, but I didn't actually have to. At the Stardew Valley Fair, instead of filling out our grains display with all of the beautiful things my farm produces, I'm just going to stick in the mare shorts. Let's get them nice and centered in there, and cue Lewis to come evaluate our box. He kind of stops and takes a look with no reaction. Wow, good poker face. Oh, just kidding, he's a little bit upsetty spaghetti with me. I take his 750 star token bribe and promise not to tell a soul. Except for all of you, my lovely audience. Mischief managed, let's grab the shorts and head home. I have continued cycling all of the rare seeds in the greenhouse, but as you can see, the trees on the edges are full of fruit. There kind of just came a point when I stopped caring. There isn't much that's going to be coming out of these sweet gem berries, as the greenhouse will be converting to something else in the not-too-distant future. So I keep telling you just how valuable fiber is, and then not really showing you why. I now have access to these garden pots, which do not themselves require fiber. What does require fiber is the deluxe retaining soil. With the deluxe retaining soil in these garden pots, as long as it's a multi-harvest crop and you water it once, that thing will be watered forever. Unfortunately, you cannot do this with the ancient seeds as the roots run too deep. Plus, that feels just a little bit exploitative. Instead, I fill them with a whole bunch of blueberries, broccoli, and strawberries. My thinking here surrounded the key quest for 100 items of the various different colors, particularly the blueberries, to avoid buying more Joja Cola. My indecision is going to cost me a ton of fiber in the retaining soil. I will be breaking and replacing all of these with different crops, but we'll get to that later. More importantly in these extra houses is that I now have four cellars to fill with casks. With the layouts that I'm using, this now results in 500 iridium quality wine per batch instead of 125. The starfruit industry turns on, and then in these houses I'm starting to set up a little bit. I have definitely been expanding my crystallariums, filling them all with diamonds. They may fetch a pretty penny by themselves, but I do have a different plan for them. This is definitely not going to be the final configuration, though you'll see it eventually. The morning of day 22, I met with more ancient fruit to harvest, and I decided to sell some stuff overnight. By overnight, of course, I mean that I'm going to bed before 11 in the morning. Now that the house is decorated, I decided that now is as good a time as any to go grab that golden clock and start working outdoors. Oh boy, I broke the money counter again. That's supposed to be 15 million. Five stacks of base quality iridium wine sure does fetch a pretty penny. The next morning, I head down to the wizard's tower and let's buy the clock for 10 million gold. 
I'm just gonna throw it here for now, sure. The clock is going to prevent debris from appearing on the farm and the Ginger Island farm. It will also keep things like fences from decaying and just so happens to keep time with the endgame clock. Out on Ginger Island, I can verify that that golden clock was the last piece of my perfection puzzle, at least by the game standards. Look at that. 100% complete. I'm gonna have to sleep through the night, though, for the perfection to actually register. Before that, I make a stop at Clint's, making him a very wealthy man, buying a few million gold worth of ore. What can I say? I've done my time in the mines. I wake up the next morning and feel in my heart somewhere, somehow, Grandpa is beaming with pride. The legacy of Exceptional Farm is eternal. And for, like, the first time in the playthrough, let's actually zoom in on my character. We've come so far, and there's still a little ways that I'd like to go before I feel that perfection has been reached. There's a rumbling sound heard in the distance, so let's check that out next. Up at the tree farm, or I guess it's actually the train station, the boulder blocking the path north has now crumbled away. I head up to the summit and Harvey is up here waiting for me. He says he was looking back on the last three years and we've been through so much together, haven't we? I'm sorry, I don't remember you being there with a pickaxe next to me this whole time. But as we transition upwards into the credit sequence, I can't help but love it. I quite enjoy this sequence, especially the little message that pops up saying no Joja services used as Morris gets punted across the screen. Darn tootin' I didn't need any of those lame Joja services. The end of the cutscene shows Grandpa and Mr. Key giving us one final message. It seems like they've been our guardian angels. This just feels like such a beautiful closing point for this series. So instead, I'm gonna go to Robin's cabin and buy 25,000 wood. I was hoping that that would be enough wood to take me through to the end, but, um, it isn't. Back at the farm, it's time to spend the majority of that wood already. I craft the last couple of casks that I need to finish off the cellars, and then another 377 kegs. It's time to start making some real money. I start setting them up, and my indecision costs me once again. Never mind, I don't like this layout, let's chop them all down. Oh, and all of the crystallariums as well, I want two houses to be exclusively for kegs. I'm also adding some wind windows for style points, and possibly light. The next day, the bus stop and quarry kegs are ready, so let's chop all these down as well and move them back to the farm. This environment has provided me so much, and I think it's time that I started giving back. Step one is cleaning up all of this production equipment I have laying about the world. Here are the crystallariums being chopped down, those diamonds are a beautiful sight, and you might be thinking, hey, didn't I just see a kitchen space full of kegs? Well, yes, that was the other keg house, I'm gonna have two. I get the second house nearly fully kitted out with kegs, but I run out. My limiting factor is once again iron, but as you saw, I bought a lot of it from Clint. I just need to run it through the smelters. The crystallariums are being moved into the green house. See what I did there? It's the last day of fall and the last time that we're gonna see pumpkins on this farm. I harvest them up and then it's time to start designing. By which, of course, again, I mean just throwing stuff down and hoping that I like it. Winter is now upon us and I did move the house back up to the northeastern corner. It just feels right being next to the entrance. Easily one of the more tedious tasks is moving everything from my chests back over to the new production area, which is gonna sit right next to the house again. It's pretty much an all-day task in and of itself, but I do get it done. Hey, what's that statue? Well, that statue, my friends, is the Statue of Endless Perfection. I popped back out to Ginger Island earlier in the day to claim this statue from the Perfection Tracker in Key's Walnut Room. This bad boy is gonna give us a prismatic shard every morning for free. In the last part of the day, because Robin's shop is closed, I popped down to the Wizard Tower to move around my buildings. I feel like I'm getting somewhere with the rough layout, but I think adding a little bit more detail is gonna help me see the whole picture. This is, after all, how I did my overlay for the Pokémon content, for instance. I start by organizing my big pieces, and then I start doing the finessing from there. The Starfruit Nightmare, I mean production, continues, and you can see that the bee houses are slowly getting filled in. I am absolutely chewing through these Starfruit seeds, so it's back out to Sandy's to buy another 3,000. After replanting the field, I split my Starfruit stacks in my inventory to go harvest the bee houses. As you can see, with my full inventory, I can hover across these fairy roses as much as I want, and I will not harvest them. Nifty! And then it's back to designing. I mean, look at this professional-level arc of totems. <laughs> professional. I head back to Robin's because building all of those crystallariums requires a lot of stone, so I buy 15,000 of that. 
and then it's time to start reconfiguring these fields for their final layout. I am 100% going to be using the pressure nozzles in these fields, and a good tip is to lay down a piece of flooring before your sprinkler. Flooring or stone pathing is going to prevent the sprinkler from getting broken when you use the hoe on it, for instance. Anything to make my life easier. I start laying out some fencing around what will be the animal area, and then take the fish ponds of shame and just kind of shove them in a corner. I did have other plans for these fish ponds, but they never really came to fruition. The income of resources that I was getting from them was simply too low. With my biggest pieces of the farm puzzle sorted now, it's time to start laying out some pathing. Another fun tip here is that you can see me using the hoe to determine exactly which tiles are plantable. I am by no means min-maxing this, and losing a single tile of plantable area in order to make the path look better is A-OK -okay in my books. The way that I'm laying out this pathing is by thinking to myself, where am I going to be walking to, and how am I getting there? The couple of hours that I've invested into Factorio have definitely made me appreciate these straight paths with production scattered around them. But it isn't going to be all about production anymore, and this top corner is definitely going to be a shrine to my achievements, as it were. I've also moved my production and sellables chests right into this little nook here. I have pretty much everything that I want to process in this little corner, and I guess I'm going to sneak these truffle oil machines just behind the house. I do still at least want to try to make the best use of space here. On the morning of winter day 6, it's the first time that these kegs are ready to cycle within the houses. Every single cycle, I'm now getting somewhere around 1200 wine. The only disadvantage to having this many kegs is that it pretty much takes all day just to cycle them. Granted, it is winter and the sun goes down a little bit earlier, but I was kegging from dawn till dusk. The next task is going to be converting the greenhouse to its final configuration and crop. As I'm tearing down the sprinklers and getting the field reprepped, you can see in the seed makers at the bottom of the screen what I might have in mind here. Using the pressure nozzles, I can get away with only losing a single space of farmable area to a sprinkler. The reason I also destroyed the soil and the fertilizer within it is because I wanted to upgrade to Hyper Speed Grow. This field is not for human consumption, so don't worry about the radioactive ore going into the ground. I get everything laid out, Hyper Grow the entire space, and replant the greenhouse, this time with Berry Roses. This, in combination with the diamonds from the Crystallariums, is going to give us a pretty consistent income of fairy dust. The sheer volume of casks that I have running right now is going to be a little bit more than this crop can handle, however... Don't forget about all of those Mystic Trees that I have tapped. The Mystic Syrup that I'm getting from them can be exchanged at the Raccoon Shop for more fairy dust. They're going to more than supplement the amount of fairy dust that I'm able to produce from this greenhouse. The last task of the day is, unlike in previous years, resetting up all of my scarecrows and lightning rods before the crops are down. I can be taught. I'm faced once again with a situation of more speed, less haste. I'm about to lose way too many mystic seeds throughout this process, because instead of laying it out first and seeing if I liked it, I'm laying it out with the expensive bits first? Bad. Bad business egg. The reason I lose them is because I set them up and let them grow for a couple of days, and then I have to chop them back down. Yes, I am using tree fertilizer on them, by the way, which is why they're able to grow in winter. I'm also taking the time to lay out some lighting spots, because this farm has been in the darkness for far too long. A fun little trick that I learned while trying to get better at decorating things in Minecraft is to break up the textures. This corner of the path that's going to split off into the field, I want to try and rough up so that it looks really trodden. I continue the path past the obelisks and down to the bat cave, which I haven't been in in a couple years. I do the same kind of texture breakup at the end of the path, and I'm honestly quite happy with it. The next day, I'm laying out some of the bluegrass starter, which our animals should love, and it's time to fix boo boo number one with the mystic saplings. Did I say number one? I sure did. I messed this up more than once. I take a quick little scoot around the farm just to see how I'm feeling about the layout as a whole so far. Pretty good, and look at me making these trees in line with the others. This is the point that I should have planted all those mystic saplings, so I'm in desperate need of tree seeds. Speaking of wasting effort, I'm now chopping down all of those garden pots in the house like I mentioned earlier. As far as I know, this is the only way to remove the stems from the planters, which also destroys the fertilizer. And several hundred fiber with it. I lay them all back down, refertilize them, and I'm gonna be replanting this with hops. 
I will not be producing any pale ale through the kegs, but I figured since this is definitely turning out to be more of a keg empire than an egg empire, I should at least stay on brand. On Friday the 12th, I have some egg sighting news. The last of the bee houses are going down at Ginger Island. Until I end up one short. Ugh, it never fails. I go home, craft another one, and there we go. Honey farm completed. Hey, check it out, I bet you wouldn't have guessed to see more kegging. But the majority of my focus over the last few weeks has definitely been decorating. Laying out these path sections is definitely the next big piece that I felt needed to happen, and then I can start doing some of the detailing. I've actually never once used these brick paths, and it makes quite a nice little accent among all the wood. Laying out my little shrine area up top is definitely coming along nicely, leaning on the same techniques once again. Since I show you the kegs pretty much every time, I will only be showing the fairy rose harvest once. Maybe twice. With the footage accelerated, there is something satisfying about watching this. My next stop is at Pierre's shop, where I'm going to be buying a bunch more seeds. These seeds are never going to get planted. They're entirely to make tubs of flowers, the recipe of which I bought from the flower dance last spring. What, you thought I was going to be good at detail work? Absolutely not. I'm just plopping like a hundred of these around the farm. Ah, oh, look at them. They're beautiful. And once spring rolls around, they will actually have flowers in them. The night market is back in town, and I've been trying to nail off the last of these secret note tasks. Obviously, since we've already perfected the game, it's not a requirement, but this is a requirement for me. This is my second last note to claim the reward from, and I get a pearl. That's going to be going right into the aquarium back home. A few days pass, and I figured I'd show you the entire harvesting of this honey field. A full harvest of the field nets me 383 fairy rose honey with a value of 952 gold apiece with the artisan perk. To summarize, every four days this thing produces 345,000 gold. The 20th of winter ends up being quite a late night, which are rare these days. I cycle the kegs and the Ginger Island starfruit crop. Those two tasks alone pretty much take an entire day. But I more than make up for it, because on days like the 22nd, if there's nothing to do, ah, oh, 6.50 a.m., I'm going back to bed. My crystallariums and hops are available to harvest the next day, but I don't care about the hops. It just felt production-y, so let's fill space with it. Then, once again, my favorite day of the month, the 27th rolls around, and I decided to reconfigure at least one of these basements. I've definitely noticed going through the keg houses that I start to go cross-eyed after a while. I set it back up as a more vertical layout, and it's still 125 casks down here, so it doesn't make any impact on the production itself. Gosh, I spend a lot of time kegging. But I'd say that it's worth it. At the end of the year, as is tradition, I make sure to sell everything that was in my production chest. I break the counter once again, making 18 million gold, but uh, I think we can do better. This was a pretty darn good year for the exceptional farm, but I'd say we have room to grow. It's the first of spring, year four, and we are going to whip through this year. The first task, as always, is going to be setting up the fields, but this time I'm doing it a little differently. Why would I bother replanting crops every season and multiple times a season sometimes when I can just drop down ancient seeds and let them produce all year for me? Every spot that I'm farming from this year is going to be producing ancient seeds, but I run out, so it's back to the greenhouse to play with the seed makers. That felt quite inefficient to me, so I tore them all up, replacing them in the attic of the greenhouse. Wait, no, they just came from the greenhouse, but the green trailer just doesn't have the same ring. Here you can see I never stop moving. The machines are producing quickly enough that I can just continuously go in a circle producing these seeds. I finish planting the last of them in the fields, and then I go back over the entire thing with fertilizer. If I'm not mistaken, this should give us one additional growth cycle this year. I am flat out of wood again, so it's back to Robbins to buy another 15,000. And the eternal nightmare of kegs continues. You'll have to excuse me if I sound a little bitter about it. By the end of recording this playthrough, I was dreaming about kegs. With all of that sorted, I'm back to decorating using some of these gravel paths to accent the fields. I feel it creates a really nice little border all around the edges. Right, so I mentioned the Egg Empire, and I think it's finally time to start creating that. I haven't been super diligent with it, but I have been regularly visiting Robin to continue upgrading my barns and building more coops. This is going to be the final coop that's being built for a total of four barns and six coops. 
all of which are going to be upgraded to the max level. With a nice fat stack of cash now, I'm sick and tired of running out to the desert constantly, so I'm going to buy 10,000 starfruit seeds this time. That should be enough to carry me through till at least the end of this playthrough. With our keg operation expanded once again, our ginger island field is no longer outproducing our kegs. As a result, I'm now alternating between starfruit wine and ancient fruit wine. It's all well and good, but the nicest thing for me as a player is seeing a different color in these kegs now and then. I have continued harvesting the bee houses up to this point on their four day cycle. This is the last time that I'll be showing it and among the last times that I actually do it. I have to admit that by the end of recording this, I was getting a little bit fried. If you're interested in seeing a continuation to the exceptional farm, let me know what you want to see in the comments. I could do a little planning and see just how much money we could make in a single year, we could see just how silly we can get in the mines, there's all kinds of things that we can still explore. The remainder of this playthrough, however, is going to be completing the egg empire and seeing how much money we make just off of the kegs and eggs. The morning routine is definitely becoming step out the front door, check the farm computer, and if there's nothing interesting, go back to bed. As you can see this morning, I have 119 crops available in the greenhouse and 1152 machines ready. Given that the indicator kegs in front of the trailers are ready to go, I'd say that's the kegs. Rastin' a suffer in a kegs all day and I'm bringing that I got a heart off for kegs. The morning of day 24, I get my first ancient fruit harvest ready to go at the main farm. The kegs may be outproducing Ginger Island, but there's no way that they're gonna outproduce all of this plus Ginger Island. Any more, that is to say, because I did run out of things to produce using those pumpkins to fill the gap. Now that the farm and the farmhouse are pretty decorated, there's still a little bit of work to do, but I think it's time that I actually dress to impress. I might be rocking this Tweedledum look, but I think it's time that our outfit reflects our bank total. I have a pretty good stack of prismatic shards available from the Statue of Endless Perfection, and I grab a bunch of cloth to head inside with. Some time forever ago, I received a sewing machine from Emily. I'm gonna be using cloth and prismatic shards to make, you guessed it, prismatic clothing. While doing it, it's random as to which pieces of clothing you get, so I do it until I get them all. I put on the nice sleeveless shirt and my farmer's pants, which I'm gonna have to swap, I'll figure it out eventually. But then it comes time to pick a new hat. There are some pretty fun options available, and I decided to go with the Infinity Crown. For all of about five seconds before I decided that I hated it and went back for my mystery top hat. It's been a while since I had this bad boy on my head, and I missed it. We hit day 27 in the month again, and all of the wine is gold, which isn't that exciting. But remember, I do have pretty robust fairy dust production at this time, so I can make all of that iridium quality right now. I repeat this process in all of the cellars, collecting 500 iridium quality wine and getting the next batch producing. It feels pretty darn good to get iridium quality wine in one month instead of two now. And the grind continues. Fairy roses, the ginger island crop, and more kegs. And of course more ancient fruit, which is the most exciting part for me. I think that's mostly because I haven't done this a hundred times yet. The 5th of summer, year 4, is gonna be our green rain day for the year, and you bet your butts I'm out harvesting. I can never get myself enough fiber. I've now also expanded the crystallarium setup, so it is now outproducing the greenhouse's fairy roses. That means that any excess diamonds are ripe to be sold. More harvesting, more kegging, and these coops are getting pretty close to being fully upgraded. You may notice that some of these chickens look a little bit more shiny than others. Upon achieving perfection, you can buy a golden egg from Key's Walnut Room. Just like the rare seeds, just like the ancient seeds, I started with one and am slowly growing them out from there. Aside from the animals that have been with us from the beginning, these coops are going to be filled with golden chickens to produce golden eggs. The barns are filled with ostriches to produce ostrich eggs. What? Normal chicken eggs aren't that exciting, let's do something fun! Even more harvesting, even more kegging, and my shenanigans with the animals has definitely come back to bite me a little bit. I may be a good farmer, but I'm a terrible rancher and I have no idea when my animals ran out of food. I come down to Marnie's to buy 12,000 hay because that bluegrass that I planted was eaten probably in the first couple weeks of spring. That's why I wanted the four silos so that at least I have some amount of buffer. Then I decided to take advantage of a different type of item that's stocked in the raccoon shop. I can exchange three mystery boxes for a single golden mystery box, and then 20 of those for a single magic rock candy. 
No, I won't be using these for any reason today, but hey, if we want to re-explore Exceptional Farm, they're there if we want them. I will never be free of star fruit. Ooh, but ancient fruit, that's a little exciting. Since they chowed through all the bluegrass too, I've been thinking about shutting these barn doors. That would lock the animals inside so that as I'm working on the farm, I'm not hearing the incessant Ah, uh, but the ever-present sound of kegging will keep me sane, right? Right? The fairy rose harvest is just so much fun, so here's it at, like, hyperspeed. While wanting to make this farm pretty, I am very much a function-over-form type of person. Those mystic trees lining the path sure look pretty, but they're also producing even more mystic syrup. I've also gone around starting to do a little bit more of that detailing work, planting a few more trees, not mystic trees this time, and just spreading some grass around. The growth of grass is not affected by the golden clock, so it will still spread unless your ostriches are nomming on it too much. More harvesting, more planting. And let's check out how these coops are doing. That flock of chickens is getting pretty big, and every few days I come back in here to a sparkling new chicken being hatched. For your sake and for mine, I'm skipping a lot of kegging and harvesting footage, but hey, check it out, my outfit is now complete. I also figured, despite how much I love the thing, to unequip the parrot. I've been rocking around with the basilisk claw that makes me immune to debuffs. Outside of the mines, there aren't a whole lot of enemies, so I wasn't getting a lot of benefit from the squawky parrot. Suddenly, we're back at the 27th day of the month, so it's time for 500 more fairy dust and 500 more iridium quality wine. Speaking of the fairy dust, I have wisened up a little bit, and every time I go to harvest the greenhouse, I'm bringing 119 diamonds with me. That way, after I harvest the farm, I can just craft the 119 fairy roses into dust and plop it directly into the production chest, ready for the next batch. I continue grabbing golden eggs and sticking them right back into the incubators, and these coops have got to be getting close to being full now. Now, please enjoy my descent into madness as the entire next month is spent either sleeping, kegging, or harvesting. Seriously, that's pretty much it. I have hours of footage of me doing these three tasks over and over and over. Hey, look at that! We're on the 27th of the month again already! Bust out the fairy dust! You might have lost a little bit of the semblance of what time it actually is, and so did I. This is in fact the second last day of winter, so this is the last batch of Iridium quality wine for this playthrough. To celebrate the last day of the playthrough, let's do a quick chess tour. The greenhouse chest has quite a few little goodies in it, but as you can see, I kind of abandoned the rare seeds in favor of fairy roses. Next is the production chest, and anything keggable still ends up in here, with a big stack of hay right next to the silos, just in case I need a quick refill. As I whip through the supply chest, if you're interested, feel free to pause, but I'm not going to linger too long here. I thought that you might be interested in seeing just how many resources I've accumulated throughout this playthrough. It also doesn't help that I'm still totally stuck in the mentality of hoard everything. Yes, that even includes a chest that has two little items in it, a piece of wool and a piece of bread. Why? Because I refused to throw them out, and I didn't have anywhere else to put them in that moment. With that, we find ourselves with the final chest, the sellables. I should note that all of these eggs, if turned into mayonnaise, would be far more valuable. The ostrich eggs turn into 10 mayonnaise apiece, while the golden eggs turn into 3 apiece. I definitely lost a lot of income potential by not maxing out every day, but I feel this is gonna be sufficient for today. We'll see what that's worth overnight, and then I stopped to make sure that all of my achievements were done. Um, I'm missing one. Uh-oh, what is this? Do you remember that movie theater that I unlocked quite a while ago? That is what the final achievement is gonna be, so I head down to the theater to grab a couple of tickets for Harvey and I. I teleport back home, inviting Harvey to the movies with me, and head right back to the theater. And there's the achievement. Two thumbs up for viewing a movie, even though we haven't seen it yet. You are able to grab a snack from the concession, and depending on who you're with, they'll like different things. I'm sure that Harvey would have loved the kale smoothie, but that's boring, man. We're out. Let's get the pizza. There are a couple different movies that will randomly be shown, and it seems that halfway through, Harvey hasn't touched his personal pizza at all. It seems I've fallen out of touch with my partner a little bit. Give me the pizza. I'll eat it. With the final achievement now unlocked, let's head home and see just how much money we made in year four. Oh my, I really broke the counter this time. I can't make sense of that number on screen at all, but it is around 60 million gold. Not bad, considering I slept through the majority of the year. And this, on the first day of year five, is where this series ends. I take a quick lap of the house just to appreciate everything that I accomplished. 
Oh yeah, right! Do you see the little babies wandering around my house? Yeah, Harvey and I did adopt two of them, and I named them appropriately. I'll show you my plan for them in just a minute, but let's take a quick tour of the farm. The first day of the season is quite nice, because a lot of the grass has grown back in, and some of these trees have grown up as well. If you're wondering, the majority of the trees on my farm outside of the mystic ones are maple. Oh, it's because I'm Canadian, eh? I gotta get my syrup, bud. Overall, I am very pleased with how this all turned out, despite the additional effort. As of today, our total earnings on Exceptional Farm are 117,808,618, with 65 mil in pocket. Not bad at all, so I grab my daily prismatic shard and teleport off to the mountains. Instead of going up to the Perfection Summit, though, to show off, I'm heading over to the Witch's Swamp. I head up to the Dark Shrine of Selfishness to submit my prismatic shard. This turns my children into doves that fly away forever. Goodbye, Sacrifice 1. Goodbye, Sacrifice 2. May this offering secure an exceptional future. I quickly pop back to the farm to see if Harvey cares that I just made our children go away, and he seems pretty unfazed by it. Granted, he is back down to 10 out of 14 hearts because I kind of ignored him for the last year and a half. Now we have all the time in the world to rekindle that flame. I want to extend a special thank you to all of those generous enough to support the channel through YouTube memberships, Patreon, and Super Chat. Your generosity makes this content possible for everyone out there to enjoy. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. That is a wrap. I want to thank you all for joining me in this adventure. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. A big reason why I wanted to really dial in this farm in the last year is because I'm going to be releasing it to you. I'll be making the save file for this farm available for my members and Patreons. Thank you so much for your support. And if you've made it all the way to the end of the video, thank you so much. Your viewership and engagement make this content so fulfilling to create. This Stardew project was bar none the largest one that I've tackled on my channel to date. If you feel like I've earned it, leave a like, leave a comment, and let me know what you think. What did I miss? What could I have done better? And what do you want to see in the future? I love this game, and I would love to continue creating more content for it, after a much-needed break from kegs. It feels weird to be closing this series out, and since I suck at outros, I'm just gonna leave it there. Just kidding! In the eternal words of Billy Mays, but wait, there's more. This is actually just a small bonus piece because I really want this video to be 5 hours, 55 minutes, and 55 seconds long. So why not give you a sneak peek to the new microphone? Well, kind of new. To this point, I have been recording all of my audio using a Blue Yeti. It has served me well, to say the least. As it turns out, it's a small world after all, and I'm now talking to you on an MV7. Scott and I just happened to bump into each other, and he was nice enough to lend me this. I definitely have a bit of dialing in with audio quality, but overall I'd say this is much better. We'll play with that more in the next video. Until then, take care everyone.